Dzień dobry. Good morning. I would like to welcome you most cordially in this beautiful, magnificent, real sunny Monday. It's Monday morning and we welcome you at the Pauline Museum of the Polish Jews. And this is the second day of the dance congress um, and we already have uh, the audience in this room and apart from that we do have uh, many online participants who are interested in the today's topics so i would like to welcome all those who are seated in front of their computer monitors and also would like to welcome all those in the Room. So, what happened yesterday during the first day of the Congress? So, just a brief report on the yesterday's work. Today's topic is education, dance education, a very important subject for Polish dance. And the moderator is Claudia Carlos Macheb, the professor of the Frederick Chopin University of Music, and she's the dean of the dance faculty. The dance faculty was established or rather singled out from another big faculty and has become an individual faculty of dance at the Friedrich Chopin University of Music. And this is a fully autonomous faculty. So, Madam Professor, a very warm welcome to you. Hello, good morning. Indeed, this is a very important aspect of the Dance Congress, that is education. And we are going to talk about education together today. And I hope that this is going to be an interdisciplinary um, event and uh, we will have an opportunity to speak in an interesting group. Alexandra Jurosz, the Institute of Music and Dance, Jarosław Wartak, the Department of um, Cultural Education at the Ministry of Culture and Natural, Heri Natural Heritage. Mm -hmm. Professor Eva Wojciechowska, the head of the dance faculty, is going to be together with us and we're going to talk about education. And also, and we would like to welcome Madam Professor. I think she's online with us. There she is. Hello, hello, Professor. We welcome you over on over the internet and Hanna Kaminska, the uh, dance and actor studio. She's been active for many years with education and uh, Katarzyna Dańska, dance therapist uh, and uh, movement analyst, uh, and uh, also works at the Łódź Music Academy. Mirosław Różalski, uh, the at the uh, Lipczynska uh, uh, Ballet School in Poznan, Maciej Żurek, sociologist, um, a violinist, um, and um, 
the creator of um, country dance clubs in, in the countryside and uh, he has done a lot on education and animation. So let us begin. How can we promote po the Polish culture and the folk culture and um, how to promote different uh, styles of uh, Polish um, uh, folk music and uh, to promote uh, that uh, both young and old raise their interest in it. Well, it's I feel kind of shy because um, I am not a professional dancer and I'm not dealing with contemporary dance and um, I am always linking it uh, with uh, the traditional folk uh, dancers, but before I give an answer to your question, I just uh, would like uh, to say in the beginning why this uh, is um, quite a special field of traditional dance. So, for instance, if you go away from Warsaw 50 kilometers away, then you will find people who still remember the traditional dance and um, they will explain why it is special for them because. Um, the dance in tradition has never was a separate entity. I was uh, learning to play the violin between Radom and Dopochna in the countryside and I asked him who is a good dancer and he says that's the guy who knows how to sing well the uh, local folk lore songs and knows how to move his feet and uh, should know how to play the drums. Uh, so this is a good dancer. So in the uh, folk tradition, the ability to dance was merely a part of a much broader set of cultural competencies. So, and this is something that uh, people were very much confusing um, a dance with all other uh, types of music activities. As I was traveling around Poland and I was provoking situations where people were dancing or teachers just dancing, I have noticed that uh, the uh, folk dancers are always group dancers. It's a collective dance. It always is. So I have this understanding that as far as tradition is concerned, the village community always knew how to dance and they needed some musicians or violinists primarily to be able to dance. And so when musicians and dancers were meeting, then it was a self-propelling vehicle. So dancers started singing, the singing sing, uh, the, uh, started singing as they were dancing and musicians started dancing as well and so on. So this is, was the element of communication. There was always this uh, dialogue uh, between uh, the uh, groups of people and um, also people were dancing in pairs, uh, but also as groups. And um, for me, it was a spectacle without audience. So all of them were creating a spectacle where there were the audience at the same time. So this is a situation where everyone is creating something. So this is dance is an act of creation, but in this situation no one claims to be an artist. Neither musicians claim to be musicians or artists nor dancers. Why? Because everyone can do it. Everyone could dance and um, uh, sing short folk songs. So, But the, still there is this creative act for the whole group of people and this is an amazing experience. And. Uh, Sometimes there is this point of time when uh, you're completely thrilled with what is happening. This is so unusual, incredible experience. You cannot possibly compare it with any other cultural experience because this act of creation is uh, done by someone who are not artists, but together they do it. But this calls for certain competencies. Uh, one should know what to do and to be capable of doing it. But, as I've said before, dance alone is merely an element of a much broader array of um, musical capabilities, competencies. And in the traditional culture, people were not trained in dancing or singing or uh, playing the instruments uh, just to sing well, go to church and there you are. Uh, you have the choir to train with. Uh, um, as far as dancing is concerned, just join, uh, join the crowd and there you are. 
Uh, so and um, it's it was just personal gift or talent that then was uh, setting a person in certain direction. Okay, you're going to be a great singer. You're going to be a great dancer. Uh, so there were no schools, uh, but. Um, this is how it was going on in the countryside. Uh, so being a young adolescent, uh, people were joining the collective act of creation and then were specializing, specializing. But then the modern times have spoiled it all, because now we have this separation. Uh, so now we have the audience and now we have the artists. The artists are those who are supposed to do something seriously well, really well and um, the others who are there just to sit and look uh, on it, just on lookers. And in the traditional culture, um, it was not the case. Um, and uh, now, the when we perform on the stage folk dances and folk music, we omit the entire point of it, of it being a collective effort. And if you go to if you go to the harvest holiday in a little village, say 50 kilometers away from Warsaw, so what is happening these days is that still there is this complex of poverty. So musical culture, traditional musical culture, is identified with um, the uh, the world that we really don't want to go back to. That is one cow instead of a, a proper herd. Uh, one poor house instead of a good one, dusty roads instead of good roads, and so on and so forth. So somehow this folk uh, law is somehow associated with the times of poverty. And municipal authorities keep on saying, yes, we need to cherish our traditions and revisit our traditions. But the way they do it is funny, because at some point of time they will have some kids um, from the folk uh, uh, dance uh, cartoon, but everything is done in white gloves, so as not to touch the sense of collectivity. Um, so they say that this is the past, this is our heritage, this is how it looks like, but we don't join it. We... And in central Poland, uh, ten years ago, we um, we started uh, running a project for kids that is uh, the uh, traditional dance for children. And who was against it? The teachers, because the teachers thought that we would like uh, to push those kids uh, back into the old times because the teachers are the elite. They got out of that poverty and no one wants to go back to that poverty. No one wants to go back to unpaved roads. And here we are. Uh, we tell them about folk dance and folk um, uh, songs, but this is an attempt of going to the back. But did the teachers change their mind? They did, some of them, but it was very difficult to do, and some of them uh, still need to be convinced. Anyway. I think that as far as the traditional music is concerned, it's very important to um, uh, to return back uh, to traditional music. And uh, with many years, we have been cooperating with the Dance of Music and Dance. We have the traditional music forum, and we run uh, the Kolberg Academy program. This program is renewing music traditions and dance traditions in local communities so that they treat it as a tool for celebrating important community-related events. And this works well. So we have really good examples from many different parts of Poland. Uh, just have a, a look at the Kolberg Academy program webpage. And in central Poland we launched a movement. It's a grassroots movement that is um, possible due to the um, lovers of um, of local music, and um, um, those are the clubs of local dance fans. Uh, so those are firefighters or just people from the municipal authorities. So they form a, a band, a local band, and local dance company, and so there's curtain of fear, of being ridiculed, uh, goes down and all of a sudden these people are very happy and firefighters say that they're selling as many as 300 tickets per event, which means it is doable and it has become quite a successful program. So I think that it is very important um, uh, 
to take care of our own identity and traditional um, music culture in uh, Poland it's uh, very diverse every village has its own folklore song heritage and legacy to deal with when you go to the mountains and uh, in the mountains this and if um, um, if Marek plays the violin, I will tell you where he comes from. So, because they have 20 musical subregions in the Podhale region in the mountain, Polish mountains. So, it's enough for the guy to start playing and they will te can tell you which village he comes from. So, it's important uh, to go back uh, to your roots and um, um, our local specificity speaks of us and um, they ident this identifies us and this is something that creates our identity and I've got only 30 seconds left so the question is how to teach this well this uh, we know that music and uh, uh, dance was something innate for those uh, people they were starting to sing dance and play uh, the violin uh, already in the prenatal period but uh, seriously speaking uh, let's start with kids and of course you cannot uh, teach a traditional uh, dance only you have uh, to also combine it with other aspects of folklore and um, if this traditional music and dance become an adventure and uh, mystery for the kids then they will be interested in it it is important to talk about it as something that is still veiled with mystery and traditional music keeps on developing keeps on changing but um, it is not that um, that is uh, something that is unchangeable once in the Podhali region we met a violin teacher and he said that he never taught his children to play the violin he simply asks the questions and let them discover themselves he only says link to the nature link, link to the environment so i think that such approaches have a chance of um, um, becoming a success now who are the teachers well you cannot possibly train teachers uh, to do this job it is important always to cooperate with a local fan, with a local champion, with someone who is really in love with uh, local uh, tradition. Um, so you always need to find someone who knows tradition really well. And you cannot really um, transform um, folk music and folk dance classes into PE classes. No, it should be rather be done as an adventure, as a workshop. Go somewhere and uh, arrange a workshop, but not as a part of core curriculum. And finally, I think it all works well once this um, education is done within a network adventure network for children so let them travel let them see different regions go to other regions exchange experiences uh, stay um, overnight somewhere else with other children and talk about music talk about dance this is the way we have it and this is the way you have it i hope it wasn't too long no it wasn't too long a great story about passion love mystery and adventure this is how we can discover folk tradition music and dance but actually we do not many times know this tradition and uh, we do not nourish it and you also spoke about children that the first contact with music in dance um, it should be begun in the earliest possible Hanna Kaminska for 25 years has been running actors and dance studio you have permanent contact uh, with the children you build passion you build love and uh, actually develop love to dance yes indeed i am dealing with uh, off school forms of dance uh, uh, training and i must say that after 25 years this interest in uh, dance um, learning based uh, on a hob treated as a hobby or a recreation uh, form of activity well is growing there are very many and a growing number of dance schools and in the Mazowiecki region there are 110 private uh, centers that uh, teach dancing some of them specialize and uh, train uh, children in uh, particular dance techniques 
Others are more comprehensive and they are active in the field of dance education and dance promotion. We mustn't forget that uh, we also have very many dance classes at schools, kindergartens, cultural uh, centers for young people. And there are also dance ensembles that take part in different competitions, uh, festivals, um, and uh, such, uh, such competitions, such festivals, uh, are organized by different um, cultural centers. Currently, they're also organized by private people, uh, those who run dance schools. Now, it's a very um, nice phenomenon because there you can watch young people who are very passionate about dancing. They absolutely love it. Uh, competitions, festivals, uh, they usually last for, for two or three days. And there you can see hundreds of uh, kids and young people um, performing. You can see uh, very nice choreographies there and very well-trained young uh, people. What is also positive uh, about this non-professional aspect of dancing is that such festivals, such schools provide jobs to those who have graduated from ballet schools but who haven't found employment uh, in theatres, um, ballet ensembles and so on. Now, when it comes to my institution, uh, the institution that I manage, I must tell you that uh, every year we have 1,000 um, people who would like to uh, become participants of um, our activities. And we enroll uh, children from the age of four. There's no uh, age limit. Uh, and uh, the majority of people enroll to classical ballet uh, courses. And since my institution operates at the um, building of uh, the ballet school, that's why they come to us to be trained in ballet, but there are also people who wish to be trained in other uh, forms of dance. Now, our curriculum is based on the curriculum of uh, Polish uh, ballet schools. However, uh, you have to um, uh, bear in mind that we have participants uh, of different ages, so we have um, children uh, at the preschool age, uh, we have uh, school uh, children and also adults. Some of them have some physical uh, limitations, some of them have never uh, have uh, never done any sports, some of them have done uh, sports and therefore they're quite fit and, and flexible. Uh, so we have courses at different stages of uh, advancement and this obviously needs to be taken into account by uh, our uh, trainers but we need to always remember that people who come to us they dance because they love dancing uh, they do it as a hobby but at the same time they want to learn uh, the arcana of a classical ballet because after all we know that it's a very esoteric uh, form of dance and it takes a while to learn all the uh, secrets of um, classical ballet uh, dancing and you also need uh, it takes years to um, learn and uh, and to, to, to practice uh, and to be able to uh, do various ballet exercises. So, um, 
if you come to classes only from time to time, uh, it is uh, impossible uh, for you to, to dance um, some even ballet variation um, piece. But it gives you some uh, rudiment uh, knowledge. Now, when it comes to preschool children and school children, the curriculum has to be uh, run in such a way so that children don't get bored. We know that the rudiments of uh, um, classical ballet uh, are quite static. So when it comes to uh, children, you need to uh, provide them with various exercises. So uh, this is related to sports, uh, to um, folk dance, there are also different exercises to uh, enhance uh, various uh, muscles, uh, to uh, body flexibility, uh, to uh, their orientation in space. And this has to be uh, connected with uh, ballet exercises. A small child, uh, due to various psychological and uh, limitations and also movement limitations, isn't able to uh, stand at a pole and uh, do certain exercises. Uh, it is impossible for them, so they need to gather in the middle of uh, the ballet room and uh, do an exercise. And uh, a child also needs to be satisfied with the exercises all the time. Uh, they need to feel that they're dancing, because this is what children imagine when they hear that they will go to a ballet class. So it is important that they dance, not only ballet, but also um, that they perform other forms of dancing and that they do it uh, using their imagination, that they improvise uh, as well and do uh, folk dancing too. Now when it comes to school children, if they started ballet training earlier and for example this is their fourth or fifth year of uh, dance education, they are aware of the fact that a ballet class uh, includes uh, exercises, then there's adagio, allegro, and at the end there's a short dance variation or a dance sequence. These children are aware of the fact that a given pattern has to be performed during a class and that uh, there's a certain group of exercises that need to be done because without such, um, such a body uh, and movement training they won't be able to improve their ballet technique. And only if you improve your ballet technique continuously uh, then they will be able to perform a given dance sequence. Obviously, they are uh, very happy if they're standing in front of a mirror and they are successful in uh, performing a given dance variation that they saw during uh, um, a ballet uh, show, a ballet performance. And then um, such a class is satisfying for uh, the children and the teachers. Uh, now, when it comes to adults, we need to uh, bear in mind that uh, we have people of different professions and who have different physical uh, limitations. Now, a teacher who runs uh, such a class, such classes, obviously uh, needs to serve um, as a role model for such adults. Uh, they need to be also uh, qualified, obviously well qualified as uh, teachers. They need to have the charisma. Uh, but they also need to know how to um, how to comment on what students 
do. Uh, you have to be careful not to hurt anyone and make sure that all the participants uh, do a certain exercise uh, in a given manner. So uh, obviously participants need to strive for uh, excellence but uh, it is good if they simply perform a given exercise well. So due to certain physical limitations certain exercises need to be eliminated. Now the too difficult ones uh, cannot be uh, conducted with uh, students, uh, participants who come to uh, the school just once a week or twice a week. Now, if we take into account these different uh, age groups, all of these participants are active uh, in the exercises. They are also the viewers of um, dance uh, of dancing, and uh, they are also propagators of dance. I very often meet them at performance, and they are dance ambassadors in a way. They very often instill uh, this passion for dancing in other people. Now, if there are some very uh, talented uh, children, then we suggest that they uh, go to um, a ballet school. And there are also those who try to uh, prolong this uh, adventure with um, dancing, this dance adventure. And So they try to continue this dance adventure and they uh, very often enroll to um, university courses that involve arts uh, and culture. If they are people who already have their uh, professions, uh, then they are these quiet uh, spreaders of this love for dancing and the art of ballet. Should I continue? Should, should, should I add anything to what I've already said? Well, I believe that what you said was uh, very important. You talked about this joy among children, but you also mentioned therapy. Uh, it is important that um, senior citizens also participate in your courses and uh, obviously through dancing they can show various emotions, yes? Yes, I wanted to mention this um, as well. Why do all these people come to our school? Well, I've run our uh, school for 25 years now and we have people who joined us 25 years ago. We also have participants who now come uh, to our school uh, with their children. So sometimes there's a mother who goes to one, um, one class and their uh, daughter or son who um, goes to another uh, dance class. And let me mention one more uh, thing concerning um, psychology. Well, people who participated in um, ballet uh, classes know that once uh, you know the door to the classroom is shut and there's only you and the music, uh, the teacher and you get your emotions and your body uh, involved into uh, processing uh, the movement into this most sublime uh, form of movement, that's ballet, then you need to cut yourself off uh, all that has happened throughout the day. You need to focus on yourself, you need to focus on what the teacher tells you, 
so you need to cut off from uh, reality and, and the world outside. So uh, this works uh, as a wonderful uh, form of psychotherapy. And I believe that very many people, very many adults, are aware of it. Maybe not uh, the moment they come to the class, but after some time they realize that they can get immersed in this uh, art of dance, that they can cut themselves uh, of all the stressful situations, all the problems uh, of everyday life. So this is this psychotherapeutic role of dancing that's worth mentioning and one more thing well um, there's only one or two percent of boys who uh, enroll to uh, ballet um, classes it's a pity but that's reality now the Institute of Music and dance um, decided to calculate the number of private uh, centers that train uh, people in dancing uh, and these are schools uh, that operate usually in the afternoon so it's outside of um, just regular school and there are as many as 700 89 such centers in Poland that train people in dancing. And I must say, I was quite surprised by this number. We knew that there was quite a number of such schools. Well, uh, it's quite visible in Warsaw. There are more and more schools every day. And it's just a proof that there's uh, a demand for it. After all, these people are not forced to uh, go to uh, dance classes. And uh, we have um, also the data from 2018 of the General Statistics Office uh, concerning cultural centers. And in such cultural centers, there were 9,000 specialist workshops uh, and the greatest number of them were uh, workshops in fine arts, but the second largest were dance classes. And when it comes to the number of members of such classes, uh, dance uh, workshops, dance classes were the most numerous. Now 74,000 people participated in dance classes and when it comes to, um, yes, uh, well, then, well, this trend then is uh, shown in different festivals and, and, and competitions and I believe it's uh, uh, very valuable. Now, uh, in 2018, uh, there were 10,000 people associated in various dance associations. Now, including dance to a core curriculum of general education, that's one of our demands, promoting this prestigious uh, profession uh, of a dance teacher, we could uh, have um, some systemic solutions here. And also developing the methodology uh, for Polish dance teacher, that was another demand. Let's have these demands on our board. Okay, here it is. Now, so these are the demands that you can read yourselves and that we can refer to and uh, uh, refer to and, and then we can wait uh, for the effects of this Congress. So now we've talked about joy. Joy uh, the, that, is, uh, that children and adults feel when dancing.
oswajając. So dance uh, is uh, training us and uh, helps us uh, to perceive the world of uh, magic sounds, uh, to perceive sp spiritual and bodily beauty. And this is how our taste uh, is uh, being created. And today, in the 21st century, we are debating over the same, but uh, already in the antique times um, they spoke about dance, they wrote about dance. Um, and uh, uh, so choreotherapy, why is it so important uh, in our modern life? Katarzyna Dańska. Well, I understand that the general question is about the role of dancing, not only uh, choreotherapy, because I would like to talk about a uh, whole array of um, therapeutic implementation of dance. And I'm a psychotherapist. I uh, use both uh, dance and movement in my therapy. For many therapists, it's not obvious. But this is what unites us. And what unites us is that we all dance. And um, I'm speaking about dancing and not dance, because uh, in psychotherapy, we use uh, dancing um, in a very different way. We're far away from professional dance. It's not performance, it's not ballroom dancing, it's something different. And yes, you have already mentioned uh, that dance has this therapeutic dimension, and that actually this is true. And the point is that dancing has potential of change. So once we start dancing, our body change, movements change, uh, the way we communicate with the environment changes, uh, uh, the mood changes. And um, in a greater dimension, somehow dancing affects our lives, changes our lives. And there is uh, another potential in dancing, uh, understood as, and here I would um, quote Mace, who said that dancing is not a separate entity, it is a creative act. It's something spontaneous. It's a spontaneous creative act of a person or a group of people. So dancing has an opportunity of turning into a narrative about a person, about his or her story, about his or her difficulties that that person has to go through. And so how it, de it describes how these people meet the world. And so there are two different dimensions of dancing and they are present in any professional context where we invite people to dance but then those two dimensions will be present in different ways in different contexts and uh, in the context of uh, science and dance technique it is going to work ever so subtly and discreetly and um, they are not um, addressed purpose, purposefully uh, by dance teachers and pedagogues. But as far as therapeutic dancing is concerned, um, there are um, other dimensions of dancing that are important. So taking care of form and the product and the training are less important. Rehearsals are less important in therapeutic dancing. So I'd like to talk about the specter, spectrum of uh, using uh, therapeutic use of dance and I would like to talk about education in these different shades of this spectrum. So this is my task for today. And uh, let me begin with the therapy with the use of dance and movement. Uh, dance and movement therapy is a psychotherapeutic method that respects uh, the body and the expression of the body as the source of knowledge about uh, a person. And um, one can, um, uh, it, there is a four year long training for uh, dance and movement therapists. And um, during this four year training, uh, people uh, learn about um, different forms of psychotherapy. So the students come 
um, and those students already uh, they already undergo their own psychotherapy. They're supervised. They learn not only the methods um, of uh, dance and movement therapy. They learn to watch the movement, analyze the movement. They also learn about uh, they learn about psychopathologies and um, the psychological uh, development but what is important they're learning to build develop relations with other people therapeutic relations with other people and they learn to um, draw information on the basis of this relation that they established with, the, uh, with another person or group of people so a uh, dance and movement therapy is a method that um, has been developed have been has been developing for many years now it's a subject of many scientific research activities and um, it is uh, an umbrella of um, uh, it has been developed under the umbrella of the Polish and European Association of Dance and Movement Therapy. They are setting up uh, standards of such therapy and standards for psychotherapy. So we are uh, both treating and changing subjects. So this this is a psychotherapeutic journey with people whom we work with, uh, and um, um, these uh, forms are full of uh, dance. Uh, but those journeys are very difficult because we have to go through very difficult and painful terrain of uh, our subjects. Uh, but um, choreotherapies therapists uh, work in a somewhat different way. They concentrate more on the positive reinforcement. They focus uh, on uh, group integration. They focus on building links and um, interdependencies in the group. They are developing uh, well the well-being of people. So they are bringing in life through dance. Um, and this form of education, that is choreo choreotherapy or therapeutic dance, um, as some call it, Well, in Poland, this there, this is quite a complex uh, picture as far as choreotherapy is concerned because it's not that orderly. This form of education is less orderly, and one may say that it's more diverse than other form of, of forms of education. In Poznań, there is a Polish association of uh, choreotherapy. They run their workshops and training sessions, but also at uh, different universities there are postgraduate studies, and many times they are part and parcel of a greater a topic that is art therapy but also there are first degree um, major studies uh, in Poznan at the Academy of Physical Education that is dance and physical culture uh, or for instance uh, um, uh, or how about uh, make courses uh, on dance somatics so uh, Korea therapists are not obliged to, to undergo their own psychotherapy. They do not use supervision so much, but they learn, or at least they should learn different elements of psychology, and uh, they learn or should learn how to work with the group dynamics because uh, psycho um, because as psychotherapists they work with groups of people primarily and another important point area that I would like to talk about is the area or the domain of personal development um, a psych dance psychotherapists and choreotherapists also work in this domain but I would like to refer to the situations where teachers of different forms of dance but also teachers who uh, uh, help other people to work with their body and they are um, enhancing this dimension of work of personal development so they help to explore the awareness of the body they ex uh, help to explore uh, the expression by movement and this helps to establish relations and read emotions so i think that this is great this is a wonderful phenomenon and it is very needed because this increases a possibility for, for many people of um, using this offer. Just as Hannah um, has said, more and more people enroll at dance courses and more and more people want to return to the sense of feeling of the body, bodily awareness. More and more people would like to express themselves by movement. So the more 
we have those obstetricians that help us to return back to the freedom of movement and feeling of it and freedom of expression the more the better but let us get back to those two dimensions of dancing therapeutic um, dimensions of dancing those are superpowers because they are superpowers and if they are superpowers then they are fraught with risks and therefore one should be cautious with using superpowers and um, I think that this is the role of the experience that is um, certified uh, choreotherapist and dance therapist whose knowledge and experience should be used and um, I work personally a lot, but not only me, with persons who do not want to be a dance and movement uh, psychotherapists. They don't want to be choreotherapists. All they want to do is just to stay in their own field of um, activities. All they want to do is to enhance the uh, um, human dimension of movement expression because it always tells a lot about us. I work with coaches and uh, uh, coaches and uh, um, yoga teachers and instructors. I work with pedag special pedagogues and um, what I hear from those people they speak of what uh, they gain uh, due to uh, choreotherapy they simply enhance their capabilities, they improve their competencies. And so there is this, um, it, it helps them to ask questions. Why? What for? Why am I? I want to want to ask people to this experience. What is the objective of it? And this practice of this um, of asking the question, what for, what is the main purpose? Uh, so it's important to establish the goal. And uh, once that goal is clear, those people who come and use this offer, once we understand their goals and their needs, it uh, becomes very um, it, once it becomes very important because this is something that creates a very safe environment. So those are the three areas somehow have been um, expressed by me. Katarzyna Tańska, thank you. And before that we spoke about uh, the number of special centers with uh, dance groups. It's 110 in Warsaw. In Wielkopolska, 98 schools, special schools um, with dance um, um, uh, where dance is used and in Poznań we have one of such schools that actually in Poznań we have a ballet school but that's a professional training so let's talk about professional training how about um, uh, the operation of um, uh, ballet uh, schools um, general educational ballet schools uh, how about um, education in such schools yes I would like to first congr congratulate you on the meeting and it's important that we can talk about dance in very broad terms because all of us operate in our own niches in our own bubbles but this is a great opportunity to find out about others who work with dance uh, they're linked with us but not, not directly uh, d uh, directly related to us and also I would like to congratulate the authors of information in the agenda of this Congress. I have looked through this information about the pedagogues and about the schools, uh, choreographers, theatres. It's great material that you have uh, uh, prepared, developed um, and um, I promise that I will read it because this is going to be a source of great information and uh, I ho think that we're going to use it in our educational activities and uh, I also would like to congratulate the colleagues from the Warsaw School. Yesterday they finished experimental online competition for the best graduate and we know that this competition eventually did not take place because it was all online. We had to prepare those students uh, to perform uh, under very dif uh, difficult conditions and uh, Nikodem Bialik, a uh, Warsaw graduate, won the competition. So congratulations to the school, to the pedagogues and we congratulate Nikodem. This is um, a great graduation of ballet school and uh, soon he is uh, going to begin his professional ballet career. So. Once again, I would like to congratulate uh, our Warsaw colleagues. Now, education at ballet schools. I represent five schools. So, just to remind the audience, 
and those who follow us uh, online, perhaps some parents of uh, future students are observing it, following us. We have five such general education schools in Łódź, Bytom, Warsaw, Gdańsk and Poznań. And on average we have more or less 140 up to 160, 170 students in, in a school. And um, uh, f 40 to 50 people graduate from schools annually. So, education at such a school. So, there we are. We have we receive a 10 year old child and um, a young adult graduates from schools. So, passion and love. Those are the two words that uh, are very important, and, and those are the key, um, the key spheres that should. Um, mm, that they are key to ballet schools in particular, like any other school, but, but in particular to ballet school, schools, because we are tuned to prepare professional ballet dancers. All those who have ever come across a ballet school, ballet education, those people who have attended ballet school, they know how difficult an experience it is. However, if the journey is accompanied by love and passion, then it becomes a great adventure. Now, what are our problems? I am going to talk about our problems in a while, but the system of ballet schools in Poland is envied by our foreign partners and colleagues. And many partners uh, uh, envy us uh, that the Polish government uh, supports uh, such ballet schools a lot, so the Ministry of Culture and, um, and other institutions support us and uh, we are in touch with many other ballet schools. They envy us and they would like to have the same system of support. From our point of view, from the point of view of general education ballet school, this is the best possible system. It's most coherent and um, organization-wise is the best system for ballet schools. So we receive a child at the age of 10, and such a child is uh, educated in general terms, but also educated in ballet from the point of view of students, school and parents. That means that this is a very comfortable situation because you don't have uh, to somehow uh, uh, arrange all those organizational matters so everything happens in one school uh, but uh, from the point of view of students parents and schools um, all the stakeholders have an opportunity to Uh, to pass on not only the knowledge and skills for such a young person, because we don't know how, how that person is going to graduate, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, such students, uh, they learn about theatre, music, about uh, cinema. It's not only ballet. So we are trying to educate those young people in such a way that if those people graduate, from a school and um, usually uh, they are aiming at working in theatres on the stage, um, on a stage, but we are equipping such a young person with the skills that are necessary uh, for um, functioning in uh, the future world of stage. Uh, so there are many people and uh, studios where people are trained to dance, but I realize that when once we speak about when we speak about uh, uh, dance and dance career, then again, it's all about love and passion. In ballet schools, we are adding one more point that changes the context entirely. So we add the word requirements. Now the context changes immediately once we use requirements. But le le let me give you an example from the world of sports. Have a look at the number of people who uh, amateur uh, sports people, uh, they do jogging, uh, they, I've just read that the new Prime Minister of Japan uh, does uh, 200 uh, uh, press exercises for the stomach, uh, for the abdomen muscles every day, but some people are professional sportsmen and of course we don't have as many uh, professional sportsmen, just like, uh, it's all, not only in Poland, it's all, also in the West. Um, the richer countries than us, uh, they also have wonderful traditions, uh, but the number of uh, people who do sports or ballet professionally, they're much fewer than amateurs. And uh, here I would like to describe a certain problem. 
and that is the problem that we're facing in the beginning of professional education, ballet education. So how to make sure that these people who want to dance, who are passionate about dancing, that they would like to attend ballet schools and then they would need to face a different type of dance, a different set of requirements. And um, in the beginning we need two things. We need to have parents such parents uh, who will perceive some future for their child and we need the child. So if both parents and the child meet together and uh, if we add to that proper conditions uh, for dance uh, training then we have a set um, and the environment set. So how are schools performing? Um, well they have different results. We don't have managers who travel around. Of course, we try to arrange that, but please remember that this is a school, which means that we have some schooling requirements that we have to adhere to. So, this beginning of education is the most important starting point for us. And I'm not uh, meaning here uh, the number of children that get to our schools. Uh, usually there are 30 students in uh, such uh, schools, um, mainly due to facilities. But what we want is to have children who have the necessary conditions. And here it is more difficult. So a young person has uh, at their disposal a huge number of subjects that will train them to uh, uh, become uh, a dancer. Well, maybe for you it's all obvious, but uh, maybe we're being watched by a parent of a future student. Now, contemporary dance, jazz dance, folk dance, different... Uh, music uh, and movement interpretations. There's barosol as well. Uh, and uh, for a couple of years now we have this specialization called, uh, well, a specialization that's far from uh, stage dancing, that's hip hop. There's eurythmics. Uh, so this first um, clash that there is, is that this young person comes to us and wishes to dance, but we make him stand uh, at a bar. But is there another route? Well, not really. Okay, of course you cannot uh, make this child feel bored. You need to lead them by the hand. And uh, I very often uh, meet parents who say, you know, my kid got here out of passion for dancing. And it is necessary that we um, nurture this flame from the very beginning. And we do it because we have well qualified <clears throat> professional staff. These are very often graduates of ballet schools and uh, who also acquired um, teaching qualifications. And uh, of course, um, the more I know, the more uh, doubts I'd uh, have um, when it comes to uh, doing this profession. But of course, uh, after a couple of ages, a person uh, can tell more about their uh, profession because of uh, their experience. Okay, so we have this young person who comes to our school and we need to nurture uh, this flame, this passion that they have. So how should we do it so that uh, this passion is continued, but that we also impose some requirements? And as I've said, this is the first clash, uh, but it all depends on us, the teachers, how we will talk to the child, work with the child, but also how will we communicate with the parents. And students, they very often, you know, uh, tell us what to do. Uh, usually words when there's uh, this longer break uh, in classes, uh, I talk to students and I ask, okay, um, how's been, how was your day? Uh, 
you know, um, where did you fail, uh, why are you sad, and so on. And the student tells me, okay, because I'm trying to do this season and uh, I keep failing. Uh, but, you know, uh, the fact that they tell me this, that uh, uh, they are motivated and, and uh, angry uh, at the same time, um, it is already good. But now, if a child is only jealous that, uh, you know, uh, their classmates do the season uh, better, then um, it's not such an easy case. But if a kid is angry that they fail in doing something because they want to be better, then definitely there are uh, the right material to work with. Obviously, uh, in our schools, we have a selection, uh, but even if we know that we have a child that will leave us uh, once uh, they end um, primary school, uh, we still continue education of uh, such a child uh, because uh, after uh, this primary school, they often uh, come to us and tell us, you know, uh, these have been absolutely beautiful uh, years. Uh, I've been uh, told by this or that professor something really valuable. And, well, sometimes we forget that the primary goal of uh, a ballet school and every school is educating a young person and only then uh, do you educate a young dancer. So if we forget about all these difficult conditions that uh, accompany very difficult uh, ballet uh, education from the age of 9 to the age of 18, um, then um, we might uh, forget about what is important. Uh, and by the way, today uh, there is the funeral of uh, Professor Kuyava, uh, who used to be my professor and who had a great impact on uh, me. Okay, so we have this young person and we try to instill in this pen uh, person a uh, passion for dance. We need to combine it with the demands and the requirements that we impose. And this is extremely difficult because sometimes there's this young person uh, to which we need to say, you know, you will have to leave us. And it's a tragedy for them. Okay, maybe I'll say something controversial again, but it seems to me that Uh, we don't want all this passion of a young person to be connected uh, with ballet. So at ballet schools, through our um, various activity, we need to provide some kind of alternative for these children, so that they don't treat, children don't treat ballet as their only chance. If I could ask you, um, director, to come to conclusion, another element that's difficult for us, well, it's good on the one hand, but it's quite difficult at the same time, is that we uh, connect ballet training with general education training. And sometimes we even need to give up uh, some uh, artistic activity because of this general education requirements. Although in September we've already uh, managed to uh, have three performances. And now job, that's another thing. Uh, the, the job that you'd like to have once you graduate from school. Now we also have more and more uh, foreigners. Uh, they take places um, 
they they also take uh, our jobs uh, and maybe this works as a discouragement uh, for parents to to send their children to uh, ballet schools uh, now um in the past uh, you know there was this uh, comparison that uh, uh, you know, the ballet profession is like a profession of a coal miner. We shouldn't use such slogans because then we will definitely discourage the parents from sending their uh, children to our uh, schools. And I'm sure that uh, all the um, ballet school uh, graduates will do well in their lives. Well, I'm sure they will do, especially if we talk about uh, scientific um, career paths and uh, the academia. Now, why is it so important um, to be trained at uh, universities when it comes to dance? Uh, I'd like to ask this question to Professor Wyczychowska. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, all the, also those watching us online. Now, I need to start from the topic of educating those who later on train others. And I need to mention here Teresa Kuyava. I believe that this master-pupil relationship, this relationship with someone that you adore and admire when you see them uh, dance, dancing on the stage, well, such a relationship allows you to treat completely differently uh, what you actually uh, dream of doing uh, in the future, be it as an amateur or um, as a professional dancer. And I believe that we should train such teachers at universities. Well, it's always been my reservation and uh, Claudia, I'd like to apologize to you uh, as a dean, uh, but I will say it again and as the head of the uh, dance chair um, I'm going to say it again. I believe that um, dance education should undergo true revolution and I believe that the curriculum of ballet schools should be changed too and uh, also a uh, ballet community uh, believes that this education is too long, nine years, uh, this is too long and no one's been doing this um, for uh, many years now uh, abroad. Now, if a child is uh, 10 and you know, uh, this is the end of their uh, physical um, development uh, and uh, uh, development of uh, coordination, for example. So we demand that uh, such, uh, such a person only starts developing such skills. And now a 19-year-old um, person who's only beginning their career, this is already too late. They should already be present on the market. And of course, I'm mentioning here ballet, not uh, contemporary dance. Now, three boys that got first, second, and third place at the uh, competition um, of um, of graduates, they are the boys uh, of the Warsaw uh, Ballet uh, School, but in the past they were students of other schools too. Now, when I read their CVs, you know, they dance like adult dancers. They um, appear in excellent choreographies and they dance uh, uh, wonderful roles. Obviously, there's great rivalry uh, involved in um, such activity. So a ballet school should definitely uh, train you in a given direction uh, to which you have uh, a talent, uh, an inborn uh, talent. 
unfortunately, the um, curriculum of this uh, general education at ballet schools um, is quite poor. And also, uh, there is a very poor offer of dance at uh, schools in general, not uh, dance schools, but general education schools. And now, there's also uh, teaching staff uh, that is prepared by the um, Physical Education University uh, in Poznan. They cannot find employment. Uh, now, uh, people who have been educated as physical education uh, teachers and who haven't been trained well in anatomy, uh, avoiding injuries and so on, they cannot teach uh, dancing. Only if you are well qualified then you can run such classes and uh, use the passion of uh, the children. And then this dance can also uh, work as therapy. There are uh, people who have been trained to do this, however they cannot be employed by uh, schools and schools don't get funds to create uh, classes of extended dance curriculum, although there are sports schools with this extended uh, sports curriculum. Now, there are um, uh, special uh, sports fields uh, built for uh, boys, for example, but there is no offer for uh, girls who, after all, uh, very often want to uh, dance. And it's also impossible to replace physical education by uh, dance. And, for example, even at music schools, uh, children mm, play basketball uh, though they should have, uh, though they should be offered other forms of physical uh, education, you know, the one where they uh, won't hurt their fingers or injure their fingers. Now, knowledge of dance um, is a subject that cannot be uh, taken as an A level uh, subject anymore. And now we get very bad experiences of very many um, dance school graduates. You can read about this on the internet, in the media, and there's a lot of truth uh, in this. So a lot boils down to the uh, qualifications of a dance uh, trainer. So we should definitely supervise um, teaching staff too. So I do demand, uh, as the head of the dance chair, that the teacher is prepared differently uh, to work with uh, students. I'm talking here about different techniques, but I also mention, uh, I also mean here this most difficult uh, dance form, dance technique, uh, namely ballet. And currently every dance school graduate, uh, you know, only the one uh, who is quite universal uh, and, and versatile uh, in their skills will be able to find employment. And there are these two categories, uh, contemporary dance and ballet dance, and every uh, dancer should be able to perform both techniques. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Professor. Now, how to train uh, a teacher with this regard? I'd like to turn here to Mr. Bartak, to um, Mr. Director, who's uh, a specialist in visual uh, arts. 
So we train teachers who should be able to um, be sculptors, uh, painters, uh, do installations, and they should be able to do it uh, to become trained in all these forms of art uh, in a very a short period of time, uh, the bachelor's um, studies. That's why we are fighting for long cycle programs for dancers. And um, it is uh, important uh, to develop pedagogues who specialize in uh, classical ballet and other forms of dance, but also we need specialists on uh, theory and knowledge about dance. Uh, so we need some theoretical knowledge given to choreographers, dance reviewers, culture animators. So all of that should um, happen um, at the same time, and at um, the University of uh, Music, Music Academy, finally we have the Faculty of Dance. And um, uh, still it is a very difficult uh, thing to run because uh, we are at a university where music has a number, uh, there are a number of musical faculties, and, um, and they have uh, many different majors in music only. Madam Professor, thank you very much, thank you very much. I do not know if you hear me. Thank you very much for your kind presentation and the postulates that you have formulated. And I would immediately ask Mr. Jaroslav Bartek from the Department of Artistic Education and Cultural Education in the context of what Madam Professor has said, whether, um, whether it is possible to introduce dance into the core curriculum. Well, the host of the law on education is the Ministry of National Education. What we can do, we can exert our, our pressure so that um, uh, such elements are introduced into the core curriculum of general educational um, schools. Um, I used to be a director of at an art school for 17 years, and there there is PE and dance is a part of PE. It's simply um, the, it's up to the PE teacher and how they use it. And um, in my school, uh, PE teachers were using a uh, dance and. Um, uh, we were trying uh, to take care of our uh, students and their fingers because play, playing the musical instruments means that they couldn't uh, play some sports. So we are talking to the Ministry of Education. They have their own arguments. We have our own arguments. But um, in the context of ballet schools and in the context of musical schools, uh, for which we have um, many more, as far as um, professional education is concerned supervised by the Ministry of Culture, so um, there are no discussions as to reduce the number of hours of general schooling and uh, it all leads to the uh, general maturity exam. So we work both at ballet schools and musical schools and uh, I have already had the first meetings with the directors of uh, ballet schools and the idea is to reduce or optimize the number of um, uh, hours uh, for some other arts uh, subjects because indeed our students are overloaded. And uh, as far as sports is, is concerned, ballet school, it's um, quite a professional school. It's professional sports in a way. And um, although it's uh, somewhat different from musical schools because they they also have some uh, professional um, activities that are not compared professional sports. I don't know if you remember how it is in art schools. Long time ago, um, high art schools were five-year schools, and then we had uh, uh, we changed the system, and uh, we came up with a general educational art school. Then we had four years of high school. Um, uh, but the material is just the same, the curriculum has not changed, it's just the number of years that has changed. So just like in ballet schools or musical schools, it was sometimes 40 hours per week in some grades. Uh, but we changed it, we uh, changed, uh, we returned back to the five-year schooling as uh, far as uh, art schools are concerned. 
and the core curriculum is just the same. So the load has been distributed to a period of five years. We could not do it with ballet schools, um, otherwise we would uh, need to change many more things. So we had to think how to distribute the load. So the Department of Arts uh, Education, Artistic Education, serves um, arts schools and ballet schools because we have to provide such schools with financing and infrastructure. But also we are responsible for supervising the quality control of education because this is a professional school. So graduates have to attain high professional um, capabilities so that um, in, uh, in a couple of years that this is quite an expensive form of schooling that we have graduates who have a very low level of quality of professional training. So undoubtedly our department has to monitor the issue of quality. So this is what I can uh, say in, as a commentary to what Madam Professor has mentioned. And uh, um, as far as universities are concerned, they are autonomous and only um, arts universities, uh, there are 19 arts universities in Poland, they are supervised by us, uh, but we only supervise the financials. And um, the universities are fully autonomous in compliance on with the law on higher education and do you have any data on the graduates of um, arts high schools how many graduates of high schools and we have quite a number of high schools in, in poland how many of them are professionally working in this field or and how many of them re-qualify and they uh, stop doing arts well, I've done some research and three years ago a similar research was done by the Krakow um, Academy of Fine Arts. So, the result is that 60 to 70 percent of graduates of um, art schools um, proceed with uh, university training. Yes, in this field, in this field, yes. So it's not like after the um, musical school of second degree, but after high school they receive a professional title of an, of an, uh, um, of an artist. So, so uh, but they are craftsmen and uh, as craftsmen they operate very well. Uh, but many people proceed, uh, they enroll at universities uh, but uh, not only, um, um, in fact, uh, they uh, graduate with uh, the general maturity exam. So I have had such graduates uh, who then were changing to mathematics and they were going to with mathematics at the university. Yes, in Poland we have many uh, musical schools, grade one, grade two musical schools, uh, schools and also have art schools uh, and all of uh, them all of them help us uh, to promote arts. Uh, it's not only that we are training professionals, professional artists, but in the Polish society, young people have um, access uh, to arts uh, training um, in primary and secondary schools um, and upper secondary schools. And I know that many people who graduated from the first degree musical school, they're not professional musicians, uh, but having done the first degree of musical training in a primary school, then um, this is um, how these people are trained in perceiving culture in a different way. And um, of course, uh, I cannot possibly dream of having um, a large number of um, second degree musical or ballet schools. I cannot possibly imagine that we'll have a plethora of second degree dance schools. However, still in uh, high schools, so we you would like to have some professional um, grades um, uh, where a dance is promoted uh, in high schools. But how could we do that? But what do you mean? Do you mean the system of uh, general educational schools? Uh, are you talking about the general education um, secondary schools? Yes, because we have uh, we have uh, some uh, general secondary schools um, and um, in each way which should be only one such arts secondary school. 
Yes, there's, the, those are the dance uh, secondary schools. So with, or, uh, the, there is just one group, uh, which is a dance, uh, uh, dance uh, group in a form, a dance form. Uh, at a secondary school, yes. Um, at, uh, let uh, me remind you that this is regulated by the Ministry of Education. Uh, we can uh, we can um, recommend having such solutions. And uh, as far as uh, the Institute of uh, Music and Dance is concerned, we are uh, cooperating with the institute, and we're going to run a couple of programs together. But the same thing could be done in the field of dance. But the question is how. We need to specify your postulates. So perhaps um, at the ballet schools or persons um, occupied um, uh, dealing with um, uh, dance perhaps uh, may form their postulates. And then we can go to the Ministry of Education. So Prime Min Deputy Prime Minister Kalinsky will send our recommendation and our request to the Ministry of National Education. So this recommendation goes to the Minister of Education and then talks begin. And then individual departments meet and they are thinking on how to um, organize this work. And for instance, we have sports classes. And um, okay, all right, if we have sports classes, why don't we have dance classes? Shall we try? Yeah, let's try. Uh, you know, it's being recorded. You are on camera. Yes, I know. It's important to specify your wishes. And um, once specified, uh, we can help you. Because this is what we do. As I've said before, as far as the number of uh, general educational um, hours are concerned, they have uh, been um, somewhat uh, reduced. And also we uh, introduced knowledge about dance uh, at the school leaving exams. So this could be done, so we can do more. And in the Ministry of Education we have um, um, as we have a favorable approach. Yes, they are a bit rigid with regard to the core curriculum and school leaving exams. They are reluctant to reduce the number of uh, schooling hours and uh, because then someone will come to the sports in secondary schools and would like to change their something as well. So they're a bit rigid about uh, core curriculum. Thank you, Director. Thank you for the declaration. So this is how we started um, the moved on to the next uh, part of our meeting, which is Q and A. So please address your questions to our experts. And there we are. We already have some questions. Yes, please. Could you please uh, pass on to the microphone? Uh, so there is a person in the first row. Could you please pass the mic? Please use the microphone. Madam Professor, please. Joanna Siewilska. Joanna Siewilska, hello. I have a question I would like to avail of this opportunity as we're talking about uh, dance, introducing dance as um, a subject uh, to school, so as to promote dance, a very interesting and valuable initiative, I agree. But also, I, being a ballet historian, I thought that perhaps we may have some uh, more theoretical education, but at uh, a low degree. It's not to about adding many hours, but how about uh, one um, lecture a semester about the history of uh, dance, uh, Western European dance, how about uh, having um, a lecture about ballet history and another lecture about Polish ballet and Polish dance, so that uh, society knows who, know who Teresa Kujawa Petri is. And um, the point is that uh, not to teach everyone history of dance, because also we have uh, ballet schools and we have uh, Uni universities and post uh, postgraduate uh, courses, but perhaps we need to make this education more general, and dance will become more. Um, this knowledge about dance will become more available, and uh, we really would like to pass this information on to the young people, because it's not only contemporary dance; it's also old dance, which is also very interesting, and it's a part of our culture, 
And if we look at our visual arts, if we look at our painting, music, architecture, old music, in all areas we have beautiful achievements and dance is one of those um, domains. And uh, for instance, we have a Polonaise dance that we play at uh, school um, leaving um, uh, parties uh, and uh, e events. Uh, and we have this historical um, attitude, but we can do it in a more broader sense. So I just thought that perhaps this could be my modest request to have at least one hour a semester. I know that the core curriculum is um, busy anyway, but I thought, uh, for instance, we used to have um, arts history in ballet schools, but there is not enough time to uh, lecture it, and I am dealing with upper secondary school students, and um, I have a problem because I have to speak about Baroque in dance and Baroque um, um, in arts, um, but I have only 45 minutes, which is not enough. So, I think that perhaps we might find a solution to that. Thank you. Paulina Wojciechowska, yes, yes. Paulina Wojciechowska, the uh, Physical Education Academy in Poznań. Thank you about this interesting perspective on education. And I wanted to suggest changing the optics a bit. The point is that we keep on mixing two domains, dance and physical education. I would like to suggest that we dare to say that dance is a separate domain. It's a different type of training. The intention of dance is different. The effect of dancing is different. It's a form of art. It's a part of our culture. It's a scientific domain as well. So, since the early days, we should say that it is not cannot be replaced with um, PE uh, classes. It is not something that is interchangeable with PE. No, it is not. We need to have um, dedicated time to dance and dedicated time to be a, we have such a richness of forms of dance that we can uh, show children from uh, the early uh, days uh, so we have folk dances there will be no problems with polonaise but we have uh, regional dances we have hip hop we have many different diverse forms of dance and if it's only three hours per semester from a pe teacher just to show this richness, it is simply not enough. Another point, why a PE teacher should be forced uh, to uh, run dance uh, classes if a PE doesn't know how to do Of course, it's a different story if a PE teacher is a dance enthusiast and uh, yesterday someone mentioned two or three semesters of uh, dance uh, um, a training for PE that would help, but we have uh, professional dancers who know how to teach dance. And um, as is was, it was mentioned before, at, um, at, uh, at the Physical Academy we have uh, some PE teachers who are being trained with dance uh, training as well. But here I see a lot of opportunity for dancers, professional dancers, uh, who together with pedagogical training may start working at school. So let dancers teach dance. This is my postulate. And um, yesterday Leszek Bzdyl spoke about the British experience and uh, in Great Britain everyone knows what's it. It's um, the educational dance model. This is what they have at British schools. There in uh, primary schools they already start working with children. How about us? Can we do the same thing? And then we will have uh, uh, the uh, good um, um, group of children who would be training will have more candidates to ballet schools. Uh, uh, those will be uh, children who would um, also undergo this therapeutic effect of dancing. Uh, this will uh, change the way they express themselves. So another uh, postulate to the Ministry of National Education, perhaps uh, dance could be uh, treated as a subject, as a separate subject uh, at schools. Thank you very much. And now row three, could you please pass the mic to a gentleman in uh, the third row. Please pass the mic. Grzegorz Chajtecki, Association Dance House. 
I have a couple a couple of postulates. First, I would be very cautious about uh, introducing uh, a subject called dance to schools. Why? I run myself such classes and when I tell children, okay, let's go and have some play, no problem. That's just primarily boys. But when I say, let's go and dance, they say, we, we don't dance. They say, yes, you do not dance. Uh, but you came to school, you started reading, uh, you, 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 you finally read, but no, I don't want to dance, boys say. So I do not say the word dance. Then we start dancing. Uh, it's dance fun, so to speak, it's just um, uh, using some uh, folk uh, dance elements and all of a sudden everything changes. However, I see that there is a principal problem about it. First, I teach at a school where all kids, uh, um, those are all kids that are artistically minded, uh, but uh, it's a drama, uh, a drama, art therapy, arts class, but it's all mixed together because it's one arts laboratory and depending on how kids feel, this is how we run the classes. But this is not PE, I agree. This is not PE. But these are art uh, classes. And secondly, this is something I've observed for the past 18 years. Uh, so uh, the moment I started uh, dealing with um, artistic education, where children uh, are less physically fit. They just don't feel their bodies, they don't know their bodies. I meet children who have a problem skipping over a rope. And I'm really happy if they finally manage to do it. You know, it's difficult for them to... Um, uh, to dance and... and uh, to do some um, rope skipping and well uh, when I was a kid everybody danced and no one was ashamed of that so I see the role uh, of um, dancing classes uh, at school but I'd be quite cautious introducing them uh, Mr. Zurek said that, you know, there are schools that would adopt it more easily and uh, those where it wasn't that easy. Well, if you travel around Poland, you can hear, okay, in the past, you know, where there were parties, you know, you would sing something to uh, an ensemble, um, uh, a band, and uh, then the band would pick it up and, you know, everybody would uh, start uh, having fun. But it used to be like this. But, you know, it's not only a thing of the past. There's this place, Biskupizna, and, you know, there you need to sing to the band and then the band picks up the tune and then everybody does it uh, too. Uh, and there's a party. And also, uh, another problem that I have is that I have too many boys and they don't want to come to dancing class because they don't have partners to dance with. Uh, you know, sometimes for 30 students I have 20 boys. I also want to refer to this therapeutical uh, role of uh, dancing. You know, you've all mentioned this therapeutic role uh, of dance. I have this impression that in traditional culture, where dance is doing fine, it is all happening naturally. So, you know, uh, where there's uh, this communion of dance, uh, music and then singing, uh, people are not afraid to dance, uh, whether they're young or uh, older. Let me come back to this um, um, Biskopin um, village. You know, we've carried out this project there for a while now. And this project is called Tabor Domutańca. 
and now we collaborate with the um, local commune uh, who wanted to organize such classes for children and now there are classes uh, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. and uh, we have very many uh, people who are interested in these classes you know after two or three days the uh, lists are full and these are classes uh, devoted to regional culture dance classes arts classes uh, uh, drumming uh, classes and also drama uh, classes so I believe that if you wanted to introduce dance to core uh, curriculum, maybe you shouldn't call these classes dance classes, but drama classes. You don't want to single out dance from this social phenomenon of dancing, singing and music making. No, uh, through dance you learn how to be part of a community. Okay, so Biskupizna, glad for mentioning it. Good afternoon, Agata Rzyczkowska, the head of the Nova Fala uh, Theatre and also of the Makers Collective. Uh, together with Paulina Świńcańska, I ran this uh, center of uh, dance um, art uh, of the art of dance in Warsaw uh, for many years and I'd like to mention here two postulates uh, mentioned by uh, Eva Wyczichowska and Ms. Sibilska so introducing dance uh, and the knowledge of dance to the core curriculum at schools not everybody wishes to dance uh, well we've said here that very many people uh, dance and um, it was. Uh, it's been said here that this is the second most popular form of uh, physical activity uh, in England. Uh, okay, in England. But still, we can agree on the high numbers of um, people who wish to dance, and we are very pleased about it about the fact that uh, Poles dance, uh, go dancing. But I believe that dance education uh, in general education schools would allow us to develop young, um, young children. Uh, there are three years of music classes in primary schools from fourth to, se uh, to sixth grade, four years of fine arts education from fourth grade to seventh grade. Not all the children wish to paint, not all the children wish to um, play an instrument or sing, but they do it anyway. Well, you said that dance classes discourage um, boys but you know some people are discouraged when they hear music but still they do it so maybe this dancing shouldn't only involve movement and this physical aspect of dancing but maybe it should also involve um, knowledge about dance so that we can uh, educate uh, young children to become future uh, audience of uh, dance performances. Thank you very much. Um, another question, please. I also, I believe this is the moment when we should popularize um, the uh, art of dancing. Uh, I don't remember any films on uh, dancing made in Poland in uh, abroad. We have all these films about uh, Acosta, uh, Pawanis, Onuriev.
Ms. Paulina Wyciechowska mentioned this uh, return of uh, dance classes to schools because it used to be there and I believe that we all agree that it's worth coming back to tradition. I actually represent uh, this form of dancing but I love all the other uh, dance forms that I became acquainted uh, with. And there's this difference uh, between asking whether uh, children will like it if we teach them dancing or not and whether we should teach dancing at all. And I believe we will all agree that we have to teach dancing because dancing is healthy. But you know, you shouldn't make children stand at the rod wearing uh, special dancing shoes instantly. No, you should just, in a way, instill passion for dancing in them. We shouldn't teach only classical uh, ballet. No, we should also teach folk dance, uh, modern dance, and uh, other forms of dance, uh, thinking obviously about the uh, needs of children. And I believe this Congress is a perfect opportunity for us to reiterate it again. Dancing should uh, return to schools and we need many entities to work together so that this is included in a formal legal act. Jarosław, I have um, a claim uh, to you. Let's not uh, leave this uh, panel uh, and not meet again. No, let's meet at the round table and use the strong voice of the Institute of Music and Dance, the Adam Mickiewicz Institute uh, and of others and let's create a good program together uh, as part of which teachers will be trained who will be well qualified to then create programs for uh, children that will suddenly discover that dancing is fun and they don't need to be afraid uh, of dancing the way they are sometimes afraid of maths or physics. Thank you very much. Uh, another speaker, please. Let me add something to what uh, Paulina Wojciechowska has said and the previous speaker. I used to be a consultant and an expert of the Central uh, Examination Committee um, when knowledge, uh, when dance knowledge was an A-level subject. Obviously, we don't need to uh, talk about this great value uh, that's uh, part of dancing. But as I met this uh, Central Examination Committee and also other experts, I felt clearly that uh, this field uh, was on the margin uh, of other activities. That it was introduced into the curriculum um, as the result of someone's whim. Uh, that was the general feeling. Uh, I also remember uh, politicians uh, discussing this, saying that, okay, if you can take dance uh, as an A-level uh, subject, why can't you take religion as an A-level subject? Now, I believe that If we wish to go beyond our comfort zone and if you want to go beyond the dancing community where we feel well, uh, then others will also start evaluating uh, dance 
mm. as a passion and as a profession too. Now, it has definitely a better stance when it is treated as a passion. Now, if there are only 40 graduates of uh, ballet schools a year, then very often people will claim that this is no education whatsoever. Now, if we introduce this education to um, ballet schools and also uh, the early years uh, at schools, then I believe that dance will be treated uh, differently uh, and no one will look down on dancing anymore. We have uh, four minutes left uh, for our questions because then we'll move on to questions from our online uh, viewers. I represent the Polish Forum of Choreography and I'm also a history teacher. Ladies and gentlemen, we're discussing here huge projects, but as Professor Ignacak said, we need to have this grassroots approach. If there is this um, uh, subject uh, science, uh, then called geography, and we talk about um, Polish landscapes, uh, and we talk about uh, different foods of different regions, but we don't mention dances, we don't even mention the fact that there are dances in individual regions, then it's a really bad situation. If we talk about romantic literature, why won't we have this lithograph uh, with uh, Maria Taglioni? Uh, at school as a cultural text that could describe a given era. I teach Baroque history at school and I show my students St. Peter's Basilica. But then I also show them uh, Louis, the Sun King, but it's out of my own uh, initiative, because this is not included in the curriculum. So, in order for us to show others uh, the value of dance, we should actually uh, include it into all the other subjects. We should teach dance uh, while we teach history, Polish, biology. And yes, dance should be a separate subject, uh, the way uh, music is, or arts. Uh, is, uh, but we won't show others this great value of uh, dance if we don't include it uh, into other um, spheres. We need to show it as a cultural good. And it's uh, unfortunately ranked very low uh, when it comes to being seen as a cultural good. And if we don't teach it, if we don't teach students this um, value of dance, then it won't be uh, treated with esteem. Now, if there are these uh, accents of music, of fine arts, uh, used in other um, subjects. Maybe we should do the same with dance. If we talk about Chopin, then maybe we should talk about Drzewiecki too. Now, I'd like to take a look at Mr. Vartak. Yes, but the Ministry uh, is responsible for uh, art schools. Now, here we're talking about general uh, education um, schools 
And here we need to collaborate with the Ministry of National Education. Yes, but uh, we can uh, come up with a recommendation here. Okay, we have a question from our online um, viewers. Now, there's this belief that dance is a very uh, specialized um, field, but maybe we should uh, do away with this erroneous uh, approach. After all, we all have bodies, right? Well, I wouldn't say that this is erroneous. I would just uh, say that there are different shades uh, of this uh, field. And I believe that there are different purposes involved uh, in dance. And now whatever we do in relation to dance, we after all work with people, their bodies, their expression. And we even don't think about this Cartesian uh, dualism. It's uh, a long time passé. So this is uh, we are individual, but we're also um, maintaining independent and complete schemes. So as I've been listening about this education and the need to invite dance or dancing uh, to schools, then I'm thinking in a somewhat in somewhat broader terms. About this, about this return to the body, we actually need it as, a, as people, as communities. In this universal world, way, we need to return to, uh, to the body, to the feeling, to being in a, a bodily condition, because once we are in our own bodies, if we're close to our own feelings, this is where, where uh, empathy uh, is born. And I think that this is what we actually need. So, PE thoughts. Unfortunately, PE in general, um, high schools, is limited to sports activities and uh, uh, PE actually suggests focusing on body with the work with the body. And um, PE for young people, especially uh, girls, is a traumatic experience. A question to Mr. Ruzharski. What are your ideas? How to promote dance among boys? How to increase uh, uh, social awareness about dance? Unfortunately, dance is stigmatized by young men, especially, especially in the peer groups. Well, the best example is when a boy dance and uh, dances, uh, um, is successful, is happy and And um, if um, if it is a handsome and well-built boy and uh, and um, is also liked by girls, but uh, when we speak about passion, uh, passion is also important. But anyway, serving examples, good examples. As I've been listening to you, um, I think I thought that perhaps we will try to enter those schools in Poznan. Um, but there are three points to talk about. First, finding a teacher of PE who, um, during uh, uh, just to, to do something different, instead of playing with a ball, would say, okay, how about uh, arranging some dance classes? Maybe people will come and dance. Then combining it with music, that this is the strongest possible link. If young people learn about music or learn about singing and they can combine it with dance quite naturally, especially in small groups, in smaller primary schools. And the third uh, group of people to talk to are teachers, uh, professional teachers who, who can prove that they can develop. So and as a part of their professional advancement, um, they could invite um, a ballet instructors who come and uh, teach um, uh, children and uh, pandemic has started, but we had a Charlie Chocolate Factory performance that is a performance for six soloists and 20 and 30 students from uh, lower secondary uh, grades uh, and from the middle school. And the first performance is on the 
12th of October, it's 40 minutes uh, and it's uh, done in such a way so that the young youth would uh, see their peers on the stage uh, but uh, in full joy, just having fun. So it's not about this professional stress but there is a lot of energy and vibe in his performance um, and uh, if uh, boys see boys they may say that maybe this is cool. Well for me there is this cultural barrier about thinking about ballet. It's not that boys don't dance, they dance. Uh, they dance uh, ballroom dances. We have really great dance companies and um, there we can see really well uh, trained boys dancing and as far as ballet schools are concerned there we see some boys at um, uh, all the uh, grades and um, they actually were used to be amateurs in the beginning so there is a barrier about ballet and somehow we need to cope with this barrier but I simply don't know how to do it sometimes we can see in the cities um, uh, there are break dancers they're really really great they're really um, well trained so the boys are there we simply don't know how to attract them to attract them to ballet we don't know how to do it but also in the context of the, our yesterday discussion it's about the image in the media uh, of uh, dancers um, uh, male and uh, female and people who are engaged with dance so we need to build media information and name those people we know who Lewandowski is we know who Malekat is so how about the name of this guy who dances so well in hip-hop and uh, is um, a professional of international acclaim so we would like to know their names how about promoting those names in the mass media TVP culture promised to do so but um, it's not only that TV channel we need more uh, so as to build a proper image of dancers So I hope that this is an answer to the question posed by an internet participant. So how to build image, but also how to run, uh, how about uh, family meetings? And this is a question to Maciej Zurek. And here one comment, indeed such classes were run, but um, they were ill perceived, uh, not by children, but by, by parents and by teachers. So, as you were saying, teachers sometimes uh, were not um, eager to follow you. Family meeting, yes, how to, uh, to arrange a family meeting. So you need to have an idea, you need to have people with whom you would like to do it. But what to begin with? Right. Adventure? How about adventure? I think that, listen, adventure is there we need to, um, adventure is a wonderful thing and dla nas takim wiecie elementem jak chemia so we know that uh, it was uh, we are all focused on chemistry mathematics and so on and so forth and uh, my see my sons in uh, the primary school and they won't really follow but still they i, I go to primary schools i talk to children, I take them to the countryside, we have adventures and once that starts happening and if it is in an off-school environment and it becomes something different, it becomes an adventure, an outing, then it is really great and also the space is important and if we have places somewhere in the countryside where we meet in a house, then it opens a very different set of possibilities but what to do so as to include the parents so that uh, parents uh, of their own free will would join and here the, it's the same puzzle we're facing and that's exactly the same question how to do it so let's start with the kids because if kids feel the adventure if they think it's a great thing to experience then they start talking about it at home that something is great and then perhaps um, we could uh, catch the parents on that side, but parents are usually overworked uh, and of their own free will and accord, I don't think that they would come up with this an idea. I, I'm not sure about it. So I'm sorry to say I don't have an answer to your question, but we are not expecting you to give us answers. Yes, but we have exactly the same puzzle. Yes, but this meeting is there uh, to uh, provoke a certain train of thought. Um, on how to popularize dance, how to educate, because this is an, a never-ending story.
But how about the movement of um, village uh, dance? Uh, something that is happening in central Poland in the villages where people are dancing uh, to their music in um, their uh, firefighter houses. Uh, it's something that is extended in tradition and uh, earlier on uh, the audience was rather elderly but now it's middle-aged people who come and so that's an offer to these people and at some point they will come with their children and perhaps uh, they will do something together with their children and practice with their children. It wasn't there before. But I think that it could be um, dealt with, um, so creating, um, uh, so how about have, having um, upper secondary schools with dance profile <clears throat> and to perhaps uh, this will help them uh, to pursue dance once they proceed to other universities. Yes, um, uh, we see here that uh, the um, there is uh, this uh, field to create some dance, um, uh, a, a, a dance um, um, high school. Yes, rather a class, or rather a, a form, a form in such a school that uh, will specialize in dance. Yes, but also we have dance schools, and we have uh, a, a dance school, and dance school uh, has exactly the same program but uh, children attend regular schools apart from that so they go to regular schools uh, apart from the dance school so i don't know what to say so as far as a, a profile of dance in a general educational uh, secondary school then i don't think that they would have a possibility upon graduating uh, training at the schools because in order to be a teaching one will have to graduate from a university so i don't really understand the question so what is this question about well it's not even a question it's rather at conclusion she, the lady says i'm an in initiator of um, forming a class a group of children that uh, specializes in dance and they cooperate with the university in uh, watch and um, they follow the core curriculum they can take some extended classes but also subjects but also arts and for four years they have a lot of many they have 16 hours per week of dance both uh, training and theory and um, we cooperate uh, with the lecturers fr from the watch university well it's a great initiative But uh, I've, um, uh, there was some talk about some professional training of future teachers, but then uh, secondary school cannot possibly do that. Maybe in contemporary uh, dance, partially, yes, but universities uh, test the uh, skills of um, um, students. Uh, and uh, not all of the university students have a possibility to graduate from a ballet school, yes. So you are talking about uh, uh, preparing students uh, to enroll at arts universities. Then, yes, from this point of view, this may, can make sense. Now, dance therapy and movement therapy, I, this is how I use traditional dance. It is important for the dancers because dancers can express themselves using song and movement. And also internet participants speak of improvisation. How about ballet school? Is improvisation something usual, usual at a ballet school? Can students improvise? Sure. Improvisation used to be a thing unknown in the past, but now improvisation is quite important. And um, it's about shaping a young person and uh, if a student comes to me with an idea that the student would like to have some choreography piece done then i would um, hug and say okay go for it try so when people come say i would like to take some ballet pictures great wonderful just do it so this is what changes their focus alters their fo focus because uh, the students of ballet schools are to the legs to the uh, least extent are um, self-reliant in their work. They need support, so whatever they do, whichever step they take towards being um, independent and being uh, next to the stage and deciding on what to do, what's, 
which music, which style to choose. All of that is very important. Improvisation is all of that. Is uh, improvisation because of that is very important, necessary. So improvisation on the level of uh, training in a ballet school. Um, that's at the ballet school. And how about general schools? Well, improvisation is very important because improvisation is exactly when energy is released. This is the moment of uh, self-creation, self-fulfillment. So those small children, of course, at different stages of uh, education, in, uh, for instance, even in the kindergarten, they, there is more improvisation in kindergartens, but also in um, um, also at high grades, uh, uh, improvisation is also important because just to have uh, have some fun of dancing. So a, a few, a couple of minutes of improvisation is important because they can express themselves and dance. They can uh, learn how to deal with the space of a ballet room, and they also compose their own um, dance movements. Uh, so they need to think about it. And uh, as far as the school children are concerned, improvisation leads uh, uh, to a choreography because sometimes a pedagogue will set a task just play some music and says okay please um, dance to this music using such and such style because for instance it's jazz dance so please follow the jazz style to this music and do something and then uh, children start dancing and by the way, it's uh, quite a pleasant activity for them because they compose themselves. The, then uh, all those some elements are used for choreography. Choreography is developed, and then this choreography is presented on uh, on the stage. So yes, improvisation is important. I apologize, but I would like to uh, talk about pedagogues again, if I may. We need to. Actually, all of us we realize that, uh, but I simply would like to underscore that. One thing is uh, to have classical ballet pedagogues and uh, uh, contemporary dance pedagogues is a different story. Classical dance may be taught only and exclusively by those people who have graduated from a ballet school or spent years dancing in a theater. It is impossible to skip this um, barrier of, 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 of gaining some knowledge and skills. And as far as contemporary dance is concerned, here we have many diverse directions. There are many people who deal with contemporary dance in all forms and shades. For years, those people are very efficient and um, those uh, people are better at uh, training contemporary dance than the graduates of ballet schools. And a question to Director Ruzalski about hip hop because hip hop uh, may be a form of um, making young people active. So uh, when do you uh, train hip hop at grades one, two, three? It's a wonderful compl compl complementation because that's natural energy release for them. They cannot sit still. And in hip hop, there are some rules, uh, but it's all about very natural movement. So, hip hop. Um, uh, that's a gift of heaven for us and especially in the early years there is this um, uh, shock of standing by the bar and doing the leg movements but here you go crazy and hip-hop is always present in our concerts we have a great pedagogue hip-hop uh, pedagogue and uh, the youth immediately like him because they need to like the teacher and then just go for it and dance and that's a very very natural thing to, to do so we dance Okay, how about those uh, dancing sprees? Uh, so what's the atmosphere during dancing spree? Uh, what is the atmosphere like? Uh, uh, people say, okay, I'm in the village, let's go to the dancing spree. Maybe it's going to be nice, I will attend from time to time. So do people return once they try? Of course they, tr they return once they try. Because um, the idea is all the same. Uh, for instance, in the uh, village dancing club, it's a different idea. The idea is to return to the tradition and um, um, uh, sometimes people meet to dance uh, for whatever reason or no reason at all. Uh, they may meet at a house, at a fireman's station, whatever. Um, in the Radomsk region, where I was learning a lot uh, about music and the elderly say that when they were young, on a fri on on only one only on Fridays there was dancing, but they were meeting to dance six 
uh, time, uh, six days a week. And I said, but you're farmers. It was very difficult. And they say, yes, folks, it's difficult. But then after the field work, we were just uh, going to dance. Um, so this is a return to the youth days, uh, but they are highly competent. They're really good dancers, uh, like young cats. Uh, they know how to uh, sing and dance at the same time. It's like fireworks. Try it. You will love it. Uh, just go to dancing spree in a village. Uh, but also in the cities, we have so many opportunities not to watch traditional dance, but simply go and uh, dance, like the Warsaw Dance House. Or... The Embassy of Traditional Music or the Poznan Dance House um, and uh, I apologize uh, for not mentioning all other dance uh, venues. Uh, so their calendars are full with dance events and they're dedicated to the idea of coming and trying and it's worth coming and trying because uh, this is uh, very easy access to this uh, act of creation in which we can participate without being artist and um, without even claiming to be an artist. Uh, Maciej, uh, two reflections. As I listen to this community of traditional music, I know that you keep thinking about dance, but because every time you use the term traditional music only, then in the future, uh, will be difficult for us to convince people that dance is this autonomous um, part of art. Now, I opted for you to call yourselves uh, this workshop of traditional music and dance, because if this dance keeps being included in music, then it will be treated as such. And after all, it's not true. We are part of music, right? Dance is part of music, but at the same time, it's a separate discipline. But I also have a, a different question uh, here, and it's the following. Okay, what would happen if at uh, general education ballet schools, the last four grades could be and we know that demands for, for, for children are very, very high. Uh, so what would happen if at this um, ballet school, general education uh, ballet school, or maybe we could call it vocational uh, ballet school, maybe we could have this class where children who became fell in love with hip-hop and who will not become ballet dancers maybe they could continue this school uh, at the level of secondary school and then they could enter this milieu of the so-called contemporary dancers maybe someone from the audience would like to say something well the fact is that we are thinking about this, uh, the department thinks about this. Well, I haven't talked to all the directors. I've um, asked one of the directors of one of the schools to uh, present us with such a material and I believe that by the end of October it will be sent to you and then once you become acquainted with it uh, we will meet again and discuss it. So yes, we are thinking about uh, profiling uh, this uh, second stage of um, education at ballet schools. And maybe, well, there are 10,000 uh, people who dance. Yes, this is what I'm talking about. So yes, we have this idea, but as I've said, within one month, um, I'll get uh, the results of the first debate and then you will uh, get them too. Now, when it comes to children, uh, the obstacle are point shoes. I run this group of girls who started dancing when they were uh, seven, now they are 14. And, you know, they are excellent, uh, you know, they do the jumps, uh, they are very uh, flexible, they're uh, great 
with uh, aerobics, but for them there's no room uh, in ballet schools because they never uh, danced on pointed in pointed shoes. And I believe that many girls would go to ballet schools at an older age, but there's this barrier that uh, they cannot overcome because the ballet school curriculum is the way it is. But on the other hand, I know that there used to be uh, girls that would go to the third or fourth grade of ballet school and usually uh, they were rejected. It happens that they are accepted but they need to give up after two or three years because they cannot catch up. Sometimes they take private classes but uh, still they cannot be successful. On the other hand, these children are very, very fit um, and their bodies are very fit but still they fail. I'll be speaking here not uh, as a um, dance pedagogue uh, in a practical sense because I've never been one and I believe that I, I, I won't become one, one anymore but uh, I'm speaking here as a person observing this uh, dance life uh, for many years. So there have been such uh, ideas here but I believe that there is some resistance in the educational community itself. Mirek, at the Poznań Ballet School there used to be this um, entertainment uh, dance uh, profile and this was a four-year cycle. Some of the graduates, and I know what happened uh, to them later, never became professional dancers, but some of them became members of renowned uh, dancing ensembles, dancing groups. So this was a similar experiment uh, was run at the Wuj uh, Ballet School and there was this special class at the uh, Wuj Ballet School that would take children aged 16 and more and you know, the school was left by an excellent group of dancers who are active uh, in this dancing profession now. S but unfortunately, these initiatives uh, were finished, maybe due to personal reasons, maybe financial ones, I don't know oh, these reasons. But such experiments have been conducted. Uh, they were successful. and. There's no reason that we uh, shouldn't come back to them. You need to start ballet education early, but you also need to think about changing this stage of education when you know that for anatomic reasons, some students will never uh, well, become professional dancers because they cannot overcome uh, their physical uh, shortcomings. I know very many dancers who began uh, at a later age and who were also successful in classical ballet. Professor Eva Wyczichowska went to uh, Poznań Ballet School uh, two years later and as she said she is trying to catch up until today. But there is such an opportunity after all. It's not impossible to do it. And you cannot uh, assume uh, that you know you won't get enrolled because you uh, didn't get this education from a very uh, young age. Uh, in Szczecin there's another school and I remember that uh, there was a large group of uh, young talented people who came from Szczecin to Poznań and who got high places in uh, dance competitions, not ballet competitions, but dance competitions. Uh, and they did very well. So you just need to be open. It all depends to which grade uh, the kid uh, enrolls. If it's the second or third grade, they are able to uh, catch up. 
you know, uh, fourth or fifth? No. It's easier for boys um, to, to catch up. Yes, it's true, it's easier to catch up for boys because uh, there's, uh, there are no uh, pointed shoes um, uh, used there. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are uh, past our time. Uh, now, I'm sure that the issue of education is extremely important and I'd like to thank you for this discussion. Uh, I'd like to thank our panel speakers, our audience here and also our online audience. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Now we're going to have a 30 minute long break and at 12 we will have our debate on dancers, professional trained dancers. Thank you very much for this discussion panel.
Dzień dobry, witam Państwa. Good afternoon, welcome back after the break. This is the fourth panel in the second dance congress. The title is Social, Artistic and Educational Challenges for Dancers. So I'd like to welcome the audience here at the Polin Museum of Polish Jews. And uh, also would like to welcome all those who follow us online. I'm very happy that there are so many of you that you're taking part in these discussions. I also would like to uh, pass on the baton, or rather microphone, to Jacek Przybyłowicz, who would moderate the session. And uh, if we could see the postulates that have been developed by us. Those are postulates that are related to social, artistic and educational challenges. Jacek, over to you. Thank you. I, I am very grateful for uh, this function of running the session. I would like to welcome our guests who will help help us and um, that they will help us to uh, run a public debate on dance. So together with us we have Krzysztof Pastor, the director of uh, Polish National Ballet, National Ballet. Magdalena Zalipska, the soloist of the Mazowsze Ensemble. Witold Pigański, the uh, National Trade Union of Professional Dancers. Aleksandra Osowicz, independent choreographer and dancer. And uh, Paulina Wojciechowska, choreographer, independent artist and the lecturer in Poznań at the Academy of Fine Arts in, uh, uh, sorry, physical education in Poznań. And Artur Szklener, the director of the National Center. Uh, Frederick Chopin Center is, going, is due to join us soon. So, I would like to say that um, as we spoke um, uh, during the first Congress of Dance 10 years ago, uh, that time we spoke about uh, different um, as division into uh, dancers. So, those were professional dancers in professional dance companies and institutional dancers, but now non-institutional dancers and there are quite many of them. They are well prepared to, to act as professional dancers and they're looking for their own dance spaces. They create companies, they create groups and um, I think that after these 10 years we have a different um, set of categories of dancers. So it might seem obvious that somehow we can um, distribute uh, dancers uh, into known categories but now we have the so-called good and bad dancers so some of them attract the attention of the viewers and uh, they are exceptional on the stage but also unfortunately there are dancers that um, are somehow um, avoid our attention. Hello, director. So, I would like to ask our guests to... I would ask you to... Uh, if you could tell us what should decision makers that uh, shape uh, cultural policy in Poland know about dancers? We have many guests and they have different perspectives and I hope that those perspectives will not uh, contradict each other. And uh, also we have uh, the uh, director of the uh, Polish National Flag uh, Ballet. Uh, his presence is a guarantee that probably we'll hear some other uh, set of uh, expectations that differ from the expectations of other panelists because they run their own artistic uh, projects because they create their own dancing spaces. So, Krzysztof, if you could begin this, please, and please tell us what do you think is the knowledge, the type of knowledge that our decision-makers still do not have, 
but they should have it so as uh, to take due care of the practitioners. Thank you. It's a very difficult question indeed. The Polish National Ballet is a company that has the repertoire, which is very much classical repertoire, which is not to say that uh, we work only with those dancers that have been trained only in classical dance. Uh, quite on the contrary, we have also modern repertoire and we need to have universal dancers and we need modern and uh, also we have we need to have very versatile dancers. And um, one of the criteria. And as far as the Polish National Ballet is concerned, um, it's important to have certain physical um, prowess. Um, and um, that is quite specific, but creativity is yet another element. This is uh, what we see in other forms of dance. But also now, as far as classical dance companies are concerned, this creativity and the capability to improvise and to take part in a creative process is very important. And if some people cannot do it, then they are excluded from many different productions, sadly. And as far as the... We also host many productions and there are some new productions that appear. But um, with the already existing uh, predictions, uh, it's important to have such versatility. For instance, Wayne McGregor uh, will uh, undoubtedly will be very attentive uh, to many different details, uh, as uh, he would be examining artists um, as if uh, are they fit for a ballet or not. And then the mus musical education is quite important. Um, sometimes it's natural. But I think that uh, this is something to be trained as well. And um, I think that this is a very important uh, feature of uh, having this uh, musicality. And, uh, but also th th these people should be intelligent, uh, creatively intelligent. And I think that you can see it uh, during, uh, you can sense that as you watch them perform on the stage. And sometimes it's also about intuition. It's not necessarily scientific knowledge or scientific approach to this creative process, to uh, performing task and, uh, tasks and to this musicality. But I think what is um, important on the stage is intuition as well. Now, Magdalena. Could you please tell us, from your perspective, you are a soloist and also you are a soloist at the Mazovsha company and um, perhaps um, we should somehow uh, change the work of big dance companies is uh, prepared. So if you could kindly sp sp present your opinion because I think it's um, the director of a Polish national ballet has a different uh, negotiation standing. Uh, but you are a soloist, you are a dancer with major experience. Uh, but what is the weakest uh, what is the weakest link or the weakest point in, in the case of um, big dance companies such as Mazowsza? Yes, I wanted to be a, a somewhat controversial because the director spoke about uh, about dancers, what dancers uh, should uh, contribute. And I thought uh, perhaps um, I would like to say what is it that dancers would like to receive? Not necessarily from uh, directors of institutions because I am quite uh, privileged here because I have a full time uh, contract. Uh, I have an institution that takes care of me. So many of the needs that my colleagues, dancers, and their expectations are concerned, they have their own expectations as to the system. And I have some, uh, I am lucky because I work in an institution that takes care of me. I have really good conditions to work. But um, my problem, uh, my, the problem is bigger. We, 
as institutional dancers we have all conditions provided for and everything works. So as far as the system is concerned, what we miss is perceiving dancers as professionals. We are professionals. And um, as I'm looking uh, through a set of uh, pieces of legislation there, they treat dancers as people with passion, but systemic solutions do not meet the specifics of our job. And uh, we are not treated as professionals and uh, by law. And uh, obviously there are many more professions in this situation, but as far as our profession is concerned, if we use the purely legalistic uh, code-based uh, approach, and this is the approach that should be applied to, with regard to big dance companies such as myself, so we need to work eight hours a day with um, a break. But so when, but this is people think we need to do, but our expectations are somewhat different. We should be treated more like teachers, like, a, 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 like we need something like teacher's charter. So those provisions should be well based on real life, a real profession, so that we can actually use them uh, fully and thus um, reveal our potential fully within the framework of this institution or without an institution and um, something that we can develop. So. Uh, dancers, uh, other dancers and me, we believe that this is the systemic element that we still miss. So it's not about uh, looking at freelance dancers or da institutional dancers, but as a profession of a dancer. And we need specific regulation, legal regulation. And I think that uh, as such uh, meetings like this and also the activities of the Institute of Music and Dance will finally help us uh, to draft regulations that um, are tailor-made for dancers. Thank you. And now I would like to invite Witold. Again, being a bit provocative, uh, what are dancers' expectations? Because you are a representative of a trade union of dancers, and uh, obviously you unite dancers of many different trades and walks of life. You work not only with institutional dancers. So what is a brief definition or maybe not definition. Could you please tell us how can we, as a milieu, to how can we introduce some structural changes so that uh, dancers are better protected? Quite a broad uh, question. I would like to try to give a concise answer. So in our trade union, we have uh, uh, primarily institutional dancers employed uh, at different cultural institutions, but uh, we do, as the trade union, cooperate with um, other dancers uh, who are not uh, contractual workers on the basis of new uh, regulations that were adopted two years ago. So this um, actually has um, increased our capacity to work. However, um, in order to improve the situation in Poland, we would need to think how to address this complex issue properly. So we need um, uh, proper patronage so as to protect art, so that art develops on a good high level, so that artists um, are well supported as professionals, that good choreographers are protected, but also at the institutions. It is important to make sure that um, uh, dance performances are uh, done uh, to live music, um, as it improves the perception very much. And um, some institutions are subsidized by the state budget um, and uh, therefore I think that such performances should be covered by the public media. Also, it is important to, to reach out uh, to the audience using the mass media to a much greater extent than in the past and as far as systemic leg legislative changes are concerned, then the expectations are um, just uh, the same as uh, we were voicing the posture during the nationwide cultural 
uh, conference. Um, uh, so uh, dancers are still not recognized as a special profession. And, uh, and dancers are not recognized as professionals who work under special conditions. And uh, um, some people were saying uh, that uh, the uh, retirement rights uh, were not um, given to dancers appropriately, or some people were calling them calling them duly privileges. Uh, but because uh, dancers do suffer from some professional diseases and dancers are overloaded, beginning, this is the only artistic profession where uh, uh, dance professionals suffer from um, excessive load. This may happen, so uh, prompt reaction is necessary. So we do not have a sufficient medical examination. So we need to, to have um, um, medical uh, personnel specializing in pr music and dance professionals so as uh, to provide them uh, for um, appropriate health care prevention for musicians and dancers. We do not have such medical personnel, uh, such medical unit. Therefore, this means that um, this is with a detriment to the Polish dance school. And also the young generation that is less interested in uh, following this uh, profession. We have a smaller number of graduates, we have uh, ever-increasing requirements and uh, the need uh, for professional requalification during the career. All that means that um, the status of this uh, profession is um, decreasing every year. And another tendency that we see in theatres that we have more and more foreigners in the dust companies, which is obviously to the advantage of directors of such institutions and uh, dancers from South Korea or from Japan. For them, uh, for those dancers, uh, this is a stopover in their career. For them, this is just an interim stage in their Theatrical, theatrical work and then they move on to the Western Europe. So it's quite a convenient situation to directors because uh, such a dancer works for a year or two and then they move on uh, to other theatres uh, where they need to requalify but would have a, a three-tier protection system. So we need, uh, we need to have such a three-tier system where um, the dancers um, are supported financially on the basis of their own contributions and contributions made by the institution, by the state budget. But, um, uh, but uh, in the West, for instance, this is a highly individualized system of supporting. So it's uh, not only about training and receiving um, uh, some um, remuneration as they train, uh, but, um, uh, for instance, as dancers sometimes in the West have such possibilities that they can open up their businesses and uh, this gives them some possibilities, especially for those who have families. So, as you see, the situation varies from country to country. So, this having a family during your <laughs> professional life is sometimes a hurdle for female dancers. Uh, we want to redefine here this um, coming back to uh, the employment market. Uh, now, Maria Stokosa and Violetta Ilchuk, they worked together with me on the content uh, of this uh, panel and we wanted to tackle the issue of uh, female uh, dancers. We will definitely come back to this um, problem. However, before we do this, I'd like to um, tell you that, in my opinion, uh, Speaking from the um, from speaking from the point of view of an employer, the fact that we have foreign dancers coming to Poland is actually a blessing for us. It's wonderful that they come to us and we also can go abroad and perform there. So it's a blessing that uh, foreign artists 
come to us and that Poland is such an open country that they actually uh, choose to do so. So there's this, it's mutually uh, beneficial for us. And if we think about ballet schools, uh, graduates, uh, were it not for this international exchange, uh, the level of these schools and then uh, performances would be quite low. Uh, well, these are only our humble opinions, but definitely uh, there's uh, such a need and uh, the association could help here. We need empirical studies because without statistics you cannot come to necessary conclusions and you cannot uh, take necessary uh, corrective actions. Well, uh, what I'm talking about is based on statistics, at what age you become a professional dancer, for how long, for how many years you work, um, in how many theatres, and so on. These are questions that still have no answers, but without such answers we cannot suggest any uh, concrete uh, solutions. So this is actually my answer to your question. Now, when it comes to systemic solutions, there have been different situations uh, in different theatres and uh, very often uh, theatre managers um, were not interested in the plight of uh, dancers who had no rights uh, retirement rights. That was the situation until uh, 2009. But there are still some dancers who haven't acquired any uh, retirement uh, rights. Uh, that made uh, their situation extremely difficult. They were left without any uh, form of entitlement. Um, now their attempts to retrain them so that uh, they, for example, stay uh, at the cultural institutions where they used to dance, but performing a different uh, job. Mm. So, for example, at the Grand Theatre Polish National Opera, uh, there were two-year programs uh, and as part of such programs, dancers could uh, get bachelor degree while receiving their um, remuneration. Now, it's a highly specialized profession, we know it. However, this isn't reflected in uh, dancers' earnings. And obviously the situation has, um, has become even worse. Uh, due to uh, the pandemic. Okay. What should the decision makers uh, know about uh, dance community in Poland? Well, we all have a different perspective here. And now I'd like to ask you, Ola, about your perspective because you started your career at the Baltic Opera, but you gave up being an artist of this theater quite quickly. Now, was your decision related to uh, artistic issues or maybe you didn't want to be uh, part of uh, this uh, team. Maybe I was too young at the time to appreciate what uh, a job contract um, could give me. My uh, main motivation at the time was to keep developing. For me, working with just choreographer, and at the time I worked only with uh, Isadora Weiss, um, forced me to move uh, only uh, in one way 
and I was interested in other forms of expression. Uh, therefore, I decided to leave the team for uh, three uh, after three years and uh, take this uh, micro retirement uh, money uh, in a way for my body to rest because after three years I was extremely tired physically uh, and then I went to Brazil and then came back to Poland again and I've been in Poland for the past 10 years and I've been a freelance dancer uh, since. Okay, so this Congress is the best place for all the uh, problems that uh, we see important and that uh, on which you should shed the daylight. Well, what I wanted to say... Okay, I'd like to uh, tell you what those who decide uh, about uh, cultural policy should know about um, dancing profession. Now, dancer's body is sacred. Uh, that's why we need access to uh, physiotherapists, to masseurs, to osteopaths. Well, but I've been a freelance dancer for 10 years now and I don't have this health insurance. I am a really professional uh, dancer. I work with top people, but I uh, need to uh, keep thinking on uh, keeping my, uh, my, my health insurance, especially that I don't have, as I've said, any employment uh, contract. It is also important that you don't force a body uh, to uh, things it cannot do. You don't overload your body. Now, for us to be able to uh, meet the endings, uh, make the endings meet, we need to take part in a dozen of projects a year. And this greatly influences our uh, bodies. I'd like to tell you about one experience I had last year. Um, I participated... Well, uh, now I have to think about uh, the title of this uh, performance. Well, congratulations, because there are very many artists uh, who don't perform at all. Uh, there are no stagings for us. Okay, so there was this staging Wycieka uh, Zamie Całe Zło and uh, we um, performed in Switzerland and Jonna Kosmirowska made sure that before that we would be there before the festival and stay uh, until the end of the festival. Uh, I was surprised because I was used uh, to a situation where I just fly into a country, go uh, directly to, um, to, the uh, to the rehearsal, then perform and then uh, leave uh, instantly. And I don't see any other performances and so on. Joanna uh, Leśnierowska made sure that uh, we would be there for a longer period of time, see ourselves uh, performing. Um, take some rest, slow down, um, and uh, operate this way. Well, you spent a dozen of years uh, in a team that still doesn't have its own building, its own stage, that keeps uh, exploring uh, new fields, but where uh, body is also uh, exploited uh, a lot. Now, what can you uh, tell us now? Because uh, as far as I know, uh, you became an independent uh, dancer two or three years ago and you also create your own uh, space for expression. So, what expectations do you have 
in front of the system. Um, now I believe that uh, you will speak on behalf of uh, very many of those who uh, work independently. Now, five years ago, uh, I uh, concluded my employment at the um, Grand Theatre and I well, worked very, um, I, I worked greatly, for example, in the evening, uh, very intensely. Then I would travel uh, to a given festival, uh, I would go to the rehearsal, then perform. I wouldn't see uh, the place where we performed. And yesterday there was this panel on dance production and I believe uh, this is the case all over Europe and actually all over uh, the world uh, that um, if you stay one night longer um, at a given place it costs too much uh, and everybody's looking for uh, savings so this is all happening at the cost of uh, a dancer. On the other hand, these were wonderful um, years for me when it comes to artistic work. I collaborated with excellent choreographers, uh, including uh, Jacek. Thank you for that. When it comes to repertoire of the Polish dance uh, theater, uh, it was also very rich. We also worked with uh, Zohatina Harin, uh, Jansen. Esberg, Orian Anderson, excellent European choreographers. But at the same time, uh, we felt great um, that our bodies were greatly exploited uh, in a way. Fortunately, we had access to physiotherapists. But I believe we should have this um, national. Uh, center of dance medicine available uh, for dancers. Now it was very difficult for me to become a freelance dancer. I retired as a dancer at the age of 40 and at the age of 40 I uh, entered the market that was already filled with uh, dancers and where there was little infrastructure and uh, only few festivals and opportunities uh, for uh, performance. So even though I've been a choreographer for uh, the past uh, 20 years, uh, I actually started from scratch and I had to compete against NGOs, uh, different institutions. Obviously you can always um, get uh, some grant from uh, a city, but uh, there are also other entities that uh, take part in uh, municipal uh, competitions. And uh, obviously such um, competitions are um, operated by, um, well, state officials, um, civil servants, and their perspective of dance also varies. So sometimes they see um, a description uh, of an event and it's all very nicely uh, written that dance is involved, but in the end it turns out that there's very little dance in a given performance. So now a dancer isn't simply a dancer. Uh, he or she uh, has to be a choreographer, a manager at the same time. You know, you, you have all these different functions that cannot be separated from one another. Okay, so uh, you got your experience uh, in this one uh, institution, but uh, for the past five years you've uh, been independent. So what have been uh, the greatest hurdles for you and what could help you um, to, to develop? Uh, are these 
these retirement entitlements, for example. Uh, no, there is no one thing that could help us. You need to have this comprehensive approach here. So, I believe this, um, you know, if you're a dancer, uh, you need to have all these other skills too. You need to be creative. Uh, you need to... Um, be able to be a choreographer at the same time. You need to know choreology. So you have to be a man of, a, of the Renaissance. And this concerns not only independent dancers, but also uh, those who are employed by institutions. There's also the issue of uh, retraining and uh, as I've heard here before, we'll be able to discuss it later. Now, there are um, disadvantages and advantages uh, of uh, becoming uh, independent dancers. There are definitely advantages for society. Let me give the floor to our next uh, speaker. You have experience uh, in preparing documents to establish the status of a, a professional uh, dance artist. Two years ago in Bitom, we had an opportunity to uh, discuss this issue uh, already. Why is the status so uh, important? Why is it so important from the point of view of um, dance artists? And why should this document um, confirm the fact that uh, dancers are part of a very unique group. Well, thank you very much for your invitation and I feel uh, I should be mainly listening to what you have to say. And um, Mr. Bigański uh, mentioned here uh, the uh, Polish um, Cultural uh, Congress, and this draft legislation uh, that's already ready to go through the uh, official uh, legislation path uh, actually reflects the postulates that were voiced during that Congress. I'm not sure whether this is the place where I should uh, speak in detail about uh, this uh, draft bill. But, well, it definitely has this holistic approach to um, dance artists and artists as such. So, uh, it defines and puts uh, in order uh, the notion of an artist. And dancers are treated there in quite an unusual and unique uh, way. This is the only profession where uh, secondary school examinations um, mm, are uh, taken into account. And yeah, uh. so that um, they have uh, the rights um, acknowledged by the system. So uh, to be more detailed, we have developed a, a system that um, will uh, help to solve most of your uh, problems. And what we need to do, we need to, to pass this law. And if I, if I may appeal to you, my appeal would be that we, as uh, the artistic community, we need to, to support this draft law. Because um, after a year of a dealing with this draft law, which is a precedence, by the way, because we didn't have any preceding piece of legislation and we had to develop some specific piece, uh, piece of legislation and to build on the uh, state uh, philosophy that was not there. So, because after 1989 we changed uh, the way we function as the state, we had to change the role of the state also in, in, uh, in, in the field of arts. And then, in 2009, 
the old system was uh, uh, disassembled and now we need to create a new system and in our draft law we specify that so there is this uh, very modern structure being established because uh, they, uh, they, they call it a quango that is the quasi-governmental institution this is what has been established this is a structure which gives stability sense of stability because uh, um, it is uh, stabilized uh, by uh, the public funds uh, and by the government because it gives full autonomy to artists and um, the council is the most important uh, body and the body consists of three parts from three parts of delegates uh, two-thirds of delegates are delegates of artists uh, and um, one is uh, delegates of the government so that is also representatives of the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of Labour. Um, so those are very thought through solutions and um, they mean that artists, also dancers, will have a tool uh, to be uh, an insured professional group and uh, if they have no income then they will have a very significant uh, financial support up to 80% if they have uh, um, if um, they, at a relevant uh, level of income, they're going to have uh, some tax allowances and social insurance allowances. And once they work in their profession, their status will be extended automatically. And uh, if they wish to change their uh, uh, professional uh, path, uh, so that uh, instead of uh, being institutional professionals, they would like, would like to become freelancers, which is quite important for many people, because actors and dancers mentioned that. Actually, all artists who are not linked with one company, they do not, they do not want uh, to uh, be linked to one institution only. They need mobility, and mobility is something that was mentioned many times during the culture conference. So this mobility system uh, will become possible. And even if an artist uh, will not uh, have any income on artistic activity, uh, for instance, um, um, income on uh, artistic activity or edu educational activity that gives uh, not much uh, income, then uh, there will be additional support provided by the system. So once again, to sum up, I would like to say what we're facing right now is um, a discussion. We simply need to, to hammer out some detailed solutions so as to finance the system because since the very beginning we assumed that uh, most of funding will um, we will receive uh, from uh, the mm, um, from the um, from uh, the uh, retrographic uh, fee. This is a fee that is collected from the devices, recording devices. So this is the fee that is collected in Poland uh, from um, photocopying machines and uh, from modern devices such as, as uh, from modern devices such as computers, smartphones, and uh, discs, uh, and uh, some other memory carriers that allow to copy information. Anyway. On two occasions, as we were working on our law, we had election campaigns, first in 2019, that was the campaign uh, to the parliament, and then we had uh, the presidential elections. And those two elections meant that the discussions on the solutions that are important for us, um, those um, discussions were taking place in a specific context of political struggle between the candidates. And so now we have again this situation, if you follow the course of events, the situation is that there is this serious discussion and there are uh, serious objections by President Duda and uh, public um, reservations as uh, to using the smartphone fee uh, to our needs. So we're still waiting for the consensus. And, um, Another solution would be to, and this is what I'm looking for, is that the administrative work um, will uh, kick off on this work because on on this draft law because this means that in a couple of months from now the law will finally be adopted. But this mechanism is very complex. It's so complex that it is simply impossible for the beneficiaries, the artists. Uh, uh, to have real effects um, of uh, entitlements uh, merely after a week or a month. It will take months to launch the system into operation. 
to operationalize it and therefore we are fully cognizant of it as a artistic community that we yes we know that a lot of time has already passed but we do believe that this draft law is a good solution and um, we have uh, treated this time as a time for certain investment. So we uh, tried the, the public consultations and discussions, discussions on the details, uh, sometimes far-reaching details, um, that these details are discussed uh, uh, prior to the official uh, readings of this draft law in the Parliament. Uh, so that is devoid of any emotions and uh, possible misunderstandings because it turns out that in the artistic um, milieu dif there are different types of artistic professions and um, they have their own specific features and I fully agree that for instance uh, um, uh, dancers have uh, a quite a different set of uh, requirements uh, to the requirements of uh, men of letters, writers, uh, but anyway uh, you um, uh, you are a group that um, are very much united and you act in the spirit of solidarity and this is what helps us to uh, reach consensus. I apologize for a very lengthy speech but all we need to do is to convince the politicians to pass, to pass the law. Many thanks. On the one hand I have this conviction that we need as dancers, as community, we need some freedom uh, uh, to uh, function, but then we also expect some systemic solutions that will give us the luxury of doing our profession uh, of dancers, dancers and choreographers, dance, uh, pro uh, pro dance pro producers, so that um, and, and, and directors, so that um, all of that gives us a possibility uh, to pursue this eth ethos of a dancer because we're creating this space I would I don't want to limit your time but in the context of what was said by director do you have your own experiences which you would like to share with us do you have any solutions uh, that um, um, something that um, is the greatest obstacle for you in your work in your institutions, especially if you're working with institutional dancers? Uh, well, talking about systemic issues, and um, it, it is not possible to establish any, to impose any central solution without passing a law. Even such problems that you face as different interpretations of um, uh, stage works or, or the way uh, the social insurance companies um, uh, treat your preparatory work for staging performances. Uh, the Supreme Court passed uh, some decisions related to the social insurance and uh, the Supreme Court said that uh, in fact some changes are not possible without passing the law. So for instance um, um, they had some doubts with regard to some provisions um, that uh, refer to musicians primarily, but also to, to other performative arts as well. Uh, so there are different tax, um, in tax law interpretations, and then there were claims uh, lodged by different cultural institutions, and uh, there was quite a lot of commotion. Anyway, the, all this need to be told to politicians so that they realize that such systemic solutions are not possible without passing a law. And um, so the draft law is ready, so it's just a matter of months, I hope, uh, that uh, finally the law is passed and enters into force. And um, as far as the dynamics of relations between what is stable and institutional and what is individual and creative, I think that they, uh, they presented it well, but um, in fact this is the mechanism that should be quite important for you as dancers um, because um, you will receive um, the professional artist charter and uh, it works just like a large, large, uh, large uh, family uh, uh, card and uh, it introduces a, a card that is um, a, a, a large family charter and also teacher's charter. So we are modifying the working conditions for dancers and uh, already on the central level you will have a possibility of uh, 
uh, we will be negotiating different professional offers to you as dancers. For instance, we may agree with insurance companies or we can um, ag uh, negotiate with healthcare providers uh, so that da uh, dancers have some tailor-made solutions uh, by healthcare system or by the insurance sector. Uh, for instance, you would have a different insurance coverage for um, health insurance or uh, for um, accident insurance and you would have uh, such solutions that would be much more advantageous uh, to you and um, it is going to be uh, a much more attractive insurance uh, uh, proposal for you or a healthcare proposal for you than in the case of general offer on the market. Anyway, as you can see, um, an institution, a big institution, is capable of negotiating um, such better conditions of insurance and healthcare providers and also uh, being a public funding uh, provider, we have a stronger negotiating position and uh, of course we do not need to write in the law that such and such healthcare package should be provided for this or that professional group, but on the level of the law we say that there is a mechanism that should give a possibility of uh, offering pragmatic and practical solutions to you. Can we read the draft law? Because I haven't ever seen it, to be honest. Well, thank you for this question. The answer is a bit complicated. The draft law that has been published and can be viewed online is no longer up to date. And um, there is a new draft that has been um, developed by the Ministry of Culture, but it's not, made, it's not been made public yet. Within a week, it will be entered into the legislative register, and once it is done, it will be made public. So what I can declare is the member of the team, a member of the uh, team for the planning potentiary of the minister who works um, on this draft law. So whenever, as soon as it is available, I will forward it to you, even before the official public consultations begin. May we ask the director, to forward this draft law through Madam Director to us. So, as if you could forward this draft law to us, so that we as the professional community may have a look at it and that we may have influence on some of the systemic solutions that have been discussed, were being discussed for the last 10 years. So, we would be very much obliged as a community, if you could kindly give us a possibility to read the draft law before it is moved into the next phase of legislative work. Sure, of course, this is exactly what I have just said. I will make it available for you. Um, just would like to reiterate that um, we have been working with a team of experts. The team of experts was nominated by the minister but um, we have uh, cooperated uh, with uh, many professionals of artistic communities. You are also represented in this expert team. So, uh, different stages and things have been consulted with uh, the uh, dancers uh, community. And in fact, you would be one of the first uh, to see the draft law once ready. It will take us we just need to agree on some financials because the law must be an integrated document just to show you how it works with in the legislation so one of the points is introducing amendments to a number of other laws for instance we would need to amend the law on copyright there is article 20 and this um, article 20 um, stipulates this uh, fee and uh, the fee is uh, and um, there is a list of uh, devices um, that are used for collecting this uh, fee and we're talking about um, the uh, future insurance um, uh, or for, uh, for, for dancers so we need to have a stable we need to, to have um, um, uh, this discussion and we were talking about uh, the 
pr protective measures uh, under the conditions of the pandemic, and I spoke to the Minister Glinsky. I had a look at the draft law. I saw it, and uh, some uh, provisions in the draft law are rather debatable. And, uh, for instance, um, Uh, uh, for, and for instance, it is important uh, to differentiate different uh, uh, professional artistic groups. Uh, for instance, uh, writers are quite different from dancers because dancers are performers. And uh, so they are subject uh, to related rights, uh, but uh, a writer is a creator and thus a subject to copyright. And um, those are very different specifics. They cannot be mixed together. And many people, uh, also people present in this uh, room, um, they uh, they work uh, in creative professions, and um, this means that we will have more and more such people. We, as the trade union, we represent those whose uh, profession um, uh, um, is uh, clearly defined, and uh, the Polish Chamber of Artists does not have a possibility of. Uh, re-verifying those who had graduated uh, from universities um, and art schools and ballet schools, and so they are already diploma holders. I do realize that amongst them we have many Uh, 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 that uh, people that are not covered by medical insurance, and they need medical insurance, and indeed once we talk it about in the broader uh, circle of people, um, um, uh, there is a talk that there will be an inter-ministerial committee where there will be representatives of the Ministry of Culture, Ministry of Labour and Social Insurance Company to talk about insurance. But as I looked at this draft law, this draft law is rather debatable. So when we were talking about protective measures under the pandemic, then our main board, we were um, empowered by the trade union to uh, represent the opinion of two trade unions. The two trade unions um, have 2,000 members in 37 institutions in Poland, and we will be happy to comment on the draft law, because we do represent uh, a large group, professional group, in many different uh, fields of specialization. Uh, we have um, orchestra musicians, um, uh, vocalists, uh, singers, dancers. So this law is not to be accepted as it is now. And if it is passed in this shape, we would protest against it. So we need to see the current draft law. And then we will be capable of uh, commenting on it. I took the floor from uh, our um, lady speakers here, but I'd like to give them the floor right now. Now, could you speak to us from the perspective of women, mothers, fem female dancers, so those who have this um, dance uh, profession. So, what is the true obstacle for those who are not protected by a such institution uh, as, for example, the Polish uh, Dance Theatre, where there are very many uh, programs supporting uh, artists that help artists develop. Some what would you what what would be the most uh, important from your point of view what would be uh, the main four postulates that you think could be fulfilled within uh, the next let's say 2 years so what's the most pressing issue well i'd like to talk about money why is there such a huge disproportion between theatre or drama and dance and directors and choreographers and choreographers and dancers. I know cases where uh, a choreographer uh, earns 
five times as much as a dancer. Why do we need to, in a way, destroy our bodies? Uh, why do we need to take so many jobs to be able to make the ends meet? Um, until recently, um, uh, there were different castings uh, and even well now there are castings for example there was a casting for uh, an audition for a uh, Halka uh, performance and during the pandemic since there was no job uh, everybody would go to such an audition okay I'm not sure whether it's good that we differentiate between uh, a dancer and a choreographer because very often dancers are choreographers and uh, now if we take a look at uh, these uh, different uh, earnings um, the differences are uh, are huge and um, and nowhere other in the world is the situation like this. And I do agree that uh, the rates should be much, much higher. Maybe if we could uh, evaluate this choreography service um, differently then well maybe there's going to be the risk that there will be fewer jobs because after all uh, budget uh, budgets aren't that flexible and if they are limited then you know there won't be money mainly for dancers than for choreographers. So what should we do so that the budgets are greater, so that we can have uh, a dignified life uh, doing our professions? Because I believe the profession of a dancer um, is um, it's a lifelong decision if you uh, decide to be uh, a dancer. So, uh, you know, this is not the end of my possibilities. I uh, fight fiercely to pay my uh, health insurance. Uh, you know, I don't have 500 slotties to... Um, Mm, be insured privately. Now, when it comes to financing, we still sign a contract where we uh, cannot uh, tell others how much we earn. Uh, there are uh, fines for that. Together with other choreographers, we say that, okay, for consultation, we take this amount of money uh, for one week of um, work this amount of money. Now, um, I talked to Dominik Wiencek um, uh, yesterday um, and it turned out that I earn three times as much uh, in this theatre as a dancer than as a uh, choreographer. Yes, open castings should be a public thing, definitely. But yesterday we talked about the role of a manager and a producer. And there are very few such uh, roles uh, available. And I believe that this uh, show production and, and winning funds, this should be also done by artists. It's a kind of job that needs to be uh, performed and this is what we discussed yesterday. We discussed how should we build this role of a project 
manager and producer um, so that choreographers don't need to do that. Yes, when you sign a contract you also need to have um, advice of a lawyer because I'm not competent enough to negotiate uh, my job conditions. So the Institute of Music and Dance during the pandemic and that was um, on the request of the community uh, made free of charge consultation with lawyers available. Well, it wasn't easy for us because obviously we had to pay uh, the lawyers, but we uh, included this in um, in the budget and you know we provided this schedule this online schedule where you could actually apply uh, for such a free of charge consultation with a lawyer and I must say that I felt pretty sad when I realized that there was almost no one who used that consultation who used who would use that help. So when I hear uh, that there's this community demand to provide free of charge uh, consultations with lawyers and also consultations with psychologists and then we provide such an opportunity uh, and then no one actually uh, applies for it, um, then This is not the way it should be. So on the one hand, you present these postulates and once we provide you with something, then uh, you don't use it. Well, I believe that this conference will uh, change the situation. Now, let me add, well, if you inform us about such initiatives, I instantly uh, forward this information uh, at least to the members of the trade uh, union. So this is a way of informing our dancers about various uh, solutions. Um, well, what they do with it, it's uh, their uh, choice, but we at least uh, forward this uh, information. I'll be glad to um, use this consultation of a lawyer and of a psychologist and I'll definitely uh, post this information on, uh, on this platform, uh, choreography, uh, in the web that I opened only recently. Well, I'd love to comment on retraining because uh, this topic uh, is connected with uh, the topics that we have just discussed. Now, there are not easy uh, ways to uh, retrain. There's the retraining program for professional dancers run by the Institute of Music and Dance and it's wonderful. It's our answer to one of the postulates of the first dance uh, congress. It was launched right after this congress. Yes, it was launched uh, and I'm a beneficiary of this program. Uh, thanks to it, uh, I, uh, I am now employed in the field of um, art therapy, therapy, dance therapy. But uh, I need more funding here. So now when it comes to the uh, legal changes and the postulates concerning the legal uh, changes, well, I haven't seen this uh, draft law, but maybe we should um, think about uh, the dancers who wish to retrain and provide them with different paths. Now, there are different paths. You can either uh, stay in the field of dancing, you can teach dancing, be a choreographer, 
or stay with your institution, be it the uh, Teatr Wielki Polish National Opera. Such institutions support dancers uh, to stay in the institution uh, where they spend so many hours on the stage. The question is whether everybody wants it. Uh, another option is a complete change of the profession. And you need support here, you also need psychological consultation here, and you need to be prepared for this since the earliest years of education. You need to <clears throat> make people aware that this is not um, life drama, because this is how it is perceived uh, by young people. Uh, they think, okay, if I need to <clears throat> give up performing on the stage, it means I'm a failure uh, and it's a drama. But this should be treated as the door opening, as an opportunity. Okay, let me answer, uh, let me reply to the um, two issues mentioned by um, <clears throat> Madam Director and our host. Now, when it comes to this draft law, now, this uh, professional artist is defined as someone who either has the right education or um, is, uh, has some artistic achievements. But the second condition is that this uh, person, uh, a professional artist, is active uh, in, their, um, in their profession. So, once you become part of the system, when you register yourself, you can either show uh, your achievements, your output, and obviously artists are very sensitive, uh, especially older ones, uh, to assessment and evaluation. We don't assess whether a given play, let's say, is good or bad. No, uh, we just assess whether it's there or not. And it is, this evaluation is done by uh, associations uh, where the, um, by professional and, and industry associations. And they assess whether it is true uh, professional activity. The second uh, requirement uh, is the uh, education. So, for example, a diploma of the General Education Ballet School uh, suffices. So, a person who enters this system, uh, for example, a freshman, uh, you know, they get this a loan for three years and they can be active or not uh, for these first three years. And now there are two paths here as well. So for different professions there are levels of minimum uh, income on uh, artistic activity. So for example to be uh, mm, perceived as a professional uh, musician, uh, then this earning has uh, these earnings have to be uh, at a certain level, because if you cannot um, live of it, then you cannot be regarded as a professional musician. The situation is different when it comes to fine arts, because there's a general belief that you cannot. Um, make a living uh, of uh, becoming, uh, of being uh, involved in uh, fine arts. Now, uh, if your income uh, is half of minimum wage, uh, for this profession, then instantly you are uh, treated as an artist. 
But if you're a freelance artist, maybe your incomes are lower. So um, this is a problem. You also have to prove that you were active as an artist for three years. So basically you just uh, send this list of performances uh, and then you do it again after three years. Obviously, you can suspend this activity uh, just as you do when you have um, when you run a business. And there's there's uh, and uh, for example, uh, you can uh, take a break when you decide to start a family and so on. And finally, there's this moment when you don't need to prove that you're active as an artist anymore and you receive your retirement rights. And dancers are treated here uh, in, a, uh, in a special way. So, for example, for ballet dancers, after 15 years of being professionally active, you don't need to prove anymore that you are professionally active. And you get your uh, entitle entitlements till the end of your life. What kind of entitlements uh, these are, I'll tell you in a moment. Let me just refer to what Mr. Begainski said. We need to trust lawyers. Uh, and very many lawyers have discussed this bill with us. And when we think about the law, there are certain things that are not that intuitive uh, for us. So, uh, first of all, uh, creating law is in our hands and uh, the uh, solutions that we suggest are quite novel in our legal uh, system. I understand this as a layman, but uh, the lawyers tell me that I am right. Now, from the point of view of this uh, act, there is no difference whether artistic activity is an activity from the point of view of uh, act on uh, copyright and similar rights. So we say that irrespective of whether these are uh, copyrights uh, or uh, similar rights, if you perform an artistic activity, then you are entitled to your rights. I'd like to come back to quite a positive uh, story that um, something quite positive that um, happened uh, in the past when it comes to retraining uh, and the project that's been quite intensive and that in a way guarantees um, dancers this ability to enter this new professional reality. And we talked several years ago to Mr. Pastor about the advantages and disadvantages of the system where you either retire or uh, retrain. And we talked about this unusual artistic potential or immense um, artistic potential that uh, artists would lose if they didn't retrain but uh, became um, pensioners at the age of 40. Now, we were to have uh, the dancer until recently the soloist of uh, the National Theatre, Mr. Solecki. Uh, he was to be um, part of this panel. Unfortunately, he couldn't join us. And well, he got retrained and today he works as an IT specialist uh, at the uh, National um, Opera. So do you think there's some light at the end of the tunnel? Nie tylko emerytury są sposobem na funkcjonowanie. Może właśnie z możliwość. And perhaps um, there is a possibility of finding some other professional development path, which will enrich us as a community, because there are so many different uh, ways that we can contribute to the to society. Paulina, thank you very much for nice words, and I think that this trust 
is also a key word. Here I just would like to show you I became a director at the Wilki Theatre in March 2009 and then they had that program called Establishing the Institution to Transform the Professional Situation of Dancers so as to establish um, privileges and retirement system for dancers. That was in 2009. Arkadiusz Rybicki was uh, dealing with that. He was a member of the cult Commission of for Culture, and that was it. And then, and then the Institute of Music and Dance was established in 2010, which also helped to develop this program, which is um, quite important. So, just like uh, uh, Mrs. Paulina has said, this should give us a possibility of uh, of um, running a professional transformation properly and then in 2012 another program appeared that is the internal program for the Wilki uh, uh, theater a national opera that was quite advantageous but it was not accepted by one of the social partners for reasons unknown and retraining uh, pro uh, problems Vitold spoke about that they have a three-tier system of financing of artists. It's not that it's both retirement and um, retraining. It's either retraining or retirement. So they do, do not actually have so retirement. Sometimes they, like in Paris Opera, they now have a possibility of uh, retiring at a certain age. Some German theatres but fewer and fewer. But this is one of the most acute problems uh, of um, our theatres. Because, in fact, there are many problems. And um, how about the remuneration structure of dancers? And in my theatre, it, um, it is um, done in a good way for dancers. It's quite beneficial for dancers. And um, as far as the provisions are concerned, um, the, some provisions are not advantageous uh, to the artistic community, but the structure of remuneration uh, is uh, quite good these days. And that was done due to very active role of trade unions, I should admit. But um, we were working with Vitolt uh, even before. Um, uh, earlier, uh, like three years ago, so we had that uh, um, program. Another problem is retirement and retraining. So what to choose? And again, I think that as far as using the human potential, human resources, because retraining is uh, more advantageous for, for all, if, for beneficiaries as well. But I think that this first project, when I spoke about it in, in the Wielki Theater and initially the dancers were uh, quite reluctant to agree with it but 11 years ago I was not supported this project was not backed by dancers they spoke about retirement only but now it has changed it is changing and it's not only about retirement and retirement for me as an employer uh, retirement would solve many problems for me as an employer, but for people, for, for the human potential, retirement is not a solution. We would rather give a tool and highly creative artists um, that are capable of coping with different situations, they should have a possibility of full retraining. And they need uh, some long-term financing, not only a grant, so that they could uh, leave the profession um, gracefully and uh, move to, to or move to other options then another problem is uh, the wages structure but I spoke about that already and then access to the stage professionally I am convinced that the requalification system is the beginning of a process that has been functioning for 10 years our expectations in 2010 were the start for the today's talks and once the law is passed 
then we will be given um, a huge opportunity, a, an opportunity, because this law may solve our um, uh, solve our solutions. The next Congress will be in not ten years, I hope, but in three in three years. Okay. So um, once we meet again as dancers, we would be cognizant of the fact that we have some tools and we have the law, and that law shall protect us, and that this law would be to, would be to the benefit of the entire community, artistic community. And now it's time to give the floor to our audience, because undoubtedly you will have questions. Any questions in the room? Oh, there we go. Here we see the first person willing to speak. It's in the third or in the fourth row. It's me, Dobroslava. Ah, hello, Dobroslava. I just couldn't see you against the light. Yes, I know. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Dobroslava uh, Dorenska Huda, and since the very beginning, I have had the pleasure on the program of uh, professional requalification of dancers. And I may say that Paulina was the first or one of the first persons with whom I worked. And all the more I'm happy that after a requalification you gained so much, achieved so much success. Now, I would like to add some things and um, something uh, to talk more about requalification. I uh, will speak uh, chronologically. Um, but uh, I would also make a reference to what uh, Director Juris spoke about. Indeed, during the pandemic, we opened a, an opportunity, possibility of consulting with lawyers, psychologists and um, uh, career advisors. And uh, we organized webinars, online workshops, and um, we were showing what to do in uh, this difficult situation once we cannot work the way we would like to work. So we were showing different ways of um, financing activities. So, And um, it, it is not to say that um, once uh, people switch from dancer's profession to other profession, they would never uh, go back to being a dancer. So this um, labor market is quite big, like a dragon, which is um, beyond the theater. But the problem is how to approach it and how to look for more job opportunities. And just as uh, Madam Director has said, I should regret that there are quite many people interested in webinars and we are proud that we came up with an idea of holding webinars. But uh, consultations were not that popular. But we already have one interested person, and after this advertising, um, and you, you would have uh, more interested. And um, uh, and uh, we at the Institute of Music and Dance will listen to you, and then we are looking for immediate solutions. So you would be more than welcome to cooperate with us. And also, it is important that we have some transition that is gradual transition and not one-off transition because this transition um, entering a, a new profession is always difficult not only to dancers to anyone all the more that the research shows that given the variability of the labor market and everything changes Our uh, profession, whoever we are, dancers, choreographers, uh, trainers, coaches, or uh, culture managers, we would opt um, some uh, some other uh, career opportunity. And um, as research shows, dancers uh, choose their professional development as many as six times in their lifetime. So, um, and requalification might take four years. So there is this time to really prepare well uh, f uh, to the transition and to uh, get accustomed with this time of change, which is difficult. And this is uh, why we have uh, career advisors <clears throat> and we're helping dancers with this smooth transition. Another important thing that stops people from taking a decision is this fear. Okay, how am I going to combine um, my professional activities with gaining new qualifications because sometimes they have a to attend a university or a course and um, 
when I'm saying just a course, so if it's a driver's course, so then it's quite a difficult course. And now my it and now my plea. It's not a petition. Um, I would rather recommend something. Let's say it's it's a prompt. If the theater managers and uh, cultural institutions managers where dancers work, if um, those managers are more um, uh, favorable uh, to uh, uh, such uh, solutions, uh, so that if you could approach dancers uh, with uh, open minds, because dancers actually need time to requalify, dancers need time to go through a course. So if you could help them, that would be quite nice. And another problem is the following. People say, okay, what if I need to study all the time and I will have no time to earn the money? Well, this program offers co-financing. Um, so substances costs um, are, um, are paid out in the time of retraining. Uh, under the condition that, uh, for instance, this is uh, indeed a day course, and, and then it means that the dancer will have no other possibility of earning money. Then we can co-finance subsistence costs. And I've been taking notes during this heated discussion, so if I may just have a look at my notes, please. Yes, one more thing. We say that this uh, program is not ideal. Yes, I know it. And we are trying to improve it. And Madame Director has already mentioned that as well. Do you know the uh, requalification amount? Do you know how much money is earmarked for requalification? It's 40,000. Is it 40,000? 40, 40,000, not 4,000 like in the army. It's not like 6,000 like in the police, because this is, this is how much they pay there, because they're, they're retrained faster. It's 40,000. So this is the amount of money that is much bigger than the money that is offered by Western organizations uh, which we cooperate with and we use their experience and with uh, some institutions we've been working for 50 years now, like with the British. But in this case, dancers don't have to pay to the fund. And just as Vitor has said, this fund it receives money from different sources. In our case, freelancers have problems with their financial liquidity. And indeed, therefore, it would suffice to have a certain track record. Um, and if someone uh, is injured, then uh, we may review applications um, on an individual basis. You may apply for 40,000. Uh, slotters, and that would be enough uh, to uh, do the full-blown uh, BA course, uh, uh, baccalaureate course, and part of the master degree course. So thank you very much for this important note. And there is another person willing to speak there up to the left, and then I see more people willing to speak. Hello. Agata Zhergotska, the New Wave Foundation and um, local move makers. And uh, I would like to make a reference uh, to uh, the comment made by Alexandra Osovic. And uh, we have received uh, many documents and we have um, uh, done the results of the research on the numbers, that is, how many dancers uh, we have in our community and and also did my own counting and did some percentage counting so 18 percent those are ballet dancers 12 percent are contemporary dance eight percent are dance theater dancers eight percent choreographers five percent are folk dancers 46 percent are commercial dancers and the rest are others so if we add to it the contemporary dance and the uh, dance theater dancer and choreographers and if we add folk dancers then we have 33 percent of dancers vis-a-vis um, 18 -vis percent of ballet dancers and 33 percent of dancers do not have their own uh, dance center in poland they do not have a headquarters like uh, the national opera and ballet. So we are homeless 
And my postulate is the following. For four years I was running the dance center in Warsaw and as a community. And for more than uh, 20 years I've been working here in Warsaw. But now I speak on behalf of all dancers and choreographers who work all over Poland. We do not have an institution that would support this other side of dance. I'm not uh, talking about modern dance on, uh, I'm also talking about uh, um, folk dance. There are choreographers that created many different styles. So my postulate is that we need to um, have them in mind as well. I know it takes time and there are talks and we were saying that it's not going to take one year. Okay, we understand that it's going to take more than one year. Uh, that's uh, clear, but this Congress of Dance should help us as um, the National Dance Center to, uh, to open a National Dance Center. It's a grassroots initiative. And, um, well, um, the authorities should understand that Warsaw needs such a center. Why Warsaw? Well, we are one of the few remaining capitals in the world and in Europe that still does not have its own dance center that would be so much helpful to Warsawian dance community. Well, actually, this is exactly what we spoke about yesterday. Vodimir Kaszowski and Janusz Marek spoke about it yesterday. I just... So please remember that um, from the point of view of um, dancers, we need such places. And as Alexandra Osovic said, this is, this is how we could start working in a different way. Yes, I actually liked Kaczkowski's idea to have this round table between, between different institutions and the local authorities and artistic community representatives. And if we have open casting to theatres, it means that any dancer may come and take part in a casting. Uh, independent dancers as well. So this is another comment of mine. And the third, there are there is this program called Spaces of Art. And uh, as uh, if I got that you're right with your calculations, it's 33%, yes? Then this is exactly the program that will help them, because otherwise we have institutional dancers and they have full-time employment uh, contracts and they have uh, full insurance, institutional support, uh, etc. So they have um, uh, all facilities and everything. But here this program, uh, Art Spaces, should help us. Well, we need the National Dance Center, we all know it. We just need to meet at this round table. Let me tackle on another issue that wasn't included in the um, study, in the research. Now, in Warsaw we have five dance festivals and they are all organized by NGOs. So the Zawirowania Festival, Budapolis Festival, Warsaw Flow Festival and the Crossroads Festival and one more. And there are over 24 organizations uh, in uh, Warsaw as the mm, dance uh, art center, we associate all of them, and these were not included in any of the studies. So I'd like to say it out loud that a lot of money that contemporary dance artists uh, get, they get it from NGOs. Now, uh, this study isn't comprehensive. Of course, uh, we've collected data from the recent years and they definitely uh, need to be um, updated. Uh, well, uh, the study was carried out in 2018, so I'm sure that uh, there are many things that are lacking there. For example, this information about NGOs uh, that you have mentioned. Could I ask another question now, please? 
Good afternoon, my name is Łukasz Wojcicki. I'm an independent dancer and performer. You have uh, tackled on very many threads and it's impossible for me to refer to all of them, but I'd like to tackle the ones that I find particularly important. I'd like to thank Ola for what she uh, told us about uh, body. Because, yes, we very often lack standards uh, uh, at festivals, during productions uh, that employ uh, dancers and also dance artists. Uh, and I'm using this uh, term on purpose because very often these standards need to apply not only to dancers but to dance artists. And these are such things as uh, toilets, such basic things. Now, uh, I'd like to refer also to the uh, dancing stage and the people with uh, different um, disabilities. After all, these are people who create, who perform, who dance, and they do need uh, to be included in this professional uh, dance dancing scene, but very often we forget about them. Now the uh, professional retraining program is excellent and I support it greatly, but it concerns mainly uh, ballet dancers. No, you're not right. Uh, I need to stop you uh, because nothing like this uh, has been uh, put down in writing. Okay, let me rephrase it then. There are people who dance or who perform on the stage and once they uh, become 40, they wish to continue dancing. They don't want to retrain. But the system, in a way, pushes them away uh, from the stage. It is also related to, um, to under what conditions people are um, accepted for uh, productions. And yes, there are castings to which 200 people come, which means it doesn't guarantee you any financial stability. Do you know how many people come to auditions in Berlin? Yes, but we are in Warsaw. No, what I'm saying is that there's huge competition. Yes, but I believe there's a difference between Warsaw and Berlin. As I've said, I'm not criticizing the system because this professional retraining system is absolutely excellent. But what we are lacking are the tools for those who are at this age when they should go on a dance retirement, but they don't want to do so. What would you propose then? I am just criticizing the fact that there's this culture of promoting very young artists and, and those who have ballet school diplomas. Uh, and you forget about older ones. On the other hand, the youngest ones, they also, uh, there are some limitations um, because they have no experience. And also, only certain names, um, th there's room only for those who have already made their mark. And I'd like to see room for those who are older and would like to continue dancing, and also for those who are young but still inexperienced. Uh, okay, but who sets the, the age limit? Because I, I don't... Uh... Okay, there's no, like, uh, legally uh, legalized um, age limit. Okay, so who's pushing people away from the stage? I think uh, what the gentleman is trying to tell us that there's this uh, youth cult uh, that we observe, but it's a very general trend. And now director uh, Pasta will look for young 
dancers uh, to work for him and you know he will have a casting and uh, also non-associated uh, dancers will be able to come and age won't be the decisive factor but still uh, young people will be uh, chosen uh, as the first. We also talked about uh, body and uh, you know um, with age uh, you use body flexibility for example. Obviously medicine uh, develops uh, and uh, we have access to physiotherapists and so on but um, we still should remember that a 40-year-old dancer isn't as fit as a 20-year-old dancer. Now, I also believe that this retraining program is excellent, uh, though it isn't perfect. There's one link that is lacking there. I mean uh, a system that would pair dancers and potential employers. So dancers, you know, they take the money, they get retrained, they enroll to uh, different university courses and so on. And that's great. But there should be um, a platform that would um, facilitate um, this connection between uh, dancers and uh, employers. And now this uh, age, um, when you need to um, retrain, will be even lower. Uh, so now this age limit is 40, but I believe that after 10 years of being professionally active, future dancers will already start uh, retraining because they will know that they simply need to do it. Another problem is that uh, there are too few candidates to ballet schools. Uh, and um, also um, we need to employ uh, dancers from abroad because there are too few professional dancers. So uh, this should be our concern that people will leave this profession too soon. And, uh, okay, let me refer to uh, the previous uh, speaker. I was 33 years old and I was the oldest performer in an ensemble with which I performed. And uh, we uh, did 200 performances a year. And when I was 30, I was already a pensioner. Uh, I retired because I realized I couldn't uh, dance this role or that role. So at the same time, uh, my director and myself came to the same uh, conclusion. My body was so tired that uh, I couldn't continue. Do you know how many candidates there are to this ensemble um, when there's a, a casting, an audition? 1200 people. That was the number during an audition, uh, an audition before the pandemic. There are seven or eight thousand applications worldwide and uh, within seven or eight uh, month period, uh, this is shortlisted to 1200 people who come for the audition. You know, the market has gone crazy, really. And I'm glad that I was a dancer many, many years ago, because now the demands are even greater. Of course, the dancers are even better but unfortunately there are fewer and fewer places where they can perform. Now the market is really cruel here. 
Let me give the floor to uh, to the audience, if you allow me. Okay, yes, before we do it, let me just tell you one thing. Okay, this retraining program, it excludes this uh, continuation of the profession. I know the cases of people who come back to the stage once they've changed their name so that they don't need to return the subsidy but at the same time continue dancing. Will we get an answer to this question? Well, we got a similar question via a chat. Let me read it out to you. Why do you need to give up your profession to be part of the retraining program? Now, if you continue dancing, if you can dance, if you want to dance, and if you have a job, is the retraining program for such a person? Unfortunately, the speaker isn't speaking to the microphone and uh, the interpreters cannot hear them. Okay, let me tell you the following. When you sign the documents, you read that dancing cannot be the main source of income. I'm greatly concerned with what you said, that actually dancers cheat and perform under a pseudonym. Now, if you perform once for New Year's Eve and uh, second time at uh, a festival of um, an army festival, uh, then obviously you won't be chased uh, and um, you won't be persecuted for that. Yes, especially that it is like this. Uh, you stop becoming a dancer, then, you know, for the next four years uh, you retrain, you um, get another qualification, you get a degree and so on. And then you can continue dancing, but your main source of income shouldn't be dancing. Now, why is there uh, such a regulation? We don't want to avoid uh, the situation that there is with young people who do their A-levels, then they go and study, and then after another uh, three or four years, you know, they um, realize that their body is too tired to continue dancing, but their knowledge uh, isn't up to date anymore because 10 years have passed. So that's why we encourage people to enter a new profession right after becoming retrained. And when it comes to this link with the labor market, well, these are uh, professional um, uh, consultants, job consultants. So we prepare dancers to find their place on the uh, employment market, on the labor market. No one at the labor office will tell you what to do. Now, those who are interested in the retraining program will um, have a chance to uh, ask additional questions. In the foyer, uh, Ms. Um, Dobrosława will be available there. And now let's move on to further questions. Sonia, yes, I know uh, you want to ask a question, so you'll be given the floor soon. My name is uh, Woźniak, I'm a dancer, but I also support people in their personal development. And 
Well, I must say this is my first time that I participate in such a congress, but I have this uh, impression that uh, we're all discussing things here post factum and post reactively. Now, I also uh, graduated from uh, postgraduate studies without the help of, of such um, institutions as, uh, as the Institute of Music and Dance. Um, I acted out of my own um, will. But I already see when I work with young people who are 14 or 16 and they dance, I know that, the, you know, this is the time when they should start their professional career because they already know at this age that they are predisposed to uh, do ballet or maybe um, contemporary dance or Latin uh, dancing. However, they don't know how to think about it as uh, a source, their future source of income. And I believe that this is the age when I should uh, support them in choosing their future uh, career and then they can talk to Dobroslava, for example, to plan their studies, be it um, uh, arts or maybe medical studies or uh, other studies. So I believe that you should start earlier, uh, already at the ballet school. Okay, Miroslav, uh, let me reply quickly. This program envisages meetings at ballet schools. Um, am I right, uh, Dobroslava? We also had meetings with directors of ballet schools. Yes, but ballet schools, uh, this is a very small percentage uh, of uh, the dancers that uh, we are concerned um, with. You know, very many people never um, graduate from uh, ballet schools. Uh, they but they become uh, professional dancers um, at different theatres still. And I see that there's huge uh, potential uh, and there's huge need of such uh, workshops. And I could gladly go to a ballet school and, and run such a workshop there, uh, though I'm not a graduate of um, uh, such a school. So I could... Uh, show them a different perspective here. So, yes, we should talk about these perspectives for dancing if we talk to younger uh, people when they are still at um, secondary school. Yes, during uh, the previous panel we talked about uh, this and we said that we need education that would uh, an education system that would promote dancing to uh, general education schools. And together with Mr. Vartak, uh, we decided that we would try and do it with the support of the Ministry of Education. Um, good afternoon, uh, Holovitska Emilia. This is not my research, but this is my study. But the research is um, the research commissioned by the Frederick Chopin National Institute, and uh, this later helped uh, to change legislation in Poland. Uh, uh, the Rata Ilchuk um, uh, carried out that research uh, together with the team, and that was the research on the numbers. So we were not studying institutions, and in my PhD work, I'm, by the way, I'm a dancer myself. I have five different professions, and apart from that, I do science, which is very difficult. <clears throat> but um, uh, but this is a more um, popular form of work, precarious work, I should say, which is a challenge as well. But I'm glad that uh, this research, you find this research to be interesting because I still have this problem. We still do not have data. We still do not have research in this. The responsive rate um, varies. We enjoyed uh, a very high responsive rate as we were doing the research um, on some areas, but as far as dancers are concerned, their response rate was quite low. We sent out 5,000 questionnaires, 
but in the case of dancers, ballet dancers, only 40 people sent their requests and we think there are many more of them. So there is this appeal uh, to support that I think is uh, quite important to do more research. Thank you. Yes, uh, let's agree that this is the last uh, question from the audience because it's already 2 p.m. and we should move on uh, to the questions posted by our internet uh, in online participants. I represent the Materia Foundation and uh, today I would like to talk about the Dance Forum and I will be brief because Magic also wishes to speak. During the pandemic, I know that uh, um, we were supposed to speak about it also at another panel. So on the 13th of March till the 14th of June we were running a questionnaire and we asked dance artists how the pandemic has changed their situation and income. The results are available at forumtainsa.org. But let us see, and let us talk about three things that are a matter of concern for us. First, this questionnaire was developed by Tomasz Cieszelski. Almost 50% of uh, artists do not have uh, any social uh, security scheme apart uh, from uh, having um, sporadic uh, uh, defined task contra uh, con uh, contracts and they could not use the money uh, from the uh, Polish government. Uh, the state aid money because they did not have ongoing contracts at the time of pandemic. Therefore, my request is some institutions, uh, they have their own uh, lawyers and, uh, and um, HR departments, but could you please sign your contracts immediately upon engaging an artist? Because should there be a lockdown, uh, if the contracts are not signed, the uh, artists are not eligible to receive aid money. So could you please do it? Uh, uh, in a timely fashion. Also, uh, producers, uh, producers and uh, institutions uh, should also shoulder the burden of negotiations and uh, negotiating uh, for hu human uh, conditions for dancers and this uh, dance forum we're going to work, in to work on the rates so as to keep um, certain standards up. And the third point, um, uh, we also have people working without any contracts. And it, uh, I know it's incredible, but it does still happen. So I do um, appeal to the institutions to sign their contracts as soon as you engage an artist and to also let us uh, talk in greater detail about rates and fees. Thank you. So I understand one more person to speak, although I promised that the previous speaker would be the last one, but Maci, it would be the last one. Maciej Kuzminski, I am an independent choreographer and I'm linked with the Polish Dance Network that is organized by the Institute of Music and Dance and the Association of Forum of Dance. So let me pose a thesis first, formulate a thesis. Uh, perhaps it's going to be um, a bit, uh, it would provoke to some thinking apart from the institutions that employ dancers. We do not, apart from that, have the profession of dancers. We have a multi profession instead. So uh, people combine uh, different uh, professions the profession of a dancer, choreographer, producer, pedagogue, or sometimes four or just few of them. And maybe this is not bad. Maybe. This is the structure of our world and such is the structure of our reality that in the independent um, environment a dancer should deal with all those matters. So I think the basic question, this is the basic question and the basic question is which way do we go and uh, depending on the path we choose we may opt for some solutions, some solutions may be earmarked for independent dancers so that independent dancers have a possibility of getting involved in their professional activity and uh, being, pro being dancers. So um, um, more additions, higher salaries, better access to 
um, uh, stages uh, so that they may have an opportun opportunity of uh, dancing more frequently or we might think on how to prepare dancers because apart uh, from the institutional help they should cope with all other factors. So I think that one should ask this question. But still, there are some uh, things that unite, unite institutional dancers, those who have, uh, those who, uh, have uh, full-time employment and freelancers. And what is common for them is access to health care and access to professionals who are trained uh, to provide health care services to dancers. Those cannot be people who have been uh, they are not sports um, therapists or uh, medical personnel because we need a different type of knowledge in the West. For a long time they have, um, for instance, majors for PTs that deal with, who work with dancers. So it's the first postulate, postulate just to think about training uh, specialized um, uh, medical uh, healthcare personnel. Another postulate is um, the conditions at the stages should correspond to the basic security requirements. It many times happens that the room where we do take rehearsals, stage rehearsals, even also young, young teenagers, adolescents, those rooms are not fit for purpose. The floor is too hard and uh, many times it leads uh, to long-term injuries and uh, gifted people cannot continue their dance passion, but also on the stage. Many times there is a new building and uh, those buildings are designed in such a way that um, it is not possible uh, staging performances, dance performances there. So this is a postulate to, to an association of architects for them to know what to plan, how to design. Another point is access to professional workshops um, at prices um, affordable uh, to professional dancers. Yes, in the West, many people cannot do their dancers uh, profession non-stop. Many times they have to have some additional source of income. However, they have access to professional morning um, lessons and this is how they stay fit and uh, for dancing but unfortunately in Poland we do not have and if we have workshops those workshops are done uh, done commercially so those are three my postulates that I have and when I speak to dancers then I see that these three postulates um, are mentioned as the first ones of course rates are very important and in the Polish dance network we're working on having minimum rates much I'm going to be brutal we promised 30 minutes uh, to the internet participants they're also um, online participants so please make a full stop well the full stop will be this I think it's the last point we need to think how to uh, how to end the cycle of violence of fight between institutions and dancers where the economy sets the conditions that the artists have to face. So that's full stop. No, it's not. You were not provocative. You have very well identified the problems that we will have to face as the community in the future. But our strength is in our unity. We have the trade union and association, and there is a forum, and there is an institute. So 30 two days after the Congress will be the time for writing different grassroots proposals which I hope will somehow be taken into consideration, transformed, processed and serve the purpose of future solutions. But yes, I fully agree with you, those are very important solutions. Just talking about standards of um, dance um, classrooms we started working on such a project, although we, uh, as an institute, we are not uh, designing buildings, we're not uh, designing theatres, or we're not modernizing uh, houses of culture and so on and so forth. But um, the idea is that in cooperation with the Institute of uh, Urban Development and Architecture, 
they may have uh, some other name, but it's a national institute anyway. And I was there, I met the director of that institute, and we would like to develop a model of designing a ballet room, how to design uh, dance rooms uh, properly, what the parameters should be, especially as far as the floor is concerned, as far as uh, the amortization system is concerned. So all those parameters are being discussed, and this is in the process. And this was your second uh, postulate uh, of yours, Mache. All right, any more comments on what you have heard uh, from the room? I do not think that all these problems shall be solved overnight. I have been uh, analyzing uh, work uh, being done in other countries, in the Czech Republic, in Slovakia, in Hungary, in other countries uh, similar to us, and they seem to have exactly the same problems, and sometimes they are a bit faster. Maybe the way of thinking is somewhat different. For them, a cultural center is, um, is a facility that has to operate without any central budgetary backing, but they have a different, different level of awareness. So um, how to convince uh, Mr. Y or uh, X, Y or Z to introduce proper flooring system in the uh, dance training hall? so that uh, children stay healthy. So we have to think about it as dancers, as professionals, and we have to express our expectations clearly and openly. No central institutions would be capable of uh, doing so. This is just a matter of us speaking. So we should become more active in different spaces where we work. Just like musicians, just like the theatre, just like representatives of other magnificent forms of arts, they have a greater sense of urgency. And we are somehow standing aside and waiting for things to happen. Uh, yes, and um, Sonia, you spoke about um, uh, contracts and um, mandated uh, contracts and, of course, institutions once they engage an artist, an external artist, they are obliged to sign a document and also verbal agreement is binding as well. And please remember, please, our dear artists, please remember, please do not undertake any performances without having a document signed. Just um, be careful about it. And if you're taking part in rehearsals, once you enter a room, it means that you already agree to some financial terms and conditions. If it is not in writing, it means that theoretically that does not exist. I would not enter a rehearsal room without having a document signed. Yes, I spoke about the situation that took us all by surprise. Exactly, and this is when we opened up legal consultations and the Institute of Music and Dance so that lawyers could advise you on what to do should you be in such a predicament and how to face such an institution that has not signed your papers yet. And we still need to give the floor to participants. I also would like to thank Wukas for introducing this topic of dances with alternative um, mo mobility. And perhaps we should be more inclusive in our profession because we have uh, many fantastic mature dancers who dance so well. And um, so we have young dancers, but also we have many other people who do this prof exercise, this profession, so we should be more open-minded in our approach to this profession. Yes, I agree with you. Um, the Institute, to, in cooperation with British Council, was running a project called the Theatre for People with Disabilities, and there are residency programs, so uh, please use this um, package. Okay, now let's read out the questions, Director. I have a a full-time contract. I pay uh, health care insurance comp contributions, premiums, uh, but uh, I cannot uh, meet a doctor. Um, once um, an appointment is made with a physician, the physician cannot help me because physicians do not have relevant knowledge on the type of injury I have sustained. So, the law on the status of an artist, um, we're looking for the to read the draft of it, 
and uh, we're very happy to see that uh, we're actually talking about the final stage of uh, this legislative process. So how about uh, medical doctors? Why is it that a doctor, uh, sorry, that a dancer who needs to see a doctor needs so much time to see a doctor and then a year later it might find out, he or she might find out that the medical doctor knows nothing about this type of injury or in a year the dancer would say that he or she is no longer a dancer. Well, yes, this is a very serious uh, problem and um, also system-wise um, it's quite a significant uh, program and uh, perhaps uh, we may uh, design some ad hoc um, aid programs pro from the central point of view, from the point of view of legislation. This is uh, why the Professional Artist Charter is needed. So this will be a tool that will help to build individual health care solutions and we spoke about it um, during the uh, for conference on culture and lawyers were trying to solve this problem and they were trying to be as flexible as possible and as universal as possible but not theoretically they should they should have an opportunity of finding real solutions and so such strategy was adopted so we identify a professional group and then we try to build some tools that are earmarked for individual parts of this group. It's not going to happen on its own. Therefore, from the systemic point of view, it's very important since the very beginning that uh, each uh, artistic group, each social group, is duly represented in the central authority, that is, in the Polish Chamber of Artists. It's not an office, it's, it's, it's not going to be just an office, but it's the chamber that will represent the artist's community. Especially it's important to be present in the council of the chamber, because the council will take the initiative. And once the charter is there, and once we can develop a scheme of benefits and allowances, then the council of the chamber um, should, as soon as it is possible, once they start preparing, they need to have some offers on the table and they should uh, start appealing to the National Health Care Fund. Uh, they need, should go to insurance companies like PZU. I'm not, it's not um, um, hidden advertising, but those institutions, they have uh, the money, they collect uh, premiums uh, from us, and this is the only path that will help to have a system in place, maybe in the one year, but in two years from now. Great, uh, which is quite uh, consoling. And now the second question, referring to the requalification. Take, given the fact that creative attitude to a career path and changing the career path is very important for any dancer, mm, then perhaps we need uh, a program of, uh, then perhaps we should have a program for young dancers already at the school level this is what Mirek spoke about and uh, indeed we will think about we will think more about uh, training young dancers and helping them understand how young dancers may develop their career and if I understand the question let's read the question again so given the creative atti the significance of creative creative attitude to the dancing career perhaps we need a program for the development of young dancers at the level of ballet schools and perhaps uh, uh, and Dobra it's over to you if you could uh, answer this uh, question so I understand that a requalification program should already be introduced at a school level. And the third question, why do you need to give up your uh, profession to become part of the retra retraining uh, program? We already said that this program uh, doesn't force you to definitively uh, definitely um, end your activity as a dancer. But let me remind you that 
not only during the uh, pandemics, but also in general, there's a series of program programs um, to which you can apply. So, for example, there's one program to support uh, international um, activity. Yeah, it's like over to you. Well, we haven't tackled even half of the subjects that we uh, wished to tackle, but I didn't want to limit you in your uh, statements. Now, after all, we're all either active or uh, former dancers. So, is there something that uh, you think is a really pressing issue that you'd like to share? Um, Well, when you start your profession, the main problem is that there's no balance between uh, working conditions and life conditions. Uh, and now the issue of retirement isn't uh, taken uh, into account once you apply. Uh, to um, a ballet school, but it's one of the reasons why people uh, drop uh, from this profession early. And uh, the period of professional activity is um, relatively short in uh, comparison to the number of years you need to spend to become trained as a dancer. And now uh, the funds that now when it comes to space, uh, this has already been uh, mentioned, but I'd like to share my experience experience here. Uh, I was a, a dancer on an employment contract and I also looked for some space uh, to perform also at my own cost and now the situation uh, especially um, in other institutions is uh, various especially when it comes to earnings and there's great disproportion uh, when it comes to the earnings for uh, ballet dancers and opera dancers. So, uh, if there's a professional dancer employed by um, a cultural institution, um, their situation isn't all that rosy. So, uh, dancers need to have these multiple professions, in a way. Now, obtaining grants forces you uh, to be more skillful in uh, bureaucracy. And uh, then you have less time to um, prepare what you wish to perform on the stage. So, yes, the situation of those who have no uh, permanent employment contract is extremely difficult. And, well, it should be, this should be changed. And I believe um, it is high time that uh, various authorities understand this. And yes, it's, it's difficult to improve this situation, definitely. Now, I'd like to uh, say something that hasn't been mentioned here yet. We haven't mentioned a dancer as a person who contributes this extraordinary value to society. It's not only uh, art. It's the work of art that he or she is. 
because this is when the audience experiences this transformation, this kinesthetic transformation. And dance artists contribute this value of incredible kinesthetic sensitivity. And people who are surrounded by dancers can easily say that this is um, a This is something that changes um, such a person. So we not only introduce um, art uh, and, and contribute with art, but also with this presence, creativity, openness to change. Now, if we think about the professions of the future, being ready uh, to change being flexible uh, is uh, our good value. And after all, uh, a dancer every day stands in front of a new body and works with this body. And I believe that uh, you cannot think of um, a better um, a greater value for uh, for the jobs of the future. Now, you talked about exclusion, about dance that should uh, help introduce uh, people who, due to some health issues or uh, due to um, coming from a certain background, uh, cannot participate in um, this life. But I believe uh, it's a topic for a separate panel. And I believe that uh, we should use uh, this knowledge that we have to meet the expectations of the communities within we uh, live. Now, let me say the following as a representative of the Institute of Music and Dance. Dear artists, dear dancers, please remember that the Institute of Music and Dance wishes to care for you. Now, I've noticed that um, very man many people believe that we are concerned uh, only with ballet or contemporary dance? No, we are interested in all the forms of dance. Uh, and uh, I've also heard this accusation that we uh, are only interested in dance as a form. No, we are interested in you, dancers, because after all, critics without dancers wouldn't be critics. Choreographers without dancers wouldn't be choreographers. Those who run statistics wouldn't be able to do so were it not for dancers. I'd like to thank to all of you uh, thank all of you, the independent ones uh, and those who are employed um, by institutions. I'd like to thank you for your uh, passion, involvement and love to this profession. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the end of this panel. We'd like to invite you to a 30-minute break and after the break, we will talk about the role and function of a choreographer in our reality. Thank you.
Paweł, y, tak, on się nam troszeczkę psuł w czasie poprzedniego panelu, ale rozumiem, że, bo tak nam mruga tutaj. Mówię o czas, czasie. Mhm. A w ogóle w ogóle wy, słuchajcie, wystopujcie, stopujcie zegar, bo jest już włączony, a jeszcze nie rozpoczęliśmy. Poproszę. Czy ja mogę organizatorów prosić o zaproszenie osób?
can officially start this part of today's meeting. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fifth discussion panel on the uh, artistic and professional development of choreographers. We are here at the Poland Museum of uh, the History of Polish Jews. And I'd like to welcome also all those who are watching us online. And, well, we'll be starting the panel, however, let me start it in a quite unusual way. I'd like you to uh, pay tribute to Teresa Kujawa, who died in April uh, this year, uh, a great choreographer, dancer and pedagogue and also friend of dance novices. She searched for dance knowledge and uh, today uh, her uh, funeral was held in Wrocław. Thank you very much. Now, uh, this uh, panel on choreography will be uh, moderated uh, by a very well-known choreographer, Karol. So, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to this panel and thank you for your kind words. Um, renowned, well, it sounds a bit um, uh, alarming, but uh, I believe it's not so bad. Well, uh, this invitation to this panel has been accepted by Romana Aniel, Izabela Chlewińska, Ryszard Kalinowski, Professor Artur, Artur Nowak Far, and Miłosz Bębinow, PhD. I've also accepted invitation to this panel, so I'm wearing two hats here because um, I'm a member of the panel and also its moderator. Now, could we see the postulates uh, on the screen? These are the postulates that have been worked out after a discussion with the community and this is our uh, axis um, around which uh, our statements will revolve. Now, the postulates of the community became the uh, material for a group of experts to work. Uh, this group of experts including Anna Hogg, Romana Aniel and Richard Kalinowski. <laughs> And they uh, were turned into thematic fields that we will discuss uh, today. Because today we want to discuss the role of a choreographer, uh, his or her uh, place in uh, the professional structure. <clears throat> and obviously it would be difficult not to refer uh, to this ambiguous status of uh, a dance artist, a dancer, a choreographer uh, that was mentioned uh, during the previous panel. After this short introduction, let me ask Romana Aniel for her statement. And she will speak about the profession of a choreographer taking into account the status of this profession um, in the past and throughout uh, the history of dance. Then I would like to speak about two models of um, education, formal education and this education based on the master-pupil relationship. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's quite a challenging task for me and as we take a look at this list of postulates we realize that, uh, well, this is the moment when we need to think about uh, certain aspects of this profession. I believe we all uh, dream uh, about the situation where a choreographer is treated uh, and seen the way theater directors and film directors are, so that their profession is equally prestigious as that of uh, directors. I believe it's worth that we, uh, worthwhile that we uh, become aware of the fact that choreographers used to have uh, such a function in the past because after all choreographers who operated um, on courts uh, in uh, elitist circles they actually uh, embraced all the functions that uh, nowadays a director mm, has. So in the 15th century already we had wonderful dance masters uh, and I'm saying it uh, to make us aware of uh, the fact how early uh, such a function of a uh, choreographer existed. Choreographer uh, being a very important person at the time. At that time uh, a choreographer was responsible for composing dances, for uh, choreographic routines, they performed themselves too. They also were responsible for doing research, writing about dance, uh, creating tr treaties, but also they operated as directors who were responsible for preparing ballet mm -hmm. performances that at that time embraces all the other fields of art. So ballet, dancing, acting, music. And this was the role of a choreographer until the end of the 18th century when uh, dance masters decided they would become independent, they uh, would stop being involved in um, stage performances uh, that embraced all the other um, fields of art, but that they would focus on dancing solely. Uh, then the treatise uh, by Jean uh, Fillet was uh, published and uh, it is from this treatise that we have the uh, contemporary name of a uh, choreographer. And that name uh, became functional especially at the uh, beginning of the 20th century and Serge Lee Far, uh, and then Georges Balanchine uh, were greatly responsible uh, for this and since that time we started speaking about this autonomous or independent function of a choreographer. And we've come to the situation that today we have this term, this notion that's included to uh, job qualifications and who is a choreographer? A choreographer is responsible for creating choreographic routines and preparing soloists and dancing ensembles to um, performances and also um, athletes of uh, certain um, uh, sports disciplines to, um, to competition. So, a choreographer plays uh, very many roles, wears very many hats, but uh, I believe that in dancing uh, professions they are very often these signposts, uh, these uh, guides who actually decide on uh, what will be shown on the stage and um, everybody Mm. And, and they also need to study uh, the um, uh, surrounding world to be able to express uh, themselves well through their art.
So this is how this function of a choreographer is defined today. And obviously, now we could ask ourselves the question, how to become a choreographer? Now, in Poland, there are various educational institutions, schools. These are, to a large extent, uh, academic uh, schools, because we have the Academy of Music in Łódź, also the Academy of Music in Warsaw. Uh, both institutions train people to become choreographer. There are also schools in uh, Poznań, in Lublin, also the Academy of Physical uh, Education. So there are various schools, various universities that uh, propose uh, or that have such uh, programs in the RAFA. Uh, so it all looks quite rosy. However, is this really the situation? Well, this is my question. So can you uh, really get uh, this education as a choreographer if you stay in Poland or maybe you are you have to go abroad uh, to do it uh, to use various opportunities there. Well, I'm just uh, asking such a question here. Uh, let me just add that I got my experience as a choreographer in France and uh, uh, I was also a member of a um, residency a program uh, for artists and I believe that such programs could be um, uh, could be done in Poland too. And uh, I would like to ask about uh, different uh, models. For instance, there is a uh, master model, there are some other models. Uh, so, well, I think a hybrid of two models is the best, is important. And another important experience is the, the model of practicing with a master. Uh, in, with a real master in India. I, I was uh, learning there not only Indian dance but also I was learning uh, choreography, um, learning from a master, staying with a master for a long period of time. And I think that these uh, people of authority and they as examples, as uh, examples to follow are very important because they do pass on their experience and uh, this is what we really need. I just would like to add that this definition of the choreographer's profession that Romana spoke about, that is the definition drafted by the Ministry of Labour. And we as choreographers even have a statistical number 265301. It's your number. So. In this discussion, we need to think about the role of choreographer in the society because we cannot uh, we cannot also forget about society and the way society perceives choreographers. And due to Romana, we know who choreographer is and when one does become a choreographer. But now, Isa, could you please discuss the following? Choreographer, independent or dependent creator? And... Um, of course, there are many different dimensions. So, is the is dance as a pure form of art, or is it the art that is linked to something else? Are we autonomous artists, or are we heteronomic when we cooperate with the theatre directors? And another third important sphere, economically, what does it mean to be? Um, independent choreographer who is a dependent choreographer and how what uh, how can we gain independence economic independence thank you for the invitation to take part in this panel discussion it will be very difficult for me to describe all that within 10 minutes but let me try and other independent artists may help us as they speak later on so, who is an independent choreographer and how can we perceive one? Since six years, together with a number of um, Warsaw based choreographers, we created an informal group, the Center of Movement. As uh, 
supported by Maris uh, Stoklosos uh, Foundation, so it's, for, it's a formal organization in a sense. But anyway, our work is based on the concept of a common space. And together with um, Maris Stoklosos, we were at a study visit in Philadelphia many years ago. And there we were enthralled by this formula of creating a space by people who need to develop their choreographic instruments. So they create that space for many different reasons, but they are there to have this creative continuity. And this is how the Center for Movement was created. That was the first idea of Maria. And um, this is how we work today. Every day we have unlimited time that we can uh, work there. And independent creators, independent choreographers, they need many hours and days of work, of many times doing nothing in a given space. It's just concept work. And uh, many times they have to go through their creative um, uh, crisis, but this should not be an institutional or repressive space, because usually when institution may exert uh, pressure, um, may exert violent pressure on an independent artist, so this independence is having this creative freedom, having time, having space, and having unlimited progressive barter because here I am doing whatever I do and then there is some time in the future where we will be capable of showing that so in our group for three years we were running a program called uh, a center in the process and the idea was to confront with viewers our choreographic output because this this new choreography, or however you call it, or free, wild choreography, non-institutional choreography, it is it means that we have to look for a dialogue with the viewer. Many people were already saying that there is not enough relation with the viewer, that we need to educate viewers, and this is what we were doing for three years, and it was a great experience for me, as a choreographer, I have many questions, I have many doubts, and it's great that I may have such questions. But it was a great opportunity for me to talk to viewers about my creative tools, so that I could open the door to the viewer, to the observer, who would know more about my work. But then, in return, I would receive really helpful feedback from the viewers. And within our group, the Center for Movement, we have uh, developed a number of uh, uh, programs in cooperation uh, with um, uh, galleries um, and the Zahenta Gallery and uh, other art venues. And then we can enter uh, premises, cultural premises, and show our finished and unfinished work. So we can use a gallery space uh, to define choreography in a new space that is combined with visual arts or build new philosophical concepts around choreography that we found to be highly inspiring so this experiment experiment is something that unites us not only choreographers within our group there are many other independent choreographers but there are not too many programs that support the initiative of um, creators and so I actually would appeal for having many more programs so as to be capable of running such concepts. So all these activities help us to extend the definition of choreography, what choreographer deals with. You, uh, you just uh, read out uh, who the choreographer actually um, was and for me it's difficult to find my place in this definition. Just a few keywords, new rituals, utopian um, vision of uh, the human past or future in search of, for spirituality, in search for body. So we're looking for new formulas. We're trying to see how can, else we can manage our body and communi communicate with the viewer. And this body 
When we deal with the body, this is a great privilege, by the way. And uh, this should serve as a bridge. My body is a bridge between me and the viewer, because a body is not that popular in our culture. So a choreographer perhaps could be and is the best expert, the most uh, perceptive specialist or scientist in the area of our body. We know almost everything about bodies. So I think that this aspect of sharing or observing or doing research in body as through choreography work is very interesting and it raises emotions among the viewers because people need to be in contact with the body as we were speaking about choreotherapy there is there is certain um, yearning uh, to meet your own bodily nature and so choreography whatever however beautiful it is is not sufficient to go viewers they need to feel more uh, or at least they need to try and they need to find out more and i think that in poland without education that refers to uh, the uh, culture of body and pe is in really bad shape we simply know too little. So the role of a choreographer could be opening the doors to our um, corporeality. And, um, and we like sharing our bodily uh, practices. Uh, Sometimes um, uh, viewers can better understand what uh, dancers do and how they experiment with their body and we encourage the viewers uh, to share and such uh, choreographic uh, practices help us to do it. It's, um, it's an interface between workshop and um, a staged performance. Uh, there is a blurred um, blurred interface between what is a rehearsal and what is a finished product. So we see that choreography is emancipating into something independent. Choreographers, many choreographers work in silence. And many choreographers show their thing without lights, without additional tools. So the body is left all alone in space. And for me, as a creator, it is very important and that helps me to uh, stay in this profession. Although, as I have mentioned before, we have uh, not uh, enough programs and subsidies. I apologize, uh, but unfortunately time is always over. But I simply wanted to ask you, how do you see the role of the tools and developing tools that will support the independence of choreographers? This is what we spoke about, uh, because we need to think about some... Uh, we need to agree to some dependency to be able to develop independency. But I'm speaking about uh, space. Yes, I'm speaking about uh, uh, time and space and form, but is uh, choreography um, is always independence. But how do you see the group of a um, of a group uh, so how do you understand choreography but actually you answered that question so I'm not repeating that question but if you could speak about developing uh, tools that develop independence of a choreographer well the main tool for building independence in that period that I was talking about was merely space having a room having some space which we enter where we work. And I think that this is the basic thing that needs to be dealt with. We all need space. This could be a room in a theater or in a cultural center. And um, it's a good room if we don't have to pay by, by the hour. We need to have time to, to have a possibility of staying there as much time as we need. This is super important and we as a group we don't do many things together 
almost nothing. Sometimes we invite each other, sometimes we do something together in the field of visual arts, but every one of us is quite soul in his or her work. We work alone. I, have, uh, I used to work for 10 years in the drama theatre, this is where I was earning money. And I was doing fairly well. But let's say that I was sharing my time. That was my dependency. And my independency was kind of split half and half. So I was doing more or less interesting projects. But there I had my room and I could do my work. I could develop my own choreographic concepts. But that stage is over. And this is my personal opinion that mainstream institutions, especially uh, mainstream theatres, they appropriated choreographers and the mass media have uh, become this promise of uh, prestige and uh, becoming famous. But it's, what is more important is to build the sense of community around a space, around a room where we can develop our models for years, we can undergo through our crises, we can face the difficulties, but we need to have the sense of continuity. And the institutions that I have been working with, or the hierarchy and the violence and the patriarchal, I'm not afraid to use this word, patriarchal character of those institutions is such that I was bereft of my independence, which is more important for me in my personal life and in my professional life. So working with body is a great privilege. It builds and it helps us to build better life. That is the promise of eternal youth and of some childish joy that I can find once working with the body. And my perception is this is the most important thing, that this is a certain reason for building a community. I uh, apologize, but we would have to conclude by this beautiful statement. But I still Super. wish to give the floor to the others, but it's um, good that you made a point. And now we can move on. Now, I would like to invite Richard. Richard. Well, we know that choreographer is an independent entity living in a dependent uh, world, and we have we are dependent on our body and on the space. Now, how so, so how are choreographers supported by curators and events organizers? And you are curator and an event organizer. So if you could speak from your point of view, you're a producer, you're a curator. So how do you approach the point of independence? Do producers interfere with the concepts of choreographers? For instance, um, with um, choreographic contracting or commissioning choreographic work, is it something that limits choreographers or do you set up the framework within the choreographer should operate? Thank you for the invitation. For me, it is important to create such spaces, such places, as Isaac has described, so as not only to give chances to choreographers, not only through choreographic contracts, but they do somewhat limit um, choreographers, and of course you may have uh, two, uh, you may have a, um, a, a different um, view that could be a source of inspiration for a choreographer. But uh, in case if uh, this is a piece of work that is ordered, this may limit a choreographer. So for me, it is uh, important to co create spaces for choreographers where choreographers may spend a lot of time without pressure. Um, is that they are not obliged to deliver a product, they need a space to experiment and to do nothing for at times in order to find out <clears throat> what they need. And um, yes, some preliminary conditions must be set up. It cannot be that that the door will be entirely open for anyone and uh, in any context. 
once you work in an institution where you have to pay fees also of all sorts and if you have to organize a team and you have to organize some uh, infrastructure manage infrastructure you have to be rational about it but then my experience has been and as i was observing people in poland for instance your anna leśnierowska i was observing her development and um, i know that a choreographer is the focal point. We need to take into consideration all the perspectives and the hopes related to the choreographer. So what we aspire to in our institution, which is the uh, center of culture and we are running this project of uh, Spaces for Art. So this is a friendly open space where choreographer feels good. So I think it's uh, the choreographer who uh, makes the things go round. It is the choreographer who gives birth to an idea in his or her mind and body and dances follow. Once I follow to the idea of Hanka Solitska and many people you know, were uh, also talking about the recognition level of the personality of dancers and choreographers and choreographers do deserve to be recognized and to be talked about. We need to uh, present them as people of idea and of creativity. We need to take care of them. Uh, um. I believe that it's important for a choreographer to have a place where he or she will be able to fulfill themselves. There are grants available. You can uh, receive a grant for a given production to realize um, an idea. There are programs of the, the different ministries of the Institute of Music and Dance. There are programs of different cities, different regions, uh, for example, uh, in my region you can get a grant from the marshal of the region, also from the mayor uh, of the city. But I believe it is extremely important that there is this space that a choreographer um, has. I would like uh, for choreographers to be able to meet other artists in such spaces, so uh, musicians, directors, you know, the ones that choreographer will invite and that will help the choreographer create something great, uh, something new. Okay, to what extent is it for you as a producer important that uh, you have this initial product, that's the performance. To what extent is it important in this whole process of thinking about a performance? We live in the times of this solo uh, generation. But to what extent is it important that you also build this whole schedule of collaboration with um, <clears throat> other artists. Could you tell us something more about it and what are the obstacles uh, on the part of the choreographer? We are privileged uh, because this product isn't uh, absolutely necessary. Of course, the reality is that Uh, there's this uh, expectation on the part of those who fund uh, our uh, activity uh, is to see a product and this is what we strive for. So first we agree on some work in progress. It is important because it serves as, um, as, a, as a measurement uh, of uh, some 
efficiency or effectiveness, and then we expect the final product. But on the other hand, if you think about it in a more idealistic manner, I like to emphasize the fact that I appreciate greatly and I like to support this kind of activity that not necessarily leads to this final um, product, the, the, the final result. Obviously, it uh, inspires a choreographer if there is this final product, but there should be these two simultaneous ways. Now, you're a, a producer, so um, you are inter in this intermediary role between a choreographer and the audience. So to what expect, uh, extent is uh, the reaction of the audience uh, important to you? And also it is your role, I believe, to uh, make the audience more familiar with uh, what they will see. Uh, I'm not sure whether um, what I said was clear. Well, when we co collaborate with choreographers, we set ourselves the following goal. At the end of our work, we demand, we expect uh, this final product, a performance, but uh, in the meantime, we are interested in this work in progress. And we do expect that a choreographer will be able to explain what uh, they strive for, that they will be able to um, be open to uh, the audience too. And we also organize different workshops with, um, uh, with audiences and we actually oblige the artists who uh, become members of our residency programs to, uh, to work with the audience too. So we uh, organize as many meetings as possible with um, the audience, usually after the performance. And us being curators and, and producers, we also uh, have uh, interviews on the media. And this way we also try to explain to uh, our uh, residency artists uh, that they should talk to the media. Well, it is also extremely important to us that, irrespective of uh, what I've said before, uh, where um, a choreographer isn't obliged to deliver anything. So, in a way, we also uh, try to um, influence the choreographer and in and explain to their audience what they actually do. Obviously, we do it in a non-oppressive manner. Because if we use uh, public funds, there is actually this public demand for it. That's one thing. Another thing is that it is actually interesting. Um, I believe that people should talk to uh, creators, to choreographers, because what they do, after all, is extremely interesting. Okay. What about festivals uh, as uh, a tool, um, a tool uh, to uh, collaborate with choreographers? Could you tell us about advantages and disadvantages? Well, at festivals we uh, try to present as many uh, performances as uh, possible. We are an international festival uh, and, well, um, quite many of our uh, productions are uh, foreign ones and I'd like to apologize uh, the audience uh, for this and then Polish choreographers for this. This year actually will be different. We'll have more um, performances from Poland. And um, we also um, provide, as I've said, 
um, the support in the form of um, in an in-kind form or um, through financial support or through residency programs. We also try to uh, support our colleagues from, from Poland and also other organizers through different co-productions. Obviously, uh, what we do isn't enough, but um, uh, this is what we try to do. And well, people love uh, festivals uh, and this is our reality. I know that there are some draw drawbacks and disadvantages of festivals that basically they are based on grants and we can talk about this grantosis uh, in a way. But on the other hand, festivals don't need, uh, don't have to be uh, bad, you know. If there are audiences, then why not? Well, I actually thought about festivals as uh, something good, but since you've decided to talk about disadvantages, uh, well, that's quite useful too. Uh, as I've said, I would be wearing two hats here, uh, being a moderator but also uh, a panelist. So I'd like to uh, now uh, take the floor as uh, just uh, one of the speakers. For seven years I managed uh, an ensemble. No, just, just one more word from me. Uh, it is extremely important for us that we show this through our action, and I find this very valuable. Uh, so that we show different aspects uh, of our work. Uh, that's why we also want to show other uh, choreographers, other, other ensembles. Uh, I've talked about this idealistic model of an independent choreographer, but I believe it's also good that you have the whole groups of choreographers and they should be supported. Okay, thank you very much for uh, this um, extra information. And now for seven years I was um, the head of the um, ballet at the uh, castle in uh, Szczecin. And it was one of my roles to uh, build uh, the repertoire of uh, this ballet. And now in order to build uh, this role of uh, choreographers in institutions you need to take a step backwards and you need to uh, support the role of ballet managers. Usually this role is quite limited. I myself was quite lucky. Uh, I uh, had um, quite a lot of freedom at work. And well, uh, choreographer, uh, dancer and choreographer. Well, these are quite vague roles. On the one hand, we have this strict definition uh, because uh, state institutions refer to this definition. But on the other hand, we have something that in England they call dance makers. And uh, these people are producers, choreographers and performers in one. But if we talk about choreographer as a profession, then I found this interesting piece of information prepared by the Toruń um, Labour Office. And, well, this office is uh, interested in uh, choreographers, and uh, now let me read this uh, to you. Now, how this uh, profession of a choreographer is assessed uh, in uh, Poland. And bear in mind that in, in the region, in the, uh, that region, they have um, an opera building. So in the report, they say that uh, there's no uh, choreographer profession on the open market. And also there's a surplus of uh, choreographers on the market. And thirdly, there are no job offers for choreographers. Now, what can we do in such a situation? How to deal with it? 
And, well, I'd like to show you um, two phenomena uh, here. And uh, my question is whether uh, you would find such models of operation uh, useful. Uh, and uh, we also uh, heard uh, during the previous panel that this choreography uh, in the web um, platform was established. Well, I must say that I prepared myself uh, quite well and I've printed out quite many pages, but now I got lost in them. Okay, I'm getting close to it. Good. Ladies and gentlemen, the internet is a place uh, where choreographers are supported. Where I'd like to tell you about an international platform with which I've had the pleasure to collaborate as an international uh, representative who informs uh, the platform about the choreographic events taking place here in Poland. Have you heard about Dance Icons? Well, it's an international consortium established in the United States by Vladimir Angelov. And it's an organization that associates choreographers that operates on the web only. So it associates choreographers of all the uh, styles and the genres and, and forms. So it doesn't matter whether you are a modern dance choreographer or ballet choreographer. So there are some Polish threads here too because uh, the director of the Polish national uh, ballet uh, Krzysztof Pastor uh, is on the board of this uh, association. And what are the main goals of this organization? So exchange of information. That's the first goal. Exchange of information between choreographers, but also between the institutions that use uh, the uh, services of choreographers. So dance um, ensembles, um, ballet ensembles, theaters, and so on. So the website uh, provides a source databases uh, concerning dance uh, education concerning grants for uh, choreographers, um, concerning commissions. So this way a community of choreographers is uh, being built and is done through monthly talks. So each month there's a, an interview, a discussion with one um, choreographer and, again, let me say it, these choreographers represent different uh, genres. And since this uh, organization is based in the United States, uh, well, it is a non-profit organization, but it raises funds for its activity. It raises funds because you can either just enter this website, but you can also become um, an active member of this organization. Uh, you can do it as a natural person, um, as an ensemble that uh, wishes to uh, present uh, its achievements, or as a collective of artists. So what do they offer? They offer access to information monthly uh, amount of information on the possibilities, opportunities and trends in dance and in choreography. Well, I will leave you my email uh, and if you'd like to uh, share information on um, choreography events, um, to a uh, broader audience, then you can do it 
through this website and I can help you and I encourage you to do this. Well, you can advertise yourself uh, through this website. It's a very American way of operating, but well, that's how it goes. Uh, this website also provides information on um, education, on residency um, programs, on the grants, on the possibilities of um, organizing performances and so on. And well, my uh, view on this dependence or independence is um, slightly different, but I believe uh, this is not uh, the time uh, when I should share it. But I believe that sometimes choreographers, they just get commissions uh, and this way they can uh, make uh, the rents meet and then uh, they um, carry out some more independent projects. And as I've said, uh, since this is uh, an international organization, it associates organizations from all over uh, the world. And uh, there's also information on access to uh, literature, to, to uh, dance criticism, on academic research. It's all available on this uh, website. And there's also this program, Icons Inspire. Prior to this panel discussion, I spoke to Ola, Madam Director, and the question is whether or you see any need on the Polish market for having such a platform that would uh, unite and provide for exchange. I hope I'm not uh, going too far with this platform, but uh, there are already or perhaps already existing instruments at the Institute of Music and Dance uh, may be used to, to perform this function and maybe I should say it or maybe I should not say it uh, but uh, there is a web portal that I'm the co-author of it's called Idea for Dance and we were providing for a professional requalification but uh, perhaps um, it may become uh, such a broader platform if um, upgraded but it is up to you portal natomiast ja bardziej ukierunkowałabym dokładnie to zadanie na portal który teraz się otworzył Poland Dances but I would like to talk about this platform for Polish dancers, yes, but I was just thinking about these things that already exist and maybe we could use them and another topic that I would like to talk about also on the example of a case study But I understood that this might be interesting for you, given the discussions during the previous session when Alexander was mentioning some problems with the lawyers negotiating rates, signing contracts. Uh, so just trying to manage that is happening all around this um, creative um, activity and there is more and more of that to handle. So I wanted to offer you a solution. And just think of it, maybe, is it possible, is it doable in Poland, is it needed in Poland to have such a solution? But the solution is to have an agency. How about having an agent, right? So we need a person who represents a choreographer and um, in all the talks with the institutions at all the stages of development. Because the agency represents choreographers in the talks with the, with the talks with the um, dance company, but usually agencies work um, in broader sense and they represent other artists. So an agency works like a network and that uh, com uh, com uh, unites uh, the efforts of many different artists and also there are uh, agencies that represent uh, only choreogra choreographers or uh, some other uh, specialists uh, such as scenographers, uh, scene, uh, scene designers, set designers and Ascarido for instance, she for many years was 
well, she never was a dancer. That's quite interesting. She was never a dancer. And all her life she devoted to promoting dance. She used to be an executive director for William Forsyth for many years and she worked for Wayne McGregor and for many years was running um, Dance Whip Switch and uh, for two years she was a director of Ballet Flanders. And then at some point she decided to, to become fully independent and to open an agency and now she represents the interests of uh, choreographers. I know about it because but I had pleasure of working with her in Szczecin because one of the productions of the Szczecin Opera House was um, was done by Paula Mangiola, who was at the time whom she represented. So this role of agent is um, two-sided. In some situations the agent is a source of knowledge for the theatre, for the institution who would like to stage a performance. And there, was, uh, and there is this uh, for instance, Kantarzyna Kozielska and Podara, um, and she, she represents uh, some of the dancers. So what, um, uh, so what uh, can um, an agent offer? It's helping with managing an organization. How about negotiating contracts, negotiating rates, uh, solving all sorts of problems that are related with uh, copyright and licenses and uh, also uh, op operating spectacles um, at um, further stages. Also, an agent helps an agent also organizes participation in festivals and manages all, uh, all other events. Also, an agent deals with public relations. And oftentimes, agent goes beyond merely technical functions that are related with management law or oh, I'm talking too more, too long but um, also an agent is a mentor as, um, as as someone who selects choreographers because it's not that easy to be represented by an agent so uh, one has to have some uh, creative uh, output so agents, uh, they are selecting choreographers and um, I uh, apologize that I'm being a little bit chaotic and, uh, um, and not using um, uh, fully developed notions, but choreographers without an agent do not have a chance of uh, reaching out to a director of a theater or to a director of a festival without an agent. But agents, due to the fact that agents have uh, their acquaintances and contacts and uh, links, agents can do that job for the choreographer. And the other way, what can uh, and what can institutions offer? So, and of course we have institutions with directors, so, um, ballet institutions, but how about you? Utilitarian uh, choreographers, sometimes an institution would like to have an event with a dance element. An agent does everything. An agent would organize um, all the work uh, and the choreographer's work as well. So I think that uh, agents are important. I apologize. Indeed, I have spoken too long. I completely lost in time. But now I'll try to be brief. Asis Carreiro is the person who represents choreographers and uh, if you uh, visit her webpage you will see that uh, there, is, there is no criteria of style, there is the, only the criterion of artistic uh, quality and marketing criterion. So um, what is the marketplace for a choreographer? Just to, to conclude, about speaking about agents, this is a profession, so agents live off it. Thank you. And now I would like to, to move on to the next part. Uh, so we have a choreographer, we have a producer, we have an agent, we have a theatre. So I would like to ask Professor Novak to speak about choreographers who um, create work that is protected by copyright. Thank you for the invitation to take part in uh, this uh, Congress. I'm very happy that uh, I can speak here because I have um, learned a lot about the work of choreographers. 
but um, I also have learned that people of dance do not really know how to operate in this um, profane field that I deal with. I am a lawyer and um, uh, th the other speakers uh, are very well versed in their sacrum but once they move into the profanum they are shy and I am completely spoiled. So my language is uh, my language is a bit uh, spoiled because of profane art because the law reduces everything the law sees to some sort of dimension that could be named in legal terms and will be handled in legal way. And the law wishes to reformulate everything in a way that you might not necessarily like. But then it goes down to earth and it is necessary as well. So as I've been listening to many different speeches and um, also I've been listening to people in the room, I found out about things that are not good news for us lawyers. Namely, you work using a different legal basis. You perform your tasks, your social tasks, on the basis of different contracts. Um, uh, for instance, um, uh, defined task contracts or uh, long-term contracts, but uh, many times you work without any contracts whatsoever, which is not to say that there is no contract, the contract is there. It simply means uh, that you have uh, practical problems when once you would need to prove that you actually did things that you need to be paid for. Not to mention that uh, there is a major risk of not receiving remuneration if you're not working for a cultural institution, but you work uh, for a private uh, employer and in this uh, context um, uh, the agent may be useful as well because there, there is del credere agent have you have heard of this institution so for instance i agree with an agent in such a way that the age, uh, agent assumes the risks of uh, failure to pay for my invoice for my work by the contractor so in um, uh, by the client so there is a formula of cooperation with the agency or an agent and uh, of course uh, for each work and also for shouldering risks the agent will have to be paid as well so this is the bitter pill to be swallowed in this quite positive information that agents need to be paid for it. So agents are not going to work free of charge. Yes, they do a lot of useful work, but it is not free of charge. Now, in order to be able to pay for to the agent, we also have to take care of our interests. And I was um, happy to see this reaction of the audience when in the previous room someone said, let's talk about the money. And uh, it means uh, that uh, there is healthy attitude to it, uh, that that this is uh, pr uh, profaning art is actually supported by you. Because right now I am going uh, to uh, talk about uh, making money out of your art. So the question is how to secure your copyright as a choreographer. Because uh, here in fact we're talking about money. So please see that uh, I can generate copyright every time whenever I do something and this is um, um, the expression of creativity that may be ascribed to me in person. So due to my activity I will be recognizable due to my activity. So I'm not doing something that is general and anyone else can do it. So there is no individuality. And after that there is one more uh, criterion, legal criterion, that whatever I create is big. I make it fixed. I I make it fixed in a certain form. I formulate it in a form, uh, so I have to make it stable. So how about uh, if, uh, fixing a form? That means that I'm capable of seeing, perceiving art that is uh, created by someone, even if it is ephemeral. And that is very much important in the case of a choreographer, because this arrangement is very important, uh, because some part of the choreographic work is not stable, because uh, the human body is the agent that creates the shape in time. And um, therefore, of course, uh, I create a sequence of um, movements with the body. 
that will be present and then we may say that we have uh, choreographic recorded so it's choreographic recording that is an arrangement but once we're talking about uh, different dance forms um, and they are very much uh, volatile and um, it is all about creating impression it's not about creating something that is fixed in time so we are arranging a, um, a, a work of art and what is very much important in this context it's still a work of art so what i'm saying is important right now because some of you maybe one quarter of you, maybe one fifth of you in the room, you may have a practical contact with that and a practical problem with it because, for instance, uh, ladies would come from social insurance company or gentlemen from other uh, official um, institutions and they, um, they, prof uh, they, uh, they're very much a profane in what they say. They show, they say, show me the arrangement, but you cannot actually do it because uh, for them the word arrangement means that a work of art has a form that may be controlled by them. So show me the recording, show me a document, show me a file, and I'll believe you that that work of art was there. But please remember that as choreographers, as people of dance, you do not have this duty because a work is created in different forms. I may dance now for a while and, um, well, not me, but you dance and then it goes in time. But someone has experienced that and saw that and that was done for a specific audience. And therefore, in this scope, we immediately have a plan. Um, of how those works uh, could be divided into different formula. Uh, so some works of art that are arranged on paper, some works of, uh, of art are arranged because they were performed by the author or not by the author, and there are works of art that were performed in such a way that there is a recording. So, of course, um, um, those um, uh, controllers and auditors would be happy to see a recording and it means that now perhaps we would have to do the recordings of everything that we do, you do, and actually it applies not only to you but also to musicians. In its own right it's not bad because if there is a work of art that is ephemeral, uh, maybe reply, uh, replicate it and thus protect it later on. Protect it later because if I done something and do not record it, I cannot sell it, but if I record my dance, then as a recording of a work of art, it could be sold. So it could be replicated and um, therefore I can have a commercial gain on it. But all of that together creates certain area uh, for possible exploitation use of your own work by you. and. Um, there are some legal problems that go with that because if you are not careful with contracts then later on there will be a problem. For instance, something happened and then you would like to receive remuneration for that but then another problem that may arise is that um, it is the result of the specificity of choreography and dance as a work of art and that is because with the only exception of the form of dance that you mentioned, that I am the choreographer that plays around with dance in silence, where the, the, where the body occupies, my body or someone else's body occupies that silence, otherwise in other forms dance coexists with other works of um, art. Dance is never alone, there is always music, um, there is um, many times song, there is uh, many times dance as an element of a bigger form, artistic form. It could be an opera, it could be a film, it could be theatre performance. Uh, just to name a few examples. So, um, in practice, your work of art and your copyright may disappear in something that is uh, well protected. Uh, for, but for other creators and of course all of that creates a collective work of art and the collective work of art means that if you raise your hand I would like to have a proper contract and I would like in that contract that it is said that I'm a co-author of that work of art I also would like to use the copyright uh, therefore 
I would like to have my share in copyright and then and only then and only the conditions stipulated this is when you are entitled to your uh, copyright if you ignore that then you lose it it's like um, throwing a stone into the water you just throw a stone to the water a pebble uh, hits the water there are ripples on the surface but then the those ripples disappear and everyone will forget that you had your own stone thrown into the pond so to avoid that situation you need to take care of your legal interests so you need to ask about copyright and what I think and I think that it's non legal argument that I would also would like to use here is the following one should um, um, get um, your uh, clients used to this notion of copyright. What is happening is that many people and also representatives of your own milieu simply want to receive the money for some work that you do that you were eager to get. So once I'm trying to get an assignment, I get an assignment, someone says, great, just do your job. And then uh, most probably in my mind, um, you would not be really interested in signing contracts and of course uh, some people think oh, come on signing a contract right now is all too much but please remember that this situation um, th th there are some people who do not want contracts and they're not uh, asking for signing the contracts they simply take the job as it is so this is a situation that is described in the prisoner's dilemma which boils down to the situation where uh, all the prisoners need to show solidarity uh, and if they do it uh, then they will win together and they will get more than if someone breaks out of this. So I suggest that you actually check this game uh, on the internet called the prisoner's dilemma. But please just just remember the conclusion of this game. Only the ones who are uh, who show solidarity towards others win this game. So if my colleague wishes to perform um, based uh, on um, a contract, and he will know um, what this uh, contract is about, then. Uh, I should be able to follow it too. And yes, we always say that uh, actors, they always sign contracts, singers, um, musicians, and for some reason, uh, choreographers and dancers don't do it. And no one knows why not. After all, I've explained to you that you create um, a work of art that uh, is protected by copyright, even though they are just part of a greater uh, entity, because this is the nature of your work. Um, your what, what you're saying is very, very valuable and then precious, so we don't want to interrupt you here. Okay, just one more thing, but it's not very important. If you want to know what to do with the um, insurance uh, and uh, the Uh, the insurance um, office uh, in Poland. J just wait, please. Okay, and now there's uh, time for Miłosz Bębinov, who will present his presentation on collective copyright management in Poland. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for inviting me to this panel. Before my presentation is on the screen, Okay, it's already there. I'd like to share uh, a personal note with you. First of all, I'm an artist, I'm a conductor and a composer. And, well, maybe it's not, it's a bit off the topic, but I just need to express this. I need to share this with you. I believe that this discussion on dependence and independence is extremely interesting. I am lucky, or actually unlucky, 
that um, I guess lucky, uh, from whom classical music uh, is uh, ordered quite often. And uh, it has its uh, advantages and disadvantages. So the advantages that, you know, uh, I can create and someone wishes to pay for it. But the disadvantages that there are very many restrictions to this. One of my masters, uh, late uh, Stanisław Moreto, said that one of his masters said that there was nothing better for a musician than the limitations, you know, the limitations of time and venue and the concert stage and so on. So once you are limited, you know, uh, you can show what uh, you can really do. Um, so show us what you can achieve within all these constraints and limitations. And I believe that in all the fields of art, the di dilemmas are similar. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here not uh, out of pleasure. Um, and uh, the fact that I'm a deputy chair of the Polish Society of Authors and Composers uh, results from the fact that just a couple of years ago I was quite uh, critical um, as um, a creator, uh, as a composer. But after all, it's an association um, of creators. And this uh, Polish Society of Authors and Composers was established uh, over 100 years ago. It's the oldest such uh, institution in uh, Poland. Uh, it um, associates representatives of uh, all the um, uh, fields of art. And here you can see its members. Um, in the past, Jan Brzechwa, Julian Tuwim, uh, Antoni Słonimski, and in the West, uh, you know, there was this union of stage uh, artists and our uh, association was modeled on that association. And the creators wished to associate to protect themselves against theater directors. And I'd like to apologize to all the theater directors that are here in the audience. So they wanted to protect themselves against all the bad practices of um, such theater uh, cabaret uh, directors. So the idea of uh, this union was for uh, the work of the artists to be operated uh, and used uh, in a lawful uh, way. Today our organization is uh, a really big one. It is among 20 biggest um, associations worldwide when it comes to uh, money that it uh, gathers from its users. So these are theatres, philharmonics, uh, radio, uh, TV, uh, operas, also cafes uh, where you can, for example, listen to uh, music or uh, see uh, some images. But, as you can see uh, on this photo, it's just an organization that associates creators. Now, a work uh, of art, uh, choreography, um, as a work of art, has been protected in Poland since the 1950s. And just one remark from me that you choreographers might find interesting. Uh, we know that we have the works uh, that um, in the category of big rights, so these are uh, literary works, drama, drama and musical, um, opera, ballet, uh, and so on. And we also have this category of small rights and a small choreographic routine could be part of them. So what is also important is that 
our union uh, in Poland uh, protects both categories. It is not that obvious because uh, when it comes to other organizations or other agencies that provide licenses, uh, they usually protect operas and, and dramas separately. But the fact that both uh, categories um, are here um, uh, gives um, is beneficial for uh, for the creators. Now we have uh, a dozen of sections uh, in our association. So we have uh, composers of uh, entertainment music, serious music or classical music, authors of uh, texts, some small texts and more serious ones, uh, choreography. Uh, we, we also protect uh, works of architecture. And we have the section of uh, architects. Unfortunately, the section of choreographers is one of the smallest ones. Uh, it associates currently only 36 members. And I must say that I regret this fact because uh, I believe it would be worthwhile uh, if uh, more representatives of uh, this milieu became members of uh, of the Union. So I'd like to invite you to become our members. One of its founders was uh, of the section was Mr. Paplinski and important members were also the ones whose names you can see on the screen. Currently uh, the board of the choreographers uh, section includes um, Emil Wesołowski, who's the chair. Uh, the deputy chair is Zofia Rudnicka. Uh, now there's Kawa, uh, Kaja Kołodziejczyk and Przemysław Śliwa, who are members of uh, the board. Uh, Ewa Wyciechowska is also the member of the Council of the Association. There's also Jarek Staniek, Mr. Kempczyński. So these are representatives of different uh, choreographic forms. And director Ola Dziurosz, is also a member of our union, and I'm very glad uh, because of this. Now let's get back down to earth. Now what uh, are the benefits of being a member of uh, the union? Now authors remuneration, royalty paid to the member of the choreography uh, section uh, amounts from 330 to 440,000 uh, euros per year. If you divide this by the number of uh, choreographers in the section, it's actually comparable to uh, the section of um, classical music. But this uh, mean amount is similar uh, if you take into account the entertainment music section where there's currently 1200 members. Now obviously um, this, uh, these numbers could be improved uh, if there were uh, more uh, people who'd like to be represented by our union. Of course, uh, unless coronavirus, uh, coronavirus um, doesn't kill um, culture as such. Now, why am I talking about this membership? Please uh, take a look at this third point, which I believe is the most uh, important. So, uh, the influence uh, on the decisions taken by the association. Now, the union isn't this uh, a ruthless uh, a creature, no, uh, our union means creators and because I'm a rebel, I became deputy uh, president uh, as a form of punishment. Uh, 
uh, and now I can uh, be active there. Well, obviously this year has been extremely difficult for us, but it's been extremely difficult for all our industry and all our sector, but somehow we are uh, st still keeping afloat. Now, uh, the advance payments, um, this is what, uh, what we do, uh, social benefits, that's uh, another thing we do, and this year the scale of social benefits um, that we paid between March and June uh, was ten times as uh, big as the uh, social benefits we paid as the union to artists in the past 10 years. Now our members uh, can ask for protection of uh, their individual uh, works of art and uh, there's uh, a uh, form you can fill in on the tab uh, Zaiks Theatre. So there you can submit choreographical uh, works that are part of a, a drama, a, a ballet or a musical. And this is uh, the grounds for the collective management uh, of um, such a work. Uh, and, well, in the past you could be laid by a couple of years with submitting uh, such a work. Uh, this is not the case anymore. For a work of art to be effectively protected, you need to submit it once it, uh, it starts existing. Now the union means also um, awards and uh, choreography is represented here too, so a series of important uh, figures from the choreography milieu received uh, such awards, so for example Henrik Konwiński, Teresa Łucja Kujawa, Krzysztof Pastor, Jacek Tyski, so the really grand figures, and this is also a form of support uh, from the community, because these are awards for creators, from creators. We also uh, have our... Um, we also have our houses of creative work and once you become a member you can come to uh, these uh, houses uh, for a very preferable price. So, you know, you... Uh, get your breakfast, lunch and, and dinner, um, you can get your breakfast to your bed and I'm being serious, um, so you can uh, sleep till noon if you wish so. And um, the money that an artist pays for uh, staying uh, in uh, the um, house of creative work uh, covers only one third of uh, the real costs, but uh, these costs are covered from other funds. So I do invite you to become our member. On the other hand, we have uh, this special fund a creativity support fund and you don't have to be uh, a member of the union to uh, be supported by this fund. And I uh, encourage you that you apply to this uh, fund. And choreography is also represented here. So for example in the past three years this Institutional support was at the level of 200 and something thousand zlotys. And the fund has, um, uh, well, 
millions of Polish lotis at its disposal. And these are the initiatives that have been supported from this fund. So different festivals, different competitions. I like this Dance My Love and then My Move um, events. We also organize competitions. So one of the competitions involved uh, the libretto for uh, and music to a ballet. And also it was ballet for a big band uh, with ostriches and snails. Yes, yes, okay, so there were snails, but also ostriches uh, on, um, a, um, on the desert. So I believe this is a great form of uh, supporting people and uh, encouraging them to create and to become creative. So I encourage you to be uh, that you are open to a discussion. Now our union is created by uh, creators, it's for creators, so do protect uh, your uh, work through our union and then also become members because there you can get real power first through sections but also then through uh, the board of uh, the union. This board is made 100% of uh, creators. So yes, uh, it's a really tempting proposal. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the panelists for their contributions. As a moderator, I failed. We're so late. So please ask your questions to the panelists and uh, please present your comments. There is uh, Grzegorz, over to you. Dzień dobry. Grzegorz Pańtak, Kielecki Teatr Tańca. Mam pytanie... I am from the Kielce Dance School. I have a question about copyright. As the deputy director of that institution, if we employ a choreographer to do a work of art with public presentation, then it's all obvious. However, what happens with a choreographer whom I I'm employing for a work in progress and there is no presentation. So uh, does it mean that in this situation I can use the employment contract, uh, sorry, that I can use the personal services contract with the 50% uh, of the tax uh, deductibles? Who of you would like uh, to speak? Well, I'll, I'll try with your permission. Well, I think yes, you can do that because uh, this is um, shared in uh, the work of art that will be implemented in this form or another. So this is a creative effort of that choreography and somehow it will have uh, to be translated into uh, some form of public performance. Because maybe it might support me, because there is uh, this type of work of choreography without any public performance. There is no public performance. So, hence my doubt. And um, in uh, so, if this case, if there is no public performance, so I understand that this is some kind of uh, 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 this is some kind of uh, preparatory work. So it's not probably subject to copyright, but maybe you would need uh, the contract for a specific work with twenty percent of uh, tax deductibles. And yes, this is a very important piece of information that is either 50 or 20 percent of tax deductible cost. And uh, there are personal services contracts and contracts for specific work. And uh, those two have their own implications from the point of view of social insurance. But don't go crazy about it, because once the law changes, and most probably the law will change in this way that any contract, uh, also contracts for a specific work, will be subject to social insurance premiums, then this um, uh, this discussion whether this is personal services contract or contract for a specific work doesn't make any difference. And this is quite advantageous uh, for uh, creators because right now they're fighting hard to use personal services contract with the 50% tax deductible costs uh, because uh, in this uh, situation they have a possibility of uh, 
being protected by copyright. But once they sign a contract for a specific work, then uh, they cannot have such um, um, they, they cannot have such uh, uh, copyright um, and. Um, but this is uh, stupid. Actually, you still may enjoy uh, uh, copyrights uh, even in the case of contracts for a specific work. So again, so the, in this uh, in this situation, you would not recognize it as a work of art. No, not in this situation. It's a form of tr uh, teaching, but this is on the grounds of the law on uh, higher education, and so they're subject to the same regulations as teachers of universities. Uh, but uh, legally, there is a risk. I'm not a lawyer. I'm a creator and um, I'd rather use creative solutions so if work in progress would have its own backbone just like a lecture so it's a preparatory work to prepare a concept then maybe there will be a possibility of uh, signing a personal services contract uh, but uh, on every single occasion they would need to see what are the grounds if there are grounds to treat it as a work of art or maybe this is a commission to work. Uh, yes, okay, thank you. Madam Director, yes, and how about this situation? If there is this uh, concept, um, or there is this situation, so there is this choreographer, first there is a concept, then enters a room and works uh, on a work of art, but there is no public performance, there is no public presentation. But in any case, uh, this um, work is still present in his or her mind. So maybe we could record it as a script. How about that? A libretto. How about having a libretto? Then is this a work of art if it is um, uh, arranged? If it is, um, uh, if it is in writing, then it becomes a work of art. But I assume that the question is more difficult than it looks on the surface because the point is that someone comes, does some rehearsal, right? So there is a bit of instruction and um, developing of a concept and people have to perform it. But please remember that copyright uh, is quite uh, artificial in this sense because if I have a concept and if I sell it in this formula, uh, as an idea, then the idea itself is not subject to copyright in its own right. So, choreologic um, uh, recording without public performance is already work of art. So, we need to learn choreology. Any more questions, please? Oh, yes, over there to the right. Thank you. Hello, Renata Petrovska. I'm a choreographer at the Movement Center. Thank you very much for your statements and um, I've been listening to you with pleasure. And I would like to present two postulates that perhaps should be addressed to the Ministry of Culture, but I'm saying, I'm voicing them here, and I hope that we will be capable of um, discussing that onwards. So the specific feature of the job of a choreographer in the economic sense, because that has not been mentioned, and I think it's important to mention that, is that um, the income and earnings are irregular and are low. It's a fact. I'm not complaining. It's just a fact. I'm not emotional. It's just the way it is. So, from my point of view, I would like to encourage everyone so that we could think what can we systemically change? What are the ideas on the table? What can we propose so as to secure us, to protect us, uh, choreographers, in the regularity of our earnings? Because the irregularity of earnings is not uh, our idea of our own making, but this is simply the result of working in, the, in this field of art where the operators are cultural institutions. From my perspective, I'm thinking about uh, some kind of um, social aid, uh, regular social aid, and that may be paid out. For instance, I'm not working, I don't have rehearsals, I'm not in the studio, I'm not working in production, I'm not preparing a, a stage performance, but I actually work, I actually work on a concept, right? Uh, I'm, or I'm doing a choreographer practices so that Isa was mentioning, so I'm still working. And nonetheless, and I'm working all the time anyway, 12 months a year. 
and maybe thinking about investing. I know it's about costs, but I think uh, that uh, culture needs investing into people because we are people, we choreographers, we are people who are trying hard to function in a normal way in the society. And so the regularity of uh, spending is there. We pay min um, every day. So my idea is that we need to define a social status, economic and political status of artists and choreographers. That shall be implemented within the system. And this is how we will have an opportunity to receive regular support and not only being supported in the situation when there is a grant, where there is a subsidy, where there is a competition, when the programs are out there, and they're great, and it would be nice to have even more programs, but what we miss is regularity of income. And another thing, we are speaking in terms of choreographers being independent or dependent, and we've been talking about this dependency and dependency for years, fine. And how about having a somewhat different approach? How about redefining this relation? For me, this is a matter of relations with institutions. Carol, this is how we read your intentions, that is establishing relations with institutions as well. Okay, as well. So, but we need to th not to stop thinking in terms of dependent, independent, but how about taking care of and being care taken care of? So if this is the way we approach, if we perceive ourselves as dance artists this way, that we are choreographers and uh, we take care of viewers who come and watch our performances for many years, we're taking care of them, but also we are being taken care of by the system. So those are the two postulates and two reflections that I have, and this is my contribution to this discussion. Thank you. Anyone wishing to speak about that? Yes, please. Well, I may suggest here the already existing solution, a French one, that is artistic residency programs. Maybe co-financing of such, co -resid such residency programs at different cultural sites might be useful. because um, those are not only venues that are um, dedicated to dance, but there are other sites such as museums, galleries, academies, um, art, fine arts academies, or even musical schools. There are so many other places that have relevant infrastructure, and maybe they are eager to cooperate with a choreographer, and they might be interested in arranging a residency program that will be a solution for a longer a period of time, so it's not going to be just one short-term project, it could be a multi-year program, and therefore I think that co-financing such residencies with indicating, uh, indicating, uh, for instance, the will to cooperate with a dance company or with a choreographer or choreographers, um, this is something that uh, will help us to popularize dance and choreographer, and this would also mobilize the local community to become more interested in dance, and perhaps this is how we can engage local communities. So I think this is an interesting model, and perhaps it's worth um, thinking about. And the Maton de Spectacle is another method, the, the French use it, but we cannot, it's not achievable for us. And of course, in this law on the status of an artist, there are various solutions for choreographers, but maybe they do not Uh, respond to, to the needs of being taken care of. So yes, there is a room for maneuver, or rather for activities. And so I would like to reiterate this appeal and my own personal conviction. What we need, we need 
organizations and associations of choreographers and uh, creators who would lobby for such solutions in their activities because now we are at the stage when perhaps some solutions may appear but we need a milieu a professional milieu that will be present and will be very active in taking such decisions um, uh, the um, uh, for instance, the Script Writers um, Guild is one of such solutions. How about Choreographers Guild? Yes, we have an association of Polish choreographers, and this is our voice of all of us. So, yes, I think that um, this is quite important that we still emphasize this today, because we still miss our own space. And also, choreographers' work is not really well understood by other artists and people of culture. And being an art historian, I myself see that choreographers are not really positively perceived in Poland. Richard, you also would like to speak? Yes, I do. I would like to advertise. I, our association of um, association of different forms of dance. We're meeting tomorrow. We do not have the guild of choreographers. Uh, uh, chore choreographers, yes, uh, both uh, uh, um, men and women choreographers, of course. Yeah, take a deep breath. Yes, I was uh, derailed. Sorry, but just information-wise. I would like to say that this association is trying to exercise different forms of objectives. We're trying to notice different problems and to do something about it with the use of our members, help with the help of our members, and also with the use of the tools that we have. But also following on what Renata has said, as far as uh, the spaces of arts are concerned, we would love to do uh, to do um, uh, this uh, job that is taking care of um, choreographers, so that choreographers may spend more time uh, within a framework of a program, of a project. So once again, I would like to say that this is a long-term goal, it's quite general, I don't know how this program is due to develop in the future. I don't know what kind of funds we're going to have. And also the specificity of individual centers is important in different regions. We have different tasks and all of that will have to be somehow managed because those regional tasks and local tasks will have to be somehow reconciled with the national expectations and goals but anyway speaking about me i think that we're thinking about of taking care of choreographers at this point of time and i would also add that it is important it would be helpful would be to find out to gain knowledge that uh, choreographers still have other competencies that they may share with others so that choreographers are more utilitarian, so to speak. So apart from artistic work and apart from implementation of ideas, they are capable of um, running activities, animating local community, that they may become important people, because this is how we can... I uh, like this idea of regranting. So for instance, let's say we receive, that's a hypothetical situation, but let's say we receive some money within the framework of the uh, Spaces of Art program, and then this money goes to a place where choreographer works, but the choreographer would be animating that local community there. So it would be good to see uh, choreographers being open to it. May I speak? Renata, thank you very much for this very, very important um, opinion. My observation is the following. Speaking of the regularity of income, do you know if in other areas, arts, um, if, if for instance in, uh, in uh, composer's work or in uh, screenwriter's uh, 
um, to, uh, producers, uh, do you know anything about uh, such income regularity? Because I don't know how to arrange the money for such regularity. I don't know how to implement your postulate. So do you not know such element? For instance, how about, I, I understand that you're talking about using public funds um, uh, just to pay for the regular income of composers. Or how about uh, folk artists, how about sculptors, and so on and so forth, or film directors. Yes, I would like to return to this idea from the point of view of the Association of Choreographers. Uh, and uh, I found out, to my surprise, that you are still after the war, you do not have uh, some of the things that are elsewhere, like, for instance, the of course, we have the Union of Composers or Entertainment uh, uh, Artists, but um, those are the unions of artists that are focused on the most important uh, problems of a given professional milieu. And also we have collective ma management associations such as Zykes. For instance, one of the colleagues, one of the composers, uh, came to a meeting in my section and um, it, uh, it is one-to-one -one reflection of the union of uh, Polish composers, but it wasn't the union of Polish composers, it was at the Zykes. Uh, he simply missed, uh, confused the two places. So it's not always the case, that such confusion, but as I've been listening to this discussion, I've been thinking about instruments that I know from Germany, from France or Italy. And um, I personally do not know such legal instruments that would provide for regular income. The residency program is one of the forms of support and indeed residency programs um, are far and few for creators. There are some residency programs for visual artists but also not enough. But in France or Germany we have a totally different scale of residency programs. So I think that perhaps establishing an association of uh, Polish choreographers would be the uh, correct step forward so as to look for different instruments. But this idea that was presented here, as Ole has mentioned, is very difficult to implement. Let's look for um, examples of such solutions, models that we could follow. Yes, apropos models. Obviously, we talk about richer states and everybody will... Um, say it. Uh, um, there's this model in uh, Norway and also in France and also in Belgium and I know that this is all very idealistic but I believe that we should still voice it because if we don't voice it at the second dance congress then where else could we do it? We need to plant the seed because we really need such solutions. I believe that other creators struggle with similar problems uh, in Poland, right? Yes, definitely. Now, maybe uh, a solution that to, to this uh, problem uh, would be um, grants uh, given for many years. So I'm not talking about yearly grants provided by the ministry, but about grants for two or three years. Maybe they would be helpful. So this is not this brand new model, unknown and untested in Poland. No, it's already carried out in uh, some other uh, areas. Yes, so this is something we keep hearing. Uh, we have the same problem, that we live according to the budget here and uh, we need to, uh, well, do our thing within this budget and we can't even think what will happen in three or five years' time. So I believe it's a problem that's already been noticed by the ministries and also by local authorities. Uh, but uh, there's, uh, you know, this problem is also related to the uh, act on uh, budget of um, of the state. Yes, but there are some uh, three-year-long grants. Yes, but uh, there are very few of them. Yes, but after all, you have um, 
grants and, and financing for uh, many years uh, provided by the ministry. So I guess you could ask for this. Yes, we have uh, some multiple questions from uh, the audience. Good afternoon, my name is Łukasz Wrubel. I'd like to thank you very much for all your statements. You've said a lot here about creating open spaces for choreographers, for dancers, but I'm missing information on some um, instruments that would support the establishment of uh, such uh, spaces. So I haven't heard uh, how we could do it and what instruments to use here. Well, this space, uh, basically as a facility, well, has been uh, materialized um, in the form of um, this program, uh, Space for Arts, and it will be present in four cities in Poland, uh, Kielce, Katowice, uh, Lublin, um, and, and one more. Now, when it comes to Kielce, it's the uh, Kielce um, Dance Theater. When it comes to Lublin, it's the um, cultural center of Lublin in uh, Katowice. It's the um, Academy of Music and also the City of Gardens. It's a municipal institution. And in Łódź, it's the Academy of Music that provides the facilities and the Materia Foundation. Yes, but when it comes to uh, infrastructure, well, these um, institutions provide infrastructure, so uh, office spaces, uh, rooms for rehearsals, and they're also... Uh, so this physical space is important, but, you know, there are also uh, these teams of people who help finding uh, room for uh, artists. So in the future we'd like to develop this program. Uh, let's add this uh, another component to it, financing, because uh, the program involves financing too. Yes, I focus on this physical aspect of the program, but this support for artists, making it possible for them to operate within these spaces, uh, is done through the support of the uh, Institute of Music and Dance and the Ministry of Culture and National Heritage. And these are funds without which nothing would happen. Well, you've talked about tools. Now, the Institute of Music and Dance has this program Choreographic Works Commissions. There's also a ministerial um, program uh, for uh, choreography. I'm just telling you, you know, where to get money uh, for your uh, artistic creativity. Is this what you meant when you asked your question? No, uh, I, I meant where to find funds to create such spaces, to create the right conditions for choreographers so that they can create in peace and quiet. Well, uh, we've talked about it with Ola before this panel, but and we said that a lot was actually in the hands of choreographers. Now, in Poland and everywhere else, everywhere else in the world, it's hard to force someone to do uh, something. Now, we have these local authorities. Under local authorities, you have cultural institutions that have their own management. And now, in smaller centers, these theatres are the only theatres available. And, uh, by necessity, these are uh, drama uh, theatres. And now, what 
would have to happen so that dance was let into such a drama theatre as it is done in Germany. And this is done by, this could be done uh, through a competition, yeah, competition for a director of such an institution. So it should be said that apart from Mm. that such a director, uh, apart from uh, having plays in uh, such a theatre, would be uh, in a way obliged to invite uh, dancers. These could also be places where choreographers could create uh, as part of residency programmes. And let me add uh, one more project that's already carried out in Poland. So big uh, artistic institutions, uh, ballets, uh, theatres, they open the so-called open door, where young people, choreographers, uh, have a chance to enter the big stage and use this whole infrastructure of uh, a theatre and uh, um, and stage uh, their work of art. Well, uh, Krzysztof Pastor isn't with us uh, anymore, uh, but this is what he does. This way everybody can uh, check, you know, their uh, forces uh, as uh, choreographers. And after such an experience, uh, some people uh, ended their adventure of being choreographers, but there were also those for whom this was a springboard. Well, it is our obligation to talk to directors of such institutions so that they launch such projects for uh, choreographers who come from outside. So there's this human factor that's important here, but also systemic solutions are important and we mustn't forget about it. I don't want to use here all these grand words such as charisma and so on, but this human factor uh, plays an important role in here. So the charisma of a choreographer who uh, applies for a, a room or not, uh, and uh, you know this human factor when it comes to the director who will uh, prove being human and uh, provide space or not. Okay, uh, we have uh, questions from the audience, right? Now, um, my name is uh, Sonia Ovczarek. And during the consultation before the Congress, we had this postulate, and very many people voted for it, uh, to have this multi-year system of artistic residency programs. And of course, this would be possible if this financing uh, and financial perspective is for many years. So, when it comes to the uh, competitions, uh, I believe that the uh, institution's status, this could be changed as well, so that you could actually uh, have a competition uh, for uh, a theatre uh, director to which dancers could apply. And during the consultation it seemed to us that a residency system, uh, which wouldn't mean that an artist has to be physically for a month or two uh, in a given venue, because after all an artist has his personal life. Uh, we thought about this long-term relationship with uh, a choreographer, but which in the end results uh, in uh, a performance. So I'd like to give you an example of um, this project where we had several um, um, 
plays uh, prepared by the uh, choreographer and that were uh, performed over years. So I'm thinking here, for example, about three choreographers who could collaborate with a given institution for a longer period of time. Okay, I believe that we can also take uh, this question uh, here. Please. Good afternoon, my name is Ivona Wojnicka and I'd like to refer to what Renata uh, said about this model which in current situation could be seen as a very uh, exclusive one, luxury one. Now I'd like to share with you uh, my knowledge on a model about which I heard last year as I prepared a program for a conference. So this is this multi-year funding uh, which is settled on a yearly basis and it is what you have uh, in the uh, Association of Choreographers of Israel. And obviously there are certain conditions that need to be fulfilled on a yearly basis, but still the funding for choreographers that are members of the association is permanent, is fixed. There are some reservations here, uh, but generally uh, this program guarantees uh, this permanent um, flow of, of money and this way choreographers don't need to uh, you know do one project after another and jump from one to uh, another because this way they uh, cannot be uh, creative this way they can keep uh, you know the, the, the way they work. Okay, is this program uh, supported by um, public money? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. We will take a closer look at this Israeli uh, model. And now we need to uh, ask uh, the questions that our online uh, viewers um, have asked. So there's a question to Richard Kalinowski from Professor Wyczichowska. How to find uh, the performers. What would you choose? Uh, a group of performers of a casting. How to find uh, creators, performers? Would you choose uh, a team, a group of uh, performers that uh, that's already there, uh, a ready one? Or would you go for a casting? No. All my life I've been more interested in dealing with a group of people, a team, and I feel good in a tested team and I really believe in such a team and such an ensemble and I'd love for such ensembles and, and teams to be established. Uh, I believe that uh, they can be they can have this um, creative power if they have this place where they can operate. So I would say uh, no to a casting. Okay, with reference to what we said during the previous panel, we said that we should um, welcome artists uh, from outside of institutions uh, and let them to the stage via castings. So we need to decide uh, whether we go for one option or another. No, I believe that we can uh, choose something that's in the middle. So maybe you can uh, agree with a group of uh, artists uh, for a project, but on the other hand, you would have these core artists that would be permanent there. Another question, how to keep this fleeting um, and ephemeral choreographic output. Well, you can uh, do it by staging it. 
And I know that the right of spring is carried out um, by the uh, Baltic Opera, and I remember I danced uh, that uh, ballet uh, some time ago. Um, so definitely, this um, output is being uh, continued. So I believe that it's good that we treat choreography and choreographic output as our national heritage. Now, in Royal Ballet, people dance Ashton's choreographies. Not all of them are congenial, uh, but this is their heritage. Uh, and I'm not saying that we have to um, um, play uh, Opowieść Sarmacka by um, Drzewiecki all the time, but after all Drzewiecki has created other uh, works of choreography too. And I know that uh, such things are being uh, carried out. But we can also, uh, you know, deconstruct the existent choreographies. Another form um, of uh, another uh, f um, thing that you could do here would be choreology, uh, which we don't have in Poland. No, we do have it. We even have this forum of uh, choreologists. Now, this audio recording isn't the score, right? Uh, um, maybe I could use this uh, comparison. So yes, choreology, this would be, uh, um, this would be uh, a solution here. And also uh, creating libraries of such works. And as for the digitalization of dance, uh, three months ago we wrote to all institutions that in repertoire wise deal with dance uh, but uh, also we wrote to artists and independent uh, dance companies and i hope that you have received this information because those works that have been recorded saved they're not always in the quality that corresponds to the digital technology of the 21st century so we received a number of video cassettes so or even all the tape recordings of works of art that are no longer available anywhere and I'm surprised that large institutions have not digitalized that so I ask you if you want our institute to help you with the digitalization job we have funding for that and we really want to do it so that it does not disappear for technical reasons and I believe that we need to remember that not, that not all things need to be uh, stored this way. Uh, Isa spoke about it nicely, M meeting with a choreographer who represents his or her uh, work of art and uh, cooperates in such a meeting with a viewer it has its own value. Please remember, we're talking about people of uh, creation. Those are incredible people. And um, they have uh, been, uh, I don't know, chosen by providence, uh, by God's will. And um, um, we can also compare it with, um, um, uh, we also have travelers, uh, poets, uh, writers, uh, uh, film directors, and uh, choreographers also should provoke such excitement. So they need to talk about the way they work, how they contact with, because this is a fantastic thing. And uh, perhaps uh, we should cherish their work more. Yes, uh, indeed not. Because indeed this fleeting character has its own force. We have to accept that this is all fleeting, ephemeral, and that it needs to stay in memory. And also the use of choreographic uh, output is an exceptional experience for the new generation dancers. I'm looking from the point of view of a dancer because um, a dance um, a technique has uh, developed and um, 
and have been comparing a modern dance who was um, uh, dancing a dance and then 30 years later someone is dancing the same dance you can't say which one is better which one is worse but you can see the difference you see there is different interpretation just like with music there are different interpretations of the same dance so perhaps uh, we should agree that uh, okay choreography freshness it's all new but interpretation is important especially from the point of view of the performer of a dancer is also a value yes indeed uh, that especially that we produce a lot and um, what makes us sad is that um, uh, there are some productions that uh, after the premiere they are staged two, three or four times. Uh, it's not like with romantic theatre where they um, keep uh, staging performances for a year, year and a half and uh, it's still in the repertoire but we don't have this power, this money. We actually have to think about it why this is the case. Uh, but some works that were um, created in the past, they were uh, they're great artistic um, uh, works. Um, um, made uh, for public money, but it is not repeated and it's not staged and it's not living into the future. I apologize. I just would like to say because that I believe that each work of art should have its own legacy recorded. But for the recordings, we, we could not uh, dance uh, the uh, choreography of Ludovic is the Fourteenth, and. Um, it uh, also speaks for the fact uh, whether uh, um, a form of art has its own memory and history. We have uh, monuments of architecture, we have um, musical works that are recorded, we have grammatical works, we have literary works that are written. So if we have a tool and we have choreology, the, uh, we have also a notation profession, and this is one of the uh, jobs related to dance. So how about using it? And indeed, uh, I would um, like uh, to address our attention to writing, but also writing and describing practices and how we come up with certain dance practices and why we do that and what we do it for. And uh, writing, exercising and um, um, writing about methodology because we do not have enough on that and it may happen that this is the legacy that we will leave and others will use it. So some other people will use our life output as the body practitioners and that they will continue this methodology of work and line of work and even if um, uh, the um, spectacles um, disappear and no longer on the stages, for instance I did my last work only to show it once and um, I declared, I had declared that since the very beginning that was my idea that it's going to be one of uh, performance only. Um, but now this could be a more scientific approach. I'm going to write about it and I'm doing that. So many people have started writing about practicing dance, not only about dance as such, but also how to work with the body. Because I think that many times um, we are really good specialists in, an, in a specific area and it's good to preserve it. So tomorrow there is this panel discussion about it. But let us finish this list of, letter, of questions uh, from uh, comments from internet uh, users. It's nice to have an advisor or consultant for choreographers on how to write projects on the market. There are many choreographers or young people who would like to try them. Um, uh, to try themselves out in choreography but they don't know how to write projects and applications and uh, uh, perhaps they should be aided. So how to write a good project, how to fill in an application that the job is not wasted. If I may add, I just would like to say how two years ago they established the foundation for the expert of Polish music, whatever they wanted to do. But that was an initiative of uh, two uh, unions, that is the Musical Producers Union and the Zaiks, but it was backed by the Ministry of Culture and Natural, National Heritage. It is not meant to be an agency that uh, sends Polish bands abroad, but they're equipping Polish musicians and artists and performers and uh, music promoters of those bands and managers to equip them with certain um, um, skills of um, exporting their products. But uh, we know that there is also internal export, as we know it from the past. So if we know 
learn some skills and the foundation is doing that and this is what the foundation does they run training how to write a good CV um, there is a good a course on storytelling for artists so how to sell yourself so to speak on the global market we know that um, it's uh, very difficult it's tougher um, it's uh, quite difficult to push through your way and the, the foundation supports they say it's not as centralized as the Institute of Music and Arts but you also can uh, uh, look for such fantastic uh, experts uh, in Poland on, about social media how to promote on Instagram how to promote on Facebook how to write grants it's not secret knowledge and pe there are people who really really knowledgeable about it and there are NGOs they know how to write uh, uh, projects and uh, in um, raising funds the office of export uh, organized uh, a plethora of webinars on that especially now and before that uh, there were courses in the real world be the pre-covid world there were uh, uh, courses on that so i, I think that um, this foundation is very transparent and the mechanisms they use are very transparent so use the experience i know that this is um, foundation has been there only for a short period of time that highly effective and there are many dance companies and uh, events that use their services and we cannot go to america but we can go with heavy metal or with our folk modern folk that they play in the modern style we can uh, we can go and export this type of music but first the talents has to be discovered and then those people have to be equipped with skills and um, this is quite useful later on on the polish market so the good examples are there but if you have a um, microphone how about royalties for how about royalties uh, for choreographers yes uh, this is uh, by me it's fine so yes what you need to do let me repeat it this was in my presentation what you do although no it was not in my presentation first the basis is to sign a contract on collective management of copyright so you sign it with a collective management organization so in the case of the director of poland for dozens of years a choreographic um, um, piece is protected by the zyx so you sign a contract with the collective management then um, uh, different uh, choreographic uh, routines um, uh, are registered as either great rights or small rights and uh, big rights or small rights then they're protected by the Zykes and um, you receive royalty on the grounds of such registration and uh, once such a work of art is um, operated or the operation of it generates the money flow and uh, so in compliance with all the rules a certain percentage uh, from the license fee is collected by the uh, collective management fee and this is how the money is um, uh, paid uh, to the right holder and this works and i've just been thinking with this comment uh, that on the market we have many choreographers young people who would like to try uh, but they don't know how to write projects and applications and I've been thinking about the roles of agent, regardless of whether you think whether the agent makes sense or not. But sometimes young, gifted choreographers, they know how to do choreography, what choreography, but they need someone who would see them and help them. And there was this story in 1996. There was a choreographic competition, uh, the uh, competition that was called the Amber uh, swallow and do you know who won that particular competition do you remember uh, no no it was uh, the amber phone uh, anyway but who won that it was Hofer Schechter have you seen his choreography in Poland when he came and do you know the prices so Richard knows so if you see now this potential that there is this person that wins the competition and that that person is uh, given a chance to work in Poland and not only Richard would uh, invite Schechter because we know how expensive that is but we could have the guy so if there are people who, uh, who know how to see talent in choreographers and then support that talent then there is a big chance that those people uh, will develop and they will pay back in money that's it Yes, indeed, this is what I would like to say clearly on our side, uh, that um, it's uh, worth uh, looking in many different ways. And uh, I'm saying that with full conviction,
and um, choreographers are just like other creators. And it is worth supporting choreography and uh, showing it to people. And um, we have many, a lot of evidence that show that people discover this fascination with a dance. But also they discover fascination with choreography and choreographers because choreographers decide or determine how the dance is going to look like. It's going to be dance only some other elements. So once people see choreographic uh, uh, proposal, they say, uh, they say it's what is it? Because it's not only dance, it's much more than that. But this is uh, due to the choreographer and Kovacekta does these things. And I think that it is worth supporting uh, people, young people, that they follow this that they feel uh, to be called to do something interesting, something new. We have four minutes left. Actually, uh, this uh, clock is late anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I would like to thank all the panelists uh, for your uh, speeches. Thank you for being here. And um, by this, I would like to call it a day. Carol, thank you very much. I would like to thank Carol. I would like to thank all of you for the participation in the today's work. And tomorrow we resume at 9. I know, 9 o'clock in the morning doesn't sound good. But we do resume at 9 and there will be a very important discussion for those who uh, program dance, uh, for all those uh, who read dance, uh, who write about dance, who study dance. So you're most uh, welcome uh, tomorrow for the last panel discussion. Thanks a lot and have a nice evening. Bye-bye.